Good morning, everyone. The artist you were just listening to was a band called The House of Waters. My name's Rohan Sen, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all to the center. I'd like to start this morning with being grateful. Grateful to our founders, Mr. R.S. Koenka and Mr. R.S. Agarwal. Grateful to our chairperson, Ms. Richa Agarwal. And grateful that we're all here and healthy and definitely after this conference, a lot wiser. Well, at least we hope so. Speakers, you're under pressure now. Just a few announcements before we start this day. All KCC team members are in green and we have our gold ID cards as well. And if you happen to be in green, you are now officially part of the crew. We're looking at you. The restrooms are to my right, through that door on the right. There are also restrooms upstairs, so you don't have to come through here. Just go there. We have a restaurant called Grace, and they'll guide you towards restrooms. Please do keep your phones on silent with respect to the conference. And of course, this building is a no-smoking zone. And that's all from me. Over to your host now, Aviri. Take over. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Kolkata Center for Creativity. Sorry, I've been asked to open my glasses, so here I am. Now, to begin more formally, welcome to the fourth edition of Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, organized by Kolkata Center for Creativity, in collaboration with our partners, National Council of Science Museums, Archaeological Survey of India, Alliance Forces, and Mayurbhanj Foundation, and also Earth Day Network. First of all, I'd like to invite Ms. Richa Agarwal, Chairperson of KCC, to present the welcome address. Morning, everybody. Thank you, Rohan and Averi, for um, the kind words. And of course, gratitude is something we all feel every morning when we come into this building. Um, I don't know how many of you all have walked through the sculpture disobedience. Kids, have any of you all done that? Okay, you all need to do that. It's on the ground floor, that big white structure. It's called disobedience. I'm asking you to disobey. And that's what the artist has advised us to do. The reason why she calls it disobedience is very simple. She says, I made it in a particular way, and every time someone walks through it, it disobeys, simple. It is a sustainable structure, rather interesting, a lot of fun. We've had a complete dance performance inside it. And that said, for most of us here, Rina, me, we all believe it is also the simple logic of life. Most of us are at that juncture every morning where we are wondering what we have to do and really is life that simple? Is it that difficult? Do I need to study to pass this exam? Can I not find alternative methods? But all you need to do is really take the first step forward. When you take the first step forward and when you walk through, just think about it again. The entire structure opens out. And that's what life is all about. You take your first step forward and things, and life opens out. Life is beautiful. There's so much that we can learn. There's so much to see and continuously grow. And it's all about collaboration and sustainability. And now I'm coming for the scripted part. So good morning again, everyone. And a very, very warm welcome to the fourth edition of KCC's annual international conference, Vasudeva Kutumbakam. The world is one family, our home. The conference has been designed from the very outset with an aim to explore our relationship with the environment. This year, our focus is solidarity in a time of crises. The edition, this edition of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, or VK as we like to call it, will shed light on and initiate conversations on the 17th Sustainable Development Goal. The Sustainable Development Goal were adopted by the United Nations as an universal call to action to ensure eradication of poverty and adoption of sustainable measures to protect the planet for the future generations by the year 2030. 17 goals were adopted, which are integrated with each other. Among these, the final and one of the most crucial goals is partnership for the goals. It is one of the foundations 
on which ideas of sustainability can reach their fruition. Solidarity through strong partnerships and collaborations is the key to sustainable growth and development. After all, don't we all know that there is strength of strength and unity. So how many of you all really agree with me on this whole collaboration and partnership thing? Do you think all of us can grow individ as individuals or grow exponentially in partnerships? No reactions? Anybody? What do you all feel? Come on. I, I, for us, we've always believed that collaboration is one way to grow exponentially. Individually, one can only do so much, and collectively, we can do so much more. Any suggestions, comments, please? All of you all try to be interactive. You know, getting these best minds here has been very challenging. To putting together the program has been very challenging, and it'll be a lot more fun for all of us if we keep interacting continuously. No question is irrelevant, no question is small. We're all here to learn, be it the people behind the dais, behind the mic, or in front. And that's why, honestly, trust you me, that's the reason we are all here, to grow together. Our world just now is at a critical juncture. And now amidst the raging global pandemic and the time, it has really never been riper to encourage discussions around the maladies of helplessness and insufficient progress and how to overcome the same while keeping a long-term impact in mind. On this note, I'd like to welcome each and every one of our eminent speakers. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, ma'am, all of you all for being here and making this event so special. Vasudeva Kutumbakam is a very special uh, two days to all of us um, at KCC, at the Imami Group, because it is talking about growing together and actually being one family in this. I would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude and appreciation to the, uh, the co-curators of this conference, Dr. Shwetal Patel and Ms. Reena Devan, for their relentless efforts towards de designing this conference. Thank you so much, and thank you all speakers. Thank you kids for being here. Thank you, ma'am, for your words. May I now request Ms. Reena Devan, director of KCC, uh, and the co-curator of Vasudeva Kutumbakam to kindly introduce KCC to all of us. Thank you, Averi. Good morning, everyone. As our chairperson time and again tells me, I'm too blatant in promoting KCC. So here I'm promoting it again. For those who do not know about our work as clearly because we do a lot of things, as uh, it's rare in uh, our country still that one center does a plethora of things the way we do, hence sometimes getting it all becomes difficult. So I'm putting it out a little bit in a clearer way that, um, so I would like to take this opportunity to introduce KCC and the work that we do. KCC, Kolkata Center for Creativity, known as many names, Kolkata Center, Imami Center, Creativity Center, KKC, it has a lot of names. So I'm still struggling with people to say it properly. Sometimes people say Kolkata Center of Creativity, many things. So it is a unit of Anamika Kala Sangam Trust, which is a public trust, and we are a not-for-profit center. So we are not here to really make money that goes into somebody's pocket, but we do want to make money to run the center, for sure, because you can see the fabulous center that Imami has gifted to the city and country has to be continued, and we need the support from all of you for that. And we uh, promote research and experimentation and champions inclusivity and accessibility at the interface of arts and the larger society. And uh, in pursuit of that, this year, again, we presented in India Art Fair just last week with some tactile artworks that we created for the visually impaired or completely blind people. And the works were inspired by uh, the works of Binod Bihari Mukherjee, who himself became completely blind towards the uh, end of his life, and he still continues to create art. We encourage a multidisciplinary approach in the pursuit of creative and cultural practices. And our aim is to build an empathetic, optimistic, and informed community through well-curated programs. 
we are translocal in spirit and encourage the cross pollination of ideas and creativity across borders. Uh, in these three years, we have divided our work into seven umbrellas, one of which is KCC Arts Fellowship Program. Maybe some of you could be the beneficial of that in the future year. We give one fellowship in each stream, that is um, dance, music, theater, and visual art. And the fellows have been receiving awards and accolades on uh, various platforms other than KCC's. KCC Art Lab aims to support the multidisciplinary art creation of traditional and contemporary forms by young artists by providing them with necessary resources, support for exploration and experimentation. Our third platform is KCC Mosaic, a part of which is Vasudev Kutumkam, where we bring together organizations and host festivals and conferences to discuss the qualitative impact of traditional art practices alongside contemporary ones. We focus on nurturing inclusivity, accessibility, capacity building amongst different social communities. KCC DAI, our fourth umbrella, stands for diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. It focuses exclusively on the application of art for the development and empowerment of marginalized and differently abled persons through self-expression and creativity. KCC Learning is our fifth and more open uh, platform where everybody is invited to attend workshops, capacity building programs, it could be children, young students, emerging artists, arts manager, professional artists, or journal enthusiasts. KCC Hub is an inclusive space where we see participants and audience from all sections of society and engage and create new connections. Uh, we even invite personal collections of people. For example, you can see behind me the letter of uh, Satyajit Ray written by himself. It's very nostalgic for all of us. And this is a personal collection of somebody. So we invite people to share their personal connections. In the last year, we also had collection of uh, Mars Mukhota of uh, one very senior army person who had collected it from all over the world. So even those are invited in this center. Our last umbrella is EAP, which is Emerging Artist Platform. And here we give platform and we also connect the, the artists with the critics or writers to engage in meaningful conversation about their artistic development. And we have just now recently launched a digital publication platform, Articulate. And as the name suggests, it is dedicated to articulation. Uh, we firmly believe that art and art appreciation should not be limited to art circles only. And and thus, we aim to reach masses with our essays on art and culture, our interviews with leading practitioners, critics, and scholars. Vasudev Kutumkam is an initiative of KCC Mosaic. It explores the condition of the spirit, which is not only common to all living beings, but also bestows the artist with ultimate form of human freedom, the power to choose, respond, and change. Thank you. Thank you so much for your introduction, ma'am. We will now begin the conference itself, and I would request the co-curators of Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, Ms. Reena Devan and Dr. Shwetal Patel, to kindly introduce the conference. Uh, and yeah, I'll be handing over to the curators, who will also double up as moderators for this conference. Thank you. two mastros, no, right now. We have to crack some jokes also, I think, in between. <laughs> so, hello again. That's Dr. Shwetal Patel, and I'm Reena Devan, yet again for you. Uh, this is all scripted. So, it is a well-established fact that by now, KCC believes in art spaces to be inclusive, accessible, and dynamic. As artists and art enthusiasts, and above all, all human beings, we believe it is our duty to explore the depths of our humanity and spirit of cooperation. It is in that spirit that KCC launched the annual conference, Vasudev Kutumkam, in 2019. All the three editions before this have had at its heart the exploration of meaning and philosophy of Vasudev Kutumkum, wherein art is juxtaposed from across the world, illustrating the underlying unity in diversity. Artists draw inspiration from environment, investigating their role within the paradigm of ever-growing crisis. Vasudev Kutumkam, which translated from Sanskrit means the world is one family, is an annual conference exploring our relationship to the environment. 
Previous editions of VK have had the pleasure of inviting a diverse group of people, including eminent artists, arts professionals, writers, activists, environmentalists, architects, musicians, filmmakers, as well as policy makers and thought leaders to examine notions of Upanishad Dik thoughts. And the vision of holistic development and respect for all forms of life. The International Conference explores this idea and its influence on creativity and society more broadly through symposia, discussions, exhibitions, and workshops. Thank you. In a moment, as Richa said, in a moment of increasing awareness about the uncertainty of our future as a planet, the urgency of re reversing resource depletion, about the pandemic and its economic consequences, uh, how do we overcome these feelings of helplessness and insufficient progress? The 17 Sustainable Development Goal of the Sustainable Development Goals 2030, as Richa mentioned, is partnerships. And we believe that the other 16 SDGs can only be realized with strong partnerships and cooperation and a successful development agenda, which requires inclusive, collaborative uh, exchange at the global, regional, national, and local levels. And these partnerships should be built upon principles and values and a shared vision and shared goals, placing people and the planet at the center of decision making. Now, partnerships between public and private bodies and different communities bring our goals closer to being achieved. When we work together toward the same goals, we have the power to achieve more. And sharing goals also means sharing a vision. So this fourth edition of Vasudeva Kutumbakam explores these questions in collaboration with all of you, leading practitioners, young people, students, people online, public and private bodies, all coming together to see and explore how we can achieve a more sustainable future. Now, we simply don't want to create this conference for people to come here and talk about sustainability. We want that there is action and outcomes that come from this. And this year, I think, is really uh, a, a, a kind of a beginning, I think, of a evolution in terms of this conference where we want outcomes to be generated from the collaborations and the conversations that all of you that are gathered here will hopefully have over the next couple of days. It's been two years since we had a physical conference here at the Calcutta Center for Creativity. I remember we were in March 2020, a few weeks before the world went into complete lockdown. None of us knew that the world was going to change so much. So it really fills me with great hope that we're all able to come back here in real life in Calcutta and have these discussions. And as Richa said, and as Rina has said, we really encourage dialogue between all the age groups and all sections of society. There are no magic bullets, and only through working together can we really kind of make an impact. I'd like to thank again Richa Agarwal, the chairwoman of Angam, Angamika Kala Sangam Trust, Rina Dewan, the director here at KCC, and everybody who's worked on this conference over the last several months in order to organize this. Um, thank you all very much. And lastly, we want to, as I said, encourage collaborations, and we hope that in a year's time, we can share outcome from this conference, and we at KCC would consider that a huge success, that if any of the conversations inspire any of you to work together, to create projects, if you have proposals, Rina is here, the KCC team is here, Richa is here, please feel free to share. It doesn't matter whether you're a school student, whether you're a practitioner who's already doing amazing work out there, if it's an idea that you think can work and you think can make an impact, please propose it. We're very interested. And lastly, we want to have a free and frank discussion. And we all want to learn. As Richa said, wh whichever part of the room you're sat on this weekend, we're all here to learn. But it's also a space for generative and catalytic thinking and making change happen. Because hope without action is futile. We can talk all day about the problems of the world, but unless we actually do something, it won't make a difference and those words will be futile. So I hope that our curiosity and the words and the learning that we share can lead to real world action. And on that note, we can start and we'd like to invite our first keynote speaker, Dr. Gurudas Nulkar, and uh, Rina will introduce the speaker. Thank you very much. Before we start, 
I'll just announce something because I'm the director, I have few rights. So without asking anyone, I'm announcing this. Among the students, whoever asks the maximum questions, three of you are going to get our annual membership free of cost, full of benefits. Uh, I'll quickly brief a, give a very brief introduction of uh, Dr. Gurudas, though uh, he, you can read his full bio and it's huge. Uh, Gurudas is a teacher by profession and profession. ecologist by passion. His PhD in sustainability within industrial ecosystems was followed by the postdoctoral endeavor fellowship of the government of Australia. He is the Sir Rata, uh, Ratan Tata Visiting Fellow at the Institute for Social and Economic Change, Bengaluru. He is currently working on three river restoration projects in Maharashtra and is part of an expert group studying the landslides and floods in the Konkan region. His topic is our shared home, Vasudev Kutumkam. Over to you, Dr. Gurudas. Yeah, thank you so much for this um, inviting to be uh, inviting me to this extremely interesting program, and I was very happy to meet so many interesting people when I came here. Um, but I was much more happier when I got to learn that we'll have students in the crowd, right? And it's always a pleasure to be with students. Um, yeah. I'll very quickly talk about what I've been doing for all these years, at least about for the last uh, 15 or 20 years. I've been in the space of ecological conservation. And ecology is a term which is very often used, but it's not so well understood. Ecology essentially is the science of landscapes. It's about how interactions take place between the physical world and the biological world. It's about how life is sustained on this planet. It's about how you and I breathe the air that we have. It's about everything other than getting into spaces which are super specialized. You know, physics has gone from physics to quantum physics to nanophysics. Chemistry has gone deeper and deeper into its niche. But what the planet needs today is to step back, to zoom out, to look at landscapes, to look at interactions, to look at cooperations, SDG 17, to look at all these things so that we will be able to solve the problems that our generations have created or left behind for you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And the way I propose this is, I think it's taking a bit of lag, yeah. So I'll, I'll first talk about the incredible Earth, you know. What is it that makes Earth so unique and incredible in the solar system? A little bit about India's mega diversity and why do we call it mega diverse country? What sustains life on the planet? It's not so axiomatic, it's not so self evident what sustains life, and we'll talk a little bit about it. And finally, I'll stop at what is nature's economy and what can we learn from nature's economy? Right, so. Uh, here on the screen, you'll see two pictures. Excuse the lag here a little bit. And uh, the, the picture on the upper part of the screen is that of Mars, and, and the lower part of the screen is that of Earth. And you'll see a spectacular difference between these two photographs, right? One has got life, and the other doesn't. And what is a defining character which has decided that there be life on the planet Earth and no other planet on the, on the, in our solar system? It was a series of remarkable coincidences that we benefited from. And the first coincidence, which I also call as the orbital jackpot, is about our orbit. We are not too close to the sun. We are not too far away from the sun. If we were a little closer, all water would have been in gaseous form. A little farther, and it would have been in solid form. No other planet in the solar system enjoys this orbit. And that has been a remarkable coincidence, a jackpot for us. The second coincidence, or the second jackpot, was the formation of the moon. We have the moon at the right distance from our place. It has given us a stable orbit. It has reduced our rotation. It has reduced our revolution. And it has stabilized our orbit to be able to do whatever we are doing today on the planet. And the third one, 
Another very important one is we got the right axial tilt. We are at 23 and a half degrees centigrade. Our Earth is rotating not on the axis of its revolution. That is creating the seasons that we have today. That is creating the diversity on the planet, the diversity of solar light which is hitting the Earth, so on and so forth. But for liquid water to form, it was not an easy task for the planet. F nearly a billion years, Earth was red hot. We did not have the color blue at all. For one billion years, from 4.6 billion years to 3.6 billion years, the Earth, it was a boring billion uh, time scale, on the geologic time scale. After it started condensing, then we got the color blue. We had the, we had the temperature, atmospheric temperature, which reached a, a limit, the threshold, where water started condensing and it started forming huge torrents of rains for thousands of years, and then we got the first blue. The journey to green was even slower. It took a phenomenal time for the color green to appear on the planet. We had blue, but we did not have green. We had the first forms of life for a billion years, and, but they were all below the ocean. They were not, many of them were not photosynthesizing, and we did not have the color green. It took another few million years to get the color green and to come to the position that we are in today. In 2022, we see the planet from NASA's picture as a beautiful blue-green planet. The journey was not so easy. What did the single element on the planet, liquid water, do to it? Let's look at what it does in India. If you look at this picture of India, you know, we are a vertically organized nation. We have 10 different biogeographic zones. We have the Himalayan zone, we have the Trans-Himalayan zone, we have the islands, the Deccan Plateau, the arid regions, the, the wonderful Western Ghats. All of these are, have been created. This is the base of the mega diversity of India. This is the physical diversity that we enjoy. No other nation on the planet other than probably Brazil and a few other um, large countries like Brazil enjoy this kind of physical diversity. Physical diversity is the single most important reason why we have a spectacular biological diversity on the planet. Look at what this has created. We have not one, not two, not three, 16 different forest types, right? We have tropical wet evergreen. We have littoral swarms in the east, eastern part of India. We have subtropical dry evergreen. We have moist alpine, dry scrub. Again, no other country on the planet enjoys so many different forms of forests. All we know is a moist deciduous forest. You go to Tadova National Park, you go to Ranthambore, you go to Bandhavgarh, you see the forest around you. Most of it is secondary regeneration. We, we have no clue. We are not taught this in our school education. This is the India that we should be really looking up to. This is the diversity, mega diversity that we have. And what is the reason that we have this diversity? Like I said earlier, the primary reason for this is because we have a physical diversity. Starting at the top of the screen, this doesn't seem to work, it's, it's okay. At the top of the screen, you have the physical diversity, which I showed you in the earlier slide. The physical diversity has given rise to a diversity of primary producers, and primary production is about photosynthesis, it's about vegetation. That has given rise to a diversity of food, and physical diversity has given rise to a diversity of habitat. And this has led to Darwin speciation, evolution by natural selection. That one single prokaryote, which lived on the planet for a billion years, dramatically transformed into the Royal Bengal Tiger, the hammer-headed shark, the Jezebel butterfly, the beautiful common kingfisher. All the speciation which you see is simply because of this succession which we have enjoyed on the planet. And that is a legacy which no other planet has to boast about. Look at India. We have 45,000 different species which are described. There are millions others which we have not described. 
8.68% of the diversity of flora found on the planet are found in India. 6.74% of the diversity of fauna found on the planet are found in India. A question to you. Do you know how much of land we have on the planet? Any guesses? One third? No, that's no. Anybody else? 3%. 3% of the land on the planet hosts a phenomenal 9% of the flora and 7% of the fauna. That is mega diversity. And the sim sim single reason for that is because of the physical diversity which we have. So, uh, look at the physical diversity that we have. Look at the spread of the country. Again, other than Brazil, no other tropical country is blessed with a vertical orientation. The amount of sunlight reaching Ladakh is totally different from the amount of sunlight reaching Tamil Nadu. The rainfall in Kutch is different from the rainfall in Manipur. The soil of Vidarbha is different from the soil of Konkan. All of these physical elements are the ones which are giving it that phenomenal physical diversity. And because of that, we have the flora and the fauna, which are again diverse. But most importantly, we don't stop at that diversity. We go on to extend it to the social diversity. The human nature relationships are completely different in the parts of the country that you come from and I come from. What is revered in Tamil Nadu is probably eaten in Manipur. What is worshipped in Konkan is not even existing in Meghalaya, perhaps. That phys um, phenomenal diversity is coming from the way human relation, nature relations are structured. I just want to give one example of the palash tree. You won't remember this. This is a beautiful palash tree which is flowering, uh, which has just flowered now. It usually flowers in February. It's just gone down. This palash tree is found all across India. But human relations with the palash tree are completely different. In Maharashtra, we, we extract the color from the flowers and use it to play in Holi. And so does uh, some parts of North India. In South India, the wood of the tree is used to make ladles for pouring ghee in the yagya. You know the holy fire? That ladle, the wood is used. In the, in the, in the southern part of Madhya Pradesh, the roots of this tree are used to make fibers and those fibers are used to make ropes. In some parts of uh, 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 southern India, the bark of this tree, medicine is extracted from this bark of this tree. A phenomenal diversity. The rice which Bengal eats is not the same as the rice which Maharashtra eats. The wheat which we used to have, well, now it's all the same. We, we, we are used to eating hybrid stuff. But at once upon a time, we had more than one lakh varieties of rice simply because of the soil quality and the precipitation which was there. The microclimate changed the nutrient properties, the taste of rice, and so on and so forth. So the question what I want to now go to is, let's look at what sustains life on this planet. And like I said, it's not very self-evident about what sustains life. Let's, let's look at a, a few things about what is it that makes uh, this planet sustain the forms of life. So these are the three building blocks. Yeah, I, all of us know that, right? If you, solar energy is the only source of energy on the planet. All of us, everything on this planet is solar powered. Nothing else, there is no other power form. Including fossil fuel, it's solar powered. Including the lights here, including the air conditioning, including the floor, everything is solar powered. But it's also, the, the other building block is liquid water and fresh water, also marine water and soil which is highly disregarded in urban life. You and I are completely dissociated with life. Ask a farmer, and for him, soil is everything that matters. Soil is money for him. But we have gone to disregard soil a lot. What sustains life 
when we try to understand, uh, when we try to answer this question, the first thing which comes to my mind, to our mind, is the most in-your-face interaction which you see in nature. And the most in-your-face interaction which you see in nature is competition and predation. It's all around. Tigers eat deer, birds catch insects, we eat grass, so on and so forth. Yeah, sharks eat seals. You see this everywhere. You see it on National Geographic, you see it on television, you see it across in national parks and everywhere else. But what we see less is what the world is full of. And what we don't see very easily is the interdependence. Interdependence, of, interdependence within a landscape, interdependence within ecosystems, interdependence between biological and uh, physical elements on the planet. And what is even less easier to notice is cooperation which happens on the, in the, uh, on the planet. Cooperation and altruism. Doing favors without expecting anything in nature. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples what, of what, what I mean by interdependence and what I mean by cooperation and altruism. The next slide which you will see shortly is that of a beautiful, pristine riverine ecosystem. This is a lovely river in some part of India which we had photographed when we were on the run. In this picture, you will see water, you will see soil, you will see rocks, there's a small waterfall, there are puddles, there are riffles, there are flows, there is erosion which you don't see, but there are processes which are going on in this. All of this is the visible part. There are many things which are not visible in this picture. There are phytoplanktons in the water, there are zooplanktons, there are herbs, there are shrubs, there are grasses, trees, there are so many things in here, which there are crustaceans, insects, fish, reptiles, amphibians, which are probably not captured in this photograph. Which means that in this picture, you will see very two distinctly different elements. The one on the left are the physical elements. They are not living elements. The one on the right are the biological elements. Uh, not just that, but there is a continuous exchange of matter and energy between that. That is interdependence. You look at any landscape around you, and there has to be an exchange between matter and energy. And what do I mean by exchange of matter and energy? I'll try to explain in a very simplified manner. I am kind of oversimplifying a little bit about nature. Like I said, you know, the, the, the entire landscape is solar powered. There is soil, there is water, there is nutrient cycling. That nutrient cycling is getting hold of. The, the nutrients are uh, absorbed by plants. These plants produce food and the animals are eating it, so on and so forth. You know this cycle very well, right? Defecation and death, and it's all going back into the soil and water. What we don't see very easily is that if you add up all the brown arrows, then that is exchange of matter. And if you add up all the uh, yellow arrows, then that is the exchange of energy. Right. This exchange is continuously taking place throughout all landscape, throughout every ecosystem, throughout the world. That's how the planet is running. However, we don't know matter and uh, exchange of matter and energy by these themes. We know it by a completely different name. Any guesses? Food production, that's exchange of matter and energy. The hydrological cycle, it's an exchange of matter and energy. The atmospheric gas balance, the carbon cycle, groundwater recharge, seed dispersal and pollination, each one of these activities, these processes on the planet are nothing other than exchange of matter and energy. And these are what sustain life on the planet. These are the life, sustain, life support systems of the planet. Right. Primary food production, we wouldn't be sitting in this room if we, are not, if we don't get food to eat. That's a part of exchange of matter and energy. Most importantly, let's look at trees. Trees are the primary food producers. They are the only autotrophs on the planet. No other organism on the planet can produce its own food. 
you can't, I can't, we have to look for food. Yeah. And because they are the primary producers, they can make their own food, they don't need locomotion. They're rooted to one place. They don't need to walk like you and I. We have to walk to a restaurant, we have to walk to the kitchen, we have to walk to our dining plate. The trees don't need to do that, they're rooted on the place. But that's not the most important activity of the trees. The most important point that I want to make here is that trees produce far more food than they need for themselves. Right? And therefore, in the Bible it said, all flesh is grass. Indeed it is. We eat grass, we eat animals which eat grass. Everything on the planet is feeding on, 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 um, on the food which is produced by that. And that is the highest sense of altruism. They don't expect anything back from us. They are producing more food for the entire planet to survive. That's the single most important reason, if, if at all there's any reason needed to save trees. Yeah. But they are not being altruistic on their own. They are helped by an army of microbes. Trees are very lazy. They cannot really make their own food. They get a lot of help of, about the ingredients. They're like the super chef in a five-star restaurant. Everybody else is working and then the chef's hat is seen in, in the, on the horizon. They get help from nematodes, fungi, bacteria, protozoa, anthropods. All of these are working in the soil to help the trees absorb the inorganic minerals into a form which the trees can digest and take up and use as their own food. That's altruism again. They're not expecting anything else in person. In fauna too, there are so many examples of altruism. The zebras, for example, the male zebras, defiantly stand in front of the attacking predator so that their brood, their, their tribe is able to live on. They know that they are no match in front of a lion. Or the bedding squirrel, a small ground squirrel, it shouts out when there is a predator, knowing very well that it is giving away its location to the predator. That's altruism. Or look at the peacock, the quintessential story of India. This beautiful male peacock, the peafowl, displays a beautiful, um, displays his beautiful feathers, knowing very well that it is easily going to be predated upon. Seems we have lost the connection or something has happened. Yeah. It knows fully well that it's going to be very difficult for the peacock to fly away with this huge amount of feathers that it has, but simply for the reason that the sexual selection will be better. The genetic pool is going to go into the, uh, its progeny. That is the simple altruistic reason why the peacock is developing this. Animals don't do this on their own. This is a founding principle in nature. There is nothing, there is no monetary encouragement to encourage uh, uh, these kind of altruistic things or even um, cooperation. Examples of cooperation. And again, I have a lot of slides on examples of cooperation. The classic example of cooperation is that of pollination. Trees, like I said, they have no locomotion. They need to disperse their pollen. They need to disperse their seeds. And they're continuously helped by a battery of organisms who are working for the trees. Like I said, the trees are very lazy. They need help in pollination. They need help in nutrient cycling. They need help in seed dispersal. And the fauna, the animals, the butterflies, the bumblebees, the birds, all of them are more than willing to help them because in the matter of cooperation, the trees are producing something for them. They're producing an incentive, they're producing nectar, they're producing fleshy fruits, they're producing perfume, they're producing scent. All of this is continuously happening. It comes at a huge cost to the trees. It's not very, it's very, very energy intensive to make that flesh in a mango and to make it so tasty. It's very, very energy intensive for the tree to make that beautiful perfume. It's very energy intensive for the tree to make those lovely colors of the orchids or the flowers. And yet it does so because it's getting something in return for, with them. Right? 
and there are so many other examples that, uh, yeah, you can see here. The cleaner fish, for example, is cleaning the shrimps. So you have the, uh, a, a small shrimp, which is called the cleaner shrimp. It's going into a predator's mouth and cleaning its teeth. That's a cooperative system of brushing. We, you and I have to brush our own teeth, but there you have a battery of operators who can brush teeth for them. Or the acacia trees. Or look at this goat. It's dispersing the seeds of a tree. It just They're just sticking on to this goat, and this goat is going to move around and disperse the seeds all across. Right, so now we, I'm going to talk about breaking established rules. What happens when you break the established rules of cooperation, competition, altruism? And I'm going to... And I'm going to give you two examples. The first example uh, is that of the Nilgiri trees, right? Um, uh, uh, Dr. Kalyan will probably agree with me that the Nilgiri trees were brought into India from Australia. It's a not a native tree. It is not a native tree. It is not a part of the ecosystem. The landscape has not exchanged any matter or energy with the Nilgiri tree. The plantations of the Nilgiri tree were done for an economic purpose because it was useful in rayon, production of rayon, and we used the oil and so many other things. We got some medicine out of it. But because of huge plantations of Nilgiri trees in the southern western Ghats, those mountains are called the Nilagiri Mountains, not because of these trees, but these trees are called Nilagiri because they were planted in the Nilagiri Mountains. It's the other way around. This has created huge problems in the ecosystem. It is not part of the food chain. This, this, uh, uh, the trunk has got tremendous oil. The southern western Ghats have got six different varieties of woodpeckers. None of the woodpeckers can peck into this wood because of there is so much oil in it. If there is one forest fire, you can't douse that fire for several months because of the oil content. The, the leaves of this tree fall to the ground and the decomposers are not found in the soil in India. So they stick around in the mud, in the soil, they are technically equivalent to plastic. You take away cooperation. You bring out a, a species from another habitat into a habitat which it is not used to, and you create a problem. The other examples of breaking established rules is that of the paddy field farming in Maharashtra. In the year 1977, the pesticide use on rice fields in Maharashtra increased several times. Any guesses why this would happen? I'm sure you wouldn't understand the context of 1977, but I'll tell you. Any guesses? I told you that, okay. The answer is this. Now any guesses? Frog dissection was made compulsory for 11 standard in 1977. Truckloads of frogs were captured in paddy fields and taken to cities like Pune, Mumbai, Nasik, Aurangabad for dissection. The frog is a farmer's friend. It's a carnivore. It eats up insects. You remove the carnivore, the helpful carnivore from the paddy field and you have to spray pesticides. We realized this much later. We were not aware of these interdependences, of these cooperations, which happen beyond the visible part of nature. So let's take a hypothetical situation. And I'm, I know it's going to be very slow because there's a lag here. Let's say, again, I'm giving an example. How many minutes do I have left? Five minutes, yeah. Let's say the tiger population of Bandhavgarh National Park drops. Right? What's obviously going to happen? The populations of the deer and sambar are going to rise. Yeah, that's quite obvious, because if you don't have a predator, then your young ones are going to live on. What happens if their populations rise? Then the shrubs and saplings are eaten. More and more shrubs and saplings are eaten. So what happens? When saplings and herbs and shrubs are eaten, there is a loss of habitat for insects. The insects don't find the food in the undergrowth. And when the insects move away to another land, the birds also don't keep coming here. They start moving away. What happens when there is no soil cover? When the soil cover disappears, 
the temperature of the soil rises you can imagine in bandhavgarh and ranthambor the temperatures in summer are around 45 degrees celsius and if the soil can get really really hot up to 50 degrees 55 degrees celsius so what happens so what happens is the soil microbes die because at that temperature they cannot survive and when the soil microbes die the degraded soil is good only for seasonal grasses saplings cannot seeds cannot reach cannot germinate the saplings cannot grow to trees they, they, they we only get seasonal grasses what happens if you get seasonal grasses forest fires in summer because after the, after the rains these grasses turn yellow they are not growing and they are tender what happens after that insects die the slow moving insects are the first ones to die in the forest fire the fast moving insects can fly away but there is a complete local extinction of slow moving insects in forest fires seeds die there is no regeneration no moisture retains in the exposed soil and the soil dry soil starts eroding rapidly in the rains seed germination chances reduce because your soil cover is now reduced when that is happening the forest regeneration almost completely stops and the forest turns into a seasonal grassland and what is the root cause here most importantly the deer and sambar enter farms and we have a continuous conflict human animal conflict the farmers don't want them in their farms they are eating their livelihoods they are reducing their incomes in cities we don't face face that but the farmers are continuously facing that and this is simply happening because mining roads infrastructure all of this is pushing that we want the left hand side of the screen but we ignore the right hand side of the screen because in in the thrust of this what's wrong with the grassland significantly lower ecological productivity the ecosystem services the resilience is significantly lowered when it turns into from a forest into a grassland so now very quickly summarizing nature's economy why do i call it economy because the the science of econ economics is the science of allocation of scarce resources nature knows that resources are scarce and it must allocate those resources very efficiently therefore the first principle which it uses is diversity ecological niches the kingfisher doesn't eat the uh, the kind of crustaceans which the sandpiper is eating right or the other things they are completely different decentralization in situ decomposing decomposition the forest the, there is a reason why the leaf litter falls to the feet of the tree is because there is nutrients in that you don't take it away and decompose it somewhere and send it somewhere else cyclicity on a planet with limited resources if we want to use resources we have to have cyclicity there is no option on recycling dependency the dragonfly depends on the tiger as much as the hammer headed shark depends on the jezebel butterfly everyone depends on each other equal roles exchange of matter and energy what we saw and most importantly limited life and that's exactly these are the things which we don't do in the human economy the in the human economy we move from diversity to standardization we move from decentralization to centralization we move from cyclicity to linearity we move from limited life to infinite life we create a building which will last for 700 years we create a road which is going to last for a thousand years there is no permanent structure in nature everything has a limited life and this is what is there therefore nature's economy is about allocation of limited natural resources so what's wrong with the e e human economy why do we not see that the only reason why we don't see that is because there is seemingly unlimited medium of exchange we are all in the business of generating medium of exchange we are not in the business of gathering food none of us in this room make our own food we make money and there is seemingly no limit to the amount of money that can be made in the economy and therefore we push for a consumption driven economic growth the eco in the economy we compete for the fictitiously unlimited medium of exchange there is no upper limit if i give shwetal 100 rupees in the morning and he gives me and i say i'm going to take 10% he gives me back 110 rupees in the evening we have created 10 rupees out of thin air there is no limit to creating money in the credit economy is all about limitless creation of money and that 
disillusion sans into thinking that because there is no limit to creating a medium of exchange, there is no limit to nature. And we cooperate through business transactions. Like we saw in nature, nature does not cooperate through business transaction. Nature does not need an encouragement to cooperate. Nature does not need an encouragement or incentive to exchange stuff, to be altruistic. It's you and I who we need SDG 17, right? And in, in the fight against climate change, there is no business transaction. And therefore, cooperation has successively failed. We need a rule, we need an SDG, so that we will understand that in absence of business transaction, we must cooperate. If we do not cooperate, the planet will still be in existence. It is our race which will be extinct. Thank you. Can we have questions or comments, anybody, before we move on to the next session? And thank you very much, Guru Das, extremely inspiring. So. Uh, that was a brilliant exposition, and we had a uh, uh, discussion yesterday uh, to preface it. I mean, I would uh, offer one or two supplementary comments. Uh, one is, uh, you know, uh, it has been my experience that uh, uh, there is a, a close and simmering connection between biodiversity and cultural diversity. The insistence has been on making biodiversity registers, yeah. but not cultural diversity registers. Mm. And uh, so uh, seed diversity uh, gets divorced from commodity diversity. Mm. And uh, necessity uh, gets divorced from embellishment. Yeah. And uh, so that has been the uh, big, big, uh, you see, uh, uh, hole in mm. planning. And uh, the second thing is uh, that, you know, you also spoke about uh, the loss of diversity on the land. But as we know, industrial trawling and uh, underwater mining uh, has been destroying, you know, deep sea nutrients. Absolutely. And the oceans are, uh, uh, I mean, as, you, as, as we found that it is the, the largest part of the earth, mm. and the oceans are being uh, also destroyed. That, I mean, you see, 65 million years ago, we also lost our marine plankton. Yeah. So uh, uh, that is, and then the greenhouse uh, methane gas, which mm. is uh, gathering in the seabed. Hmm. See, grasses are being destroyed. Kelps also. Uh, all this that is being destroyed. So that is uh, the only observation. And then my experience also has been that um, that uh, this shift from uh, non-timber to timber mining. Hmm. I mean, uh, timber uh, mining, I mean, as a part of the forest policy, <laughs> is also intrinsic to the working plans. Unless the forest working plans are changed. Uh, it's not going to. Yeah, we are still using the working plans which the British gave us. In th at the British time, the Ministry of Environment was a revenue ministry. And it's been very difficult for the ministry to shift from a revenue minister ministry into a conservation ministry. And that's one of the important things which you said. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Kalyan. I have a <clears throat> uh, my name is Divya, and I have a question. I actually work in the performing arts. And uh, I've been doing a lot of work to try and understand the ecosystem of the Rajasthani folk artists. Okay. I like your choice of words. I use them all the time. Uh, you've used words like landscape and ecosystem, communities and species, which yes. came up right up front. Yes. So how do you see uh, culture? from your perspective. How do you see performing arts? Because this cooperation that you spoke about, this, mm -hmm. this uh, altruism mm -hmm. of sorts that exists in nature. You know, there were communities, traditional communities, and they had cultural practices yeah. which would serve to do all of it, celebrate. And it was always in collaboration, which it was always part of that. You know, there was no separation between culture and nature. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So how do you see the future of culture? 
<laughs> if you want an honest answer the future of the culture is really difficult for preservation one of the biggest problems is that when you move from a village level a tribal level to a city level there is a very high degree of standardization which happens standardization of lifestyle standardization of food cultures standardization of entertainment and recreation you know the whole of kolkata will be going and doing the same things or more or less similar things but it that doesn't happen in the villages most importantly the tribal cultures were about community entertainment today the technology is moving from community entertainment to self entertainment we we are with our mobile phones android apps I, I, ios so on and so forth we are less connected with our neighbors our you know communities so and this is forcing a dramatic change in what cultures existed earlier which were nature based entertainment the tarpa for example the uh, the the drums which the tribals have the folk songs all the folk songs and the folk artists and across the world you will see indigenous tribes will have a similar rhythm will have similar sounds the reason is because they mimicked na natural sounds they mimic the sounds of birds or the sounds of the um, uh, the wind rushing through so therefore the fase pardi recreation will be similar to aboriginal recreation which you have in australia it's quite similar in terms of that entertainment has completely changed dramatically so if you look at i always in in a class where i go i take um, the tarpa or the the baul you know which you have in it's called the baul right which you have in bengal and then i take a synthesizer a yamaha synthesizer and i ask the students to tell me what is the difference between the two then they tell me a lot of differences about technology of energy intensive so on and so forth but the biggest difference between the two is that a baul is made by one person on the other hand the entire uh, synthesizer has criss cross the globe you know the chips are made in china the software is made somewhere else the plastic is coming from india so many different things so no not a single person in the world can make a synthesizer himself he or she has to cooperate and that cooperation is done with business transaction on the other hand the tribal music the 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 stuff which they use for their recreation is all made there in situ with the local materials and that is changing dramatically Yeah so thank you for that i mean uh, uh, you have to come and speak to my rajasthani folk musicians you know <laughs> and explain this to them yeah. because that's a big challenge you know the lure yeah but also because there's not much that the government is doing in the villages for that ecosystem either mm. so you know where do they go there's nothing in the village i mean a mediocre uh, i won't use the word mediocre but an okay musician in the city finds much more work than a master knowledgeable musician in the village because yes. there's and it's not just about audience development and you know we use a lot of these terms in arts management mm -hmm. which are all around business transactions mm -hmm. uh but what's interesting for me is what would you recommend them hmm. for a folk artist hmm. or a community of folk artists yeah i think so uh, one of the most important thing is uh, what we can learn from the economy is that consumers drive demand so if we are able to sensitize the urban youth in understanding the culture of the country in pres in the uh, the reasons for preserving the culture in the country then that will create a significant demand from urban people who have the money to pay these people and then this art will stay in place right now what the government is doing is working on the supply side how do you increase the craftsman how do you increase the uh, entertainment how do you increase the people but without creating the demand or the market for that it's not going to happen same with organic farming if we don't realize that we have to pay higher money for organic farm produce then farmers are not going to make it the same logic applies it's not because organic farm produce is expensive it's because chemical farm produce is fictitiously cheap it's externalizing the cost and it's not internalizing them so that has to be the, the school children need to be educated in that and then they are going to pressurize their parents to buy entertainment from these uh, tribal villages or things like that that's the most important part i have a quick question gurudas yes. uh, and then perhaps kalyan ji can also respond yesterday when we were when we were discussing um you 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 made a very interesting statement about technology 
coming in at the end yeah. and we were talking about behavioral change mm. and since we're talking about uh, behavioral change in psychology i'd like you to just explain that a little bit more because i thought that was very telling oh uh, okay very interesting point so uh, yesterday we were discussing about how technology can mitigate the problems which we have done indeed technology can mitigate some of the problems which you've done but technological solutions are to end of the pipe take a sewage treatment plant the sewage treatment plant is after you create all the pollution it's going to rectify that and leave better water into the rivers it is energy consumptive it is going to emit carbon emissions and so on and so forth what we need today is yes technology to solve the problems which we have created but also behavioral changes which are at the start of the pipe at the mouth of the pipe i'll give you uh, an example of the word recycle you know recycle is a word which is very often used today recycle 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 is at the end of the pipe and it is possible with technology you can recycle plastic with technology you can recycle glass with technology you can do everything with that but refuse is the start of the pipe refuse plastic no technology is going to help you behavioral change refuse disposables no technology change in behavior refuse single use cutlery that's a behavioral change so refusal is very difficult to disseminate in the society because it needs a very high level of understanding of what's wrong with nature technology on the other hand solves problems which you and i are not bothered about it just the sewage treatment plant keeps working without our knowledge and then we feel that something is working to save nature let's keep polluting so behavioral change is what is probably the most important driver of mitigation of the climate problems that we have created Well, <clears throat> I have this to say that uh, you are into industrial ecology, isn't it? Yes, sir. I would uh, speak for uh, ecological industry. <laughs> I mean, rather than you know, uh, large technology, uh, uh, intermediate technology, hmm. which is location specific, and uh, instead of mega developmental strategies, micro spatial management strategies. I mean, because I have practiced this, so uh, in terms of cultural practices, mm. what we need is a change in rules, because what is happening is that you see the rhythm of work, uh, festivals, uh, and seasons, which mm. was directly linked with the uh, art practices, has been deliberately disrupted mm -hmm. by the rules. Mm. So uh, forest rules do not anymore permit the pan pandum. Uh, celebrations yep. in uh, Bastar and Andhra Pradesh. Uh, similarly, I mean, um, all these uh, uh, this uh, ch change from uh, uh, you see uh, herbicide, germicide, uh, pesticide free crops to herbicide, germicide dependent crops. Mm. I mean, uh, this has uh, accounted for a total destruction. I mean, 21,000 varieties of paddy. Uh, were there in Chhattisgarh, I mean, which were put in germplasm by Dr. Risaria. And now uh, there are only about 40, 50. Yep. Because they're high input intensive. Yes. And, uh, and it is, uh, so the culture is being driven uh, by a society of spectacle, uh, which is also engineered by a consciousness industry. Mm. Uh, so unless uh, there is a reorientation of the consciousness industry, which can be also organized through change of rules, I mean, which is fundamental, which is our uh, job, but uh, it has not been done. Thank you. Ajay, please. Lovely. Last uh, question. Great, great presentation, Dr. Gurudas. I think the one thing that I took away uh, immediately was the physical diversity and how that is leading to many other things. One thing that I had a question on, you spoke about the last slide about nature's economy and human economy. Yeah. How do we move? Or what steps do we need to take to move from the human economy mm -hmm. to at least coming closer to the nature's economy? Mm -hmm. Definitely coming to nature's economy will be looks impossible at this point in time, yeah. but yet we can start moving forward. So. Right. right. So one of the basis of moving from a, a, a convention and economy into nature's economy is to get rid of GDP as a measure of economic growth. Right. The single most important reason that we are fixated upon economic growth is because we have such an easy measure, which is gross domestic product. And gross domestic product does not have an upper limit. You can grow to 1 million, 1 trillion, 5 trillion, 200 trillion. There is no, there is no ceiling to it. 
we have to move from a economic growth driven economy to a well being driven economy and the well being driven economy is not about pushing up how much money you make but how happy you are it's about circularity it's about respecting the laws of nature and building the economy on the fact that there are limited resources so i think that is the crux and like dr kalyan said the entire policies rules regulation today are for business as usual and if you want to reverse climate change you cannot keep doing business as usual we have to move to a regime of laws regulations policies which are for business for a resilient human race we keep saying that we must save the planet no we must save ourselves we have to be selfish in nature conservation it's not about the planet it's about us thank you thank you on that note we we'll end thank you gurudas thank you so much so sorry to interrupt but uh, before we resume the conference we would like to invite the winners of army arts awards 2021 for the felicitation ceremony now you all must be wondering what the army arts festival is in case you don't know of course well the army arts festival is kcc's annual arts festival it is a celebration of the amalgamation of cutting edge contemporary art and traditional crafts the festival also recognizes visual and performing artists as well as crafts people for outstanding contribution in their respective fields of practice the selection is done on the basis of nominations the winners of army arts awards 2021 were sital fauzdar in the category of folk arts anila kumar govindappa category visual arts and surjit nong make up um the category was performing arts now due to unavoidable circumstances only sital fauzdar could be felicitated during the army arts festival hence we would now like to invite anila kumar govindappa and surjit nong make up um to receive their awards i would request richa ma'am to please present the awards to the winners please ma'am presenting the award now to anila kumar govindappa congratulations mr govindappa on winning the award thank you next uh, mr surjit nong make up um will next receive the award let's have a huge round of applause everyone congratulations for winning Okay, on to our next session, and congratulations to all the winners. Ravi Agarwal, a multidisciplinary artist. His topic: Thinking Community for Ecological Futures. It's a pre-recorded session. Ravi will then join us live for the Q and A online. Uh, Ravi was here um, in 2020. He attended the KCC conference, um, and we're happy to have him back. He's an interdisciplinary artist. environmental campaigner writer and curator and his work bridges the divide between art and activism to politicize the entangled questions of nature and its futures using photography video text and installation he poses questions about ecology society culture and urbanity he is the founder director of the environmental ngo toxic links and a recipient of un award for chemical safety over to ravi's pre-recorded message thank you I'm Ravi Agarwal, uh, speaking to you from New Delhi. I um, apologize; I cannot be there in person uh, because I am traveling, or I will be traveling when this is being broadcast. Uh, I am again very deeply grateful to Shweta Patel and Dina Divan for inviting me to uh, this uh, 
exciting and very interesting program, the fourth edition of which is now happening. Today, I want to speak about the idea of community for, for future ecologies and future sustainability. And I speak as an artist, a curator, a writer, but also for the longest, for a long time, an environmental activist. And I speak uh, as a practitioner, as somebody, learnings I've had from the field of what communities mean, uh, what I've learned from them, uh, what are the pitfalls and difficulties in thinking of communities, of participating in communities, but first, let me start with the question of why should we think of community when we think of ecological sustainability? To my mind, we seem to be caught in this very capitalist technological progress mode where the only way we can produce uh, our economies is through natural resources. In a sense, all economy is ecology. And it is only by converting natural resources to a resource value, a monetary value or a use value, that we are able to think of economic progress. However, as we know, this has led to massive difficulties. We are now in the midst of what we call an ecological crisis, which I, of course, call an ecological condition because the crisis which has been the making, uh, we hear, it, uh, hear of it as climate change, as the Anthropocene, as species destruction, but in our very neighborhoods as dirty rivers, as air pollution, as waste, everything we see around them. So there, there seem to be, to my mind, something wrong in this trajectory. And of course, the fixes we have for this are fixes of a similar nature, like putting geodesic geomirrors on, on over the planet to reflect the sun's rays, or linking our rivers to provide water when we're not we're thinking of water being scarce itself. So what will be linked in the future? And also to a point where we are taking out so much natural resources that, and putting out so much carbon that we are, as the IPCC report says, in uh, the brink of a climate catastrophe. So if the roots are this trajectory, then can we think of another trajectory? And for over 25, 30 years, I have been engaged in working with communities because I seriously and deeply believe that it is through true democracy and through equity that we can have sustainability. And of course, these are terms which are oft used, but from the ground up, they are much more complex and complicated. And in, in a sense, we are also implicated in this very problem which we're trying to solve. So we are in the middle of it. And solving it means putting a foot out, learning new things. I'll just share my screen to show a few slides as I speak to illustrate what I'm going to be saying. And what I'll say in the next 15, 20 minutes is really my personal learnings from a direct on the ground engagement deeply believe in that that's where the reality of everything lies, is from the ground up. So sharing my screen, uh, I'd like to first show you an image which is very personal to me. And it was the campaign which caught us in, got me into the environmental mode from being an engineer and working in an engineering and corporate sector, which I left subsequently to start an NGO. Uh, it was in the early 90s that we discovered that the largest forest in Delhi was meant to be developed 
what we now famously know as the Delhi Ridge Forest. And it's that time that people like me, uh, we can say that uh, fools go where angels fear to tread. We started the citywide campaign working with school children, working with uh, urban communities, working with college students, working with the media, doing on the street marches, campaigns, nonstop for over three years. And you see a picture of one such campaign. Uh, and we managed to save the Delhi, for Delhi forest because as we know now, it's a reserved forest outside the uh, uh, revenue land system and it's almost 8,000 hectares of forest. Now, the first learning here was that collective action was something which led to this kind of change, led to political change. And this led me to uh, start the NGO, which uh, we are still part of, called Toxic Sink, trying to do on the, uh, on the ground research on, uh, on toxics from the most impacted communities we see around us, because we believe it's a question of environmental justice. Now, I take you to 2019, straight from 19, uh, early 90s, to this image of the Mississippi River. Uh, the Mississippi is, if not the longest, one of the largest river and river systems in the US. In fact, it's one of the largest river systems in the world. And this is an aerial view of that as I was coming in to invited conference on the Anthropocene curriculum in New Orleans. Uh, there's a plane, there's a, there's a view from the plane. And as you can see, the river, the river system has been very, it's very calm, it's very orderly, and it's used for transport systems. But deep within this are histories, very complex and complicated histories of slavery, uh, and of communities, which you see on the right, trying to survive a takeover of the river by the city as what you might call a technical river. And the reason I talk to you about this is because I had the opportunity to visit one such indigenous community, local community there. And uh, I've also written a piece about it on how should I then approach this community which I know so little about, except what I've read, whose histories I do not know or do fully, fully understand and cannot fully embrace no matter how hard I try. And how, how do I understand their relationship to the river as it had existed for centuries before it was taken over by the colonization of nature and which continues to this day? And what posture should I adopt? How should I uh, listen to what they have to say? Do I even have the capacity to listen to what, what they have to say? And suddenly I was in the terrain of very, very complicated questions of trying to understand ontologies and epistemologies of existence which were outside my realm of experience and my realm of learnings. Because relationships to nature are not just as we imagine them. I imagine relationship to the River Mississippi, as I just told you, as orderly, as beautiful, maybe also. But the relationship was a lived relationship, a sacred relationship a relationship of codependence, which had been part of the food which they served us, because all this is local food, part of the culture, part of the very life and existence. So when we took over there, when we as a generic uh, other side of society, the modern society took over the indigenous lands, 
what did we take over? We took over a relationship which defined the river, which made the river not a water body, but a river which was a relationship of exchange, a relationship of coexistence. And that's the first thing I want to say, uh, or the second thing, because the first thing I said was about community action, the collective action. The second thing I want to say is about how do we listen? Do we have the tools to listen to communities we do not know much about? And that's not a question which I can answer very easily. I can only say that I learned that I don't know. I learned that I have to educate myself. I learned that I had to learn to listen, not to speak, but to listen. How do you listen to a community? It's the first thing we have to do when we think of coexistence of another kind of sustainability where there is local sustainability. This next slide is indicative of the many years I spent in the late 90s and the early 2000s working with waste picking communities in and around Delhi and other parts of the country as well. We form networks of solidarity. But how was I to understand the context in which these people were working as waste pickers? Because without learning the context of the community, we can never understand community. And if we cannot understand a particular community, then we cannot be in solidarity with it. We can be patrons to it, but we cannot be in real solidarity to it. And I think this problem exists even today because we call waste pickers as waste pickers as part of a functional chain of hierarchy of waste, but not as a chain of labor, of migrant labor, of landless people, of people without power, and people who would do anything to survive. What does it mean to be like them? What does it mean to come from their caste positions? What does it mean to be uh, on the fringes of a village where you're not even allowed to enter the village because you belong to a particular community or caste? And I learned this particular uh, context and I started working with Labouring Under Global Capitalism, which was then published and shown very widely. And I spent two and a half years working with local communities, migrant labour, and I learned so many things there that it's probably hard to describe in this short lecture. But to define some of them, I would say that I learned human dignity. I learned the value and the ability of people to cherish lives, no matter how economically poor they were. I learned the celebration of life. I learned how they included me in their festivals, in their, in their meals, and that I was only able to produce, take the pictures because they allowed me into their workshops when the Maliks had gone away. Because I had decided I'll be truthful about to them. They had asked me, why do you take our pictures? And I told them, I take them because I want to tell you a story. And then they would ask me a legitimate follow-up question, how will it help us? And I said, I don't know if it will help you. But maybe you'll be able to tell your story to a few more people. And it is that honesty, the straightforwardness, which actually got me a pass into them, if I may use the word. But which made me, they trusted me, and I, I, 
I, I became uh, dependent on them for everything I was doing. And this is another lesson I learned, that to be truthful about my own position of who I am, why I'm doing this, was key to them wanting to do anything with me. Because it doesn't go very far if, you, if you're not truthful with the community, if you're not open with your shortcomings, with the community you want to work with. This was, of course, a long story of two and a half years. I had made many friends. The rickshawala used to pick me up every, uh, every time I arrived uh, in the railway station at 4.30 in the morning, and he became my guide and my, my access and my friend. So truthfulness with them was another thing I learned. This image, these are images from another work I did with the community who were displaced by the new forest laws in the city of Delhi. I was invited to do these pictures by a left-wing group who had seen my work on labor and said they wanted me to photograph the community's resistance to the forest laws. I very happily uh, went there and spent a whole year or maybe eight or nine months photographing them, but again became a part of them because uh, it led to other things. I helped them take their case to the Supreme Court with a lawyer friend of mine, Colin Gonzalez. But more than that, I learned that no matter how angry these people were for being displaced by the forest laws, they could not afford to protest. Every day of protest meant losing the daily wage. And the economic reality of that existence hit me so hard in the face that when I later showed that whole body of work to the people who had requested me to do this all, it was all pro bono, of course. They said, but where is the revolution? I said, can't you see it? Can't you see the revolution? That they are there and steadfast and talking. But if you want them to go out on the street, then please make sure you pay the daily wages because without work, they cannot exist. So while we expect these big revolutions, we also have to understand both the context of the community and the existence, which is really harsh and difficult. And the context is, of course, very important, as I just said. Every community has a context, and we cannot understand the community without understanding the context and the larger dynamics of change, which has marginalized them so. My next image is from working uh, for three years with the fishing community uh, in, uh, in the state of Tamil Nadu in South India. And having worked with many communities in the past, this became a fresh scope of new learnings. I really learned the integration of livelihoods of lives as part of who they are, their very identity. It was not about providing them sustainability from outside. It was about the lives changing. So this, this particular fishing community of fishers, around them, everything was changing. The sea was coming in because both of climate change, but also because a new port had been built nearby and the sand flows had changed. And those of you who know fishing communities will understand that without a landing beach, there is no fishing community. We need that sand and beach to be able to survive. And the beaches were being eroded because we were changing the sand flows and we were changing the water flows. But besides that, 
they were they were having new tourism. People were trying to buy the land. And of course, it's very uh, lucrative to sell your land rather than being the fisher person, but it was changing the community as new tourism was coming in. The old ways of making boats was going away. And as I discovered Sangam poetry, uh, with the Akam Sangam poetry, words of it still exist in the landscape, like Nidal, which we see. They were deeply, though they don't speak their classical Tamil anymore, they were living the lives of the same boats, which were 2,000 years old, the Katumaran, which is still used. And I also learned that many of these fishers did not want their sons and daughters to be fishers anymore. They said, some of them said, we don't even want to teach them how to swim. We want them to be bankers. With them, we were losing a whole way of life, a whole way of sustainability, of sustainable knowledge. Because when I went to the sea, I saw the sea as something abstract and beautiful or stormy. But they saw the sea as something uh, which was a lived space, a, a livelihood space, even a political space. And it was not that they did not understand that climate was changing. It was not as if they did not understand the sea was rising. It's as if everything was changing around them. And they no longer knew where to turn. It's almost as if they had lost all agency of action. Because when, as I said in the, in the beginning, when the whole context of everything changes around you, you're like a little bubble struggling to survive till you succumb. But within these practices lie many ways and knowledges in which sustainability can be thought of, in which futures can be thought of. But are we still able to do that? Because to do that, we'll have to change our colonial mindsets. We'll have to change the colonization of nature, which we carry to this day. We think we are a post-colonial society, but we haven't stopped colonizing nature. We are still colonizing nature, and climate change is, an, is, a, is, a, is a part of it. And at the end, I would like to speak about communities we don't even think about, the multi-species communities we are part of. This is a language which is so far removed from us that we don't even have the wherewithal to accept a multi-species planet as something which makes us, cohabits us, and co-forms us. We know from new science, new, uh, new information on, on, on biology and biogenetics, that we are all inhabited and cohabit with viruses, bacteria, genes of other animals. We haven't come on this planet on our own. We have been part of a whole scope of evolution. We are not the top of this food chain or, or top of the species. We are one part of it. We are part of the web of life. And finally, I'd like to end with saying that within the community idea, which we first have to learn to navigate, to also see a change attitude towards the colonization of nature. We look down on nature as if it's meant to provide for us, but it is not. Nature speaks back, it always does, only not in our time frames. So, as I say, because these images are about the extinction of vultures, which in the 1980s, these are photographs I took, and it was shown, I, I did a project in the Natural History Museum in New Delhi, which is unfortunately burned down now. There were scores of vulture we could see. Now from 10 million population, we have destroyed almost 99.5% of them because of one industrial pill, which destroys the kidney of the vulture because of its residue in the livestock as a painkiller. We have destroyed in 20 years what was part of Garur, Cleopatra's crown, one of the most hardy species 
we have made, made extinct in 20 years. And then we take the vulture out of our lives. We don't take out one species. We take out a whole web of connections, of cultures, of coexistences. And we are not only smaller for it, but also we become on the edge of existence ourselves. Thank you very much for listening in. And I do hope that I'll get a chance to interact with all of you in the future. Uh, that was a very sensitive speech. It reminds me about uh, my venture in Uttarakhand, uh, in, uh, among the, in Munsiari uh, and Darkot, uh, where we worked with the uh, Bhotia women who were a transhuman community. And they were, uh, um, in fact, I mean, uh, talking about community participation, we spent about 10% of the money and they spent 90% in inviting the entire Johar Valley, about 70, 80 villages, and feeding them. So what I am trying to say is that uh, ultimately community participation, what he talked about, was you know uh, decontextualization and uh, recontextualization. De de so that was an important thing. And as regards the fishing community, I remember the uh, example of uh, you know. Cabo Pulmo in Baja, California, Mexico, where uh, the fishing uh, 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 community uh, created a, a marine reserve park. And uh, since we know that uh, all the marine areas are being uh, destroyed, I mean, and uh, uh, you see we are, we are creating danger zones, it is very important that uh, marine protected areas are created with the help of fishing communities. Thank you. Hi, Aparna. We can see you now. Hi, I'll, yeah. I'll briefly give you the introduction. Yes. Uh, Aparna Rao, the topic today is Relentless Beings, a physical language of lifelike motion and behavior. Since 2004, Aparna Rao is part of Pores in Rao, a Bangalore-based art duo working with objects and installations that often incorporate lifelike physical movements and responsive behaviors. Many of the works are co sorry, conceived as a kind of being with basic behavior patterns, such as shyness, that you all up there, student, are showing right now, fatigue, we will get if you don't start asking questions, and dependence, highlighting involuntary aspects of human behavior and relationships. Over to you, Aparna, now. Uh, Aparna, sorry to uh, interrupt. We have Ravi joined us now because we were able to get him some question and answer. So before moving on to you, yeah, uh, a very warm welcome to you, Ravi. You can hear us? Uh, you're, you're on mute. A million dollar line. Yeah, I also. can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we have Ravi with us now. I uh, would uh, invite the audience to ask the questions. We had a fabulous presentation by you. And uh, anyone would like to ask? Hello. Yeah. Um, it was a wonderful presentation. I would like to know that as a student artist, how do I start observing this, like these communities yes. that we know very less of? There's no shortcut uh, from my uh, from my what I've learned. You have to uh, you have to have, you have to be clear why you want to do that, and be clear with them why you want to do that. And it takes time to get trust. Uh, it takes time to uh, build uh, some sense of solidarity with them. There's no reason for you for them to do it. And I think so long as you stay an outsider, then you will, of course, hear something, but I'm not sure what that will be. So I think it has, it's a, uh, it takes time and you have to be, I think, uh, I've always found you have to be completely honest and clear about why you want to do it and what you tell them, yeah, okay. why you want to do it. Okay, thank you so much. Hello, sir. Good afternoon. Um, sir, I have one question that uh, you said one line that through 
democracy, we can have sustainability. Uh, I, I can understand this line particularly. Can you just uh, make me understand this line? Am I audible, sir? Uh, yes, it, it's cutting off. You know, my, my line may not be very good, but please stay. You said, I said one line about democracy yes, and... Uh, you said that through democracy, we can have sustainability. Maybe Shwetl can repeat the question. Hmm? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I said about through democracy, yes. uh, that sustainability is it's very much part of a democratic process. That's what I meant. Because I think sustainability has to be seen from whose sustainability, from what, what perspective. And that's a political question. It's a question of, uh, of uh, so many things are involved in perspectives uh, through which uh, we think of sustainability. Um, yeah. And, uh, but thank you very much. And I'm so glad that you could join us. Um, thank you. And uh, thank you very much. It's been very inspiring. Thank you, Shweta. Thank you, Rina. And thank you for everything. Bye. Thank you. Um, I think let's start with the next session. We have Aparna Rao. Aparna, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just sort of uh, emphasize the introduction that uh, Rina gave about us. I've been part of uh, Practice Pros and Rao for nearly 19 years now. My uh, collaborator is a Danish artist, Soran Pols, and um, he moved to India about 17 years ago where we have our studio, and we do a lot of our conceptual work there. And much more recently, maybe about eight years or 10 years ago, we started to uh, work with various universities in Switzerland to develop robotics. And we don't really have a background in technology. We're actually not very interested in technology at all. But we're very interested in these involuntary patterns that are trapped in our body and express these sort of subconscious subliminal states that we are in. And we kind of make these guesses about the other state of a being. And we're very interested in these inner states and um, the mysteries of our states of mind and so on. So then I'm going to quickly uh, show you this is Soren and we, uh, our studio is in Bangalore and this is the neighborhood of our studio and just a corner of our studio and we've always since the beginning been very interested in sort of the sense of a being, how we can evoke our living presence in the space by animating objects and sort of it how they're able to express these living qualities such as awareness and sentience and emotion. And to give you an example, this is a very early work from 2008. It's almost meant to be like a piece of paper that's left behind in the space. And every time somebody passes by, it sort of attempts to resurrect itself but collapses every time in, in the sense of fatigue and it seems very trapped in the state of mind. So as Shweta requested, I just wanted to tell you that I'm not going to really go into each work but focus much more on our interdisciplinary collaborations, conversations we have with artists. And so I'm going to take you through about 12 of our artworks and talk about the tools that we've also developed for physical animation and what the challenge are about working with this medium. So this is a very simple gesture. It's a physical a responsive gesture, but it took us many, many years to develop it. And I'll go um, a bit later to why. This was seven, to 10 years after we made that first work. And it's a piece of A4, a sheet of uh, A4 paper that's in a vitrine. And it plays out a nine second gust of wind that we experience in our studio in Bangalore. So you will see here, we were very interested in this sort of involuntary motion and the unnoticed environmental forces and a sort of emotion that it elicits in us and wanting to sort of capture it as a relic. And in this case, we wanted to expose these mechanical levers that animate this paper on a high degree of animation because we're very specifically interested in this visceral feeling that physical movement and gestures can evoke in us. And again, going back to this disclaimer that we're really not interested in technology or robotics. We don't have a background in uh, any technical background, but perhaps are interested in this um, expressions of the body and patterns 
in which we adapt goes back to our early childhood. I grew, both of us, Sara and I, coincidentally grew up much closer to animals in early childhood than to people. And over the years, we were also both quite interested in many different forms of martial arts and the sort of stylistic movements and how you operate within this sort of lexicon of movement. And around the time that we met, which was in my early 20s, Soren was very interested in the work of Milton H. Erickson. He's the founder of hypnotherapy. And by direct observation in, of the ways in which people moved, he could often intuit their deeper psychological patterns and help them to bypass them, and often even pain. And at the same time, I was very much interested in the work of Conrad Lorenz, who used his physical body and physical gestures and mimicry to work with animals and imprint behavior patterns on them. And also, we had both uh, come from a background of um, visual and communication design. And Soren had worked for two years in a very intense uh, online communication chat game, which involved the physical animation of virtual avatars for the first time on the medium of the internet, which was very, very new at that time. It was the early 2000s. And just by these simple animations, you could only move one pixel at a time. Uh, you had to kind of create all these very special animations and emotive uh, identities with your avatar and how you engage with others. And so the medium was, you had to be very, very frugal with the movement of pixels to be able to create animations. I don't know. So spent a year working um, on the simulator for light combat aircraft. So the whole medium of interaction and animation online was very, very new to me. And so when we had finished this um, very intense period of working with technical teams and from a visual perspective, we were really very much looking to re-engage our bodies in our everyday lives and in our works. And it was also the time of the early proliferation of the internet and this, again, sudden shock of our physical lives becoming very, very quickly digital and us wanting to sort of reclaim that virtuality and make it, bring it back into the physical realm. So we were, these were our early experiments here. We worked um, with the R&D team of a CCTV camera company and we created a small experiment where we had a camera looking into the room and it would uh, map the people in the room and it would render one person invisible wherever they moved in the room. So here you see on the left side, Soren is physically present, but he's virtually absent. So very quickly, I'm gonna play this for you to work quite well and uh, manage this sort of uh, visual discontinuity very well uh, much later in the installation, which is part of But this work is very fun. And um, also at that moment, to kind of question the place of the body in this virtual world and how much our sense of self is sort of attached to the virtual presence. And the next work we did around 2008 was the first time we sort of played with nuanced behavior by physically animating an object uh, in response to real stimuli. So we like this idea of being surrounded by many hundreds of small tiny creatures and the first version of this work was an installation on three walls and there were these white panels camouflaged on white uh, walls and behind them hid hundreds of these tiny creatures that were very shy and would emerge only when the environment is quiet and hide uh, with the slightest sound so here again i'm going to play you this video Yeah, 
Yeah, so here we were very interested in this sort of hypersensitive, lifelike feeling of very fragile forms that are very, very responsive and alert to events in the immediate vicinity. So we used a very simple algorithm, which turned out not to be so simple, that incorporated randomness and probability that would assign these slightly unique responses to these uh, creatures uh, to trigger real-time responses to sound events. So they're always generating their behaviors. It's not a pre-recorded sequence of behaviors. They have a small memory of sound, so they become immune to sound. Um, they go into shock behavior if it's a very loud sound threshold, like real creatures do, they adapt to different sound environments. And they have different personality traits that can be more curious and more shy sometimes and want to be more uh, introverted and hide more sometimes and so on. And we found that uh, people were very engaged with this work. We, we didn't want any deliberate sort of input or interaction from viewers, but like squirrels or mice or other creatures or children to sort of um, inhabit their own worlds and be engaged in their own uh, lives and just respond to natural events around them. We found that one of the reasons that people became so engaged or lifelike, uh, childlike with them is because we took this lifelike aspect of this work very seriously. So we made about 26 or 28 versions in search of the right expression. And this is where I'll talk about why technology is so hostile to personalization. It's because we wanted to touch, hit this lifelike band. So in order to move very furtively, it had to move very slowly and to appear very lifelike had to retract very quickly. And so we were talking about a speed ratio of one to a thousand which is almost impossible to find in any mechanical actuator. It also had to be extremely silent because our body doesn't make sound when we move it and also that it wouldn't self-actuate. It also had to be very robust to uh, withstand public displays or to have a life as long as a painting or a static sculpture. It had to be maintenance free, it had to uh, be available uh, in the long run for people to be able to use it without the stress and tension that is caused by technology. And so over the years, we sort of learned to wire up these um, works. They also had to fit within the visual format of our own language. So we had a very specific aesthetic, which means that space constraints are very, very tight. And we just kept improving it as we learned more and more about technology. And this was a decade-long process. Uh, and it was quite painful. This was the first time we exhibited a whole wall in a public space for a, a year. And it was not a year that I slept very well. But luckily, um, some years ago, six years ago, uh, we found a very beautiful piece of technology, and this is a very advanced linear actuator. And it's so robust that it allows us, allowed us for the first time in our whole lives to, in this 10 year journey, to not feel tension around our own work, and really be able to enjoy it and work with uh, its behavior and really get into it. And this is the Foul Harbor Linear Actuator, and we actually sponsor our research now at the lab, and this is a very exciting uh, process because it allowed us again to enter into the animation fully and forget about the technology and not have the anxiety when you create the work itself. So here again, we were, this work is about this involuntary need to duck when you sense danger in the environment. And it's a sort of primal reflex that we share also with other species. And so we've always been interested in these involuntary behavior patterns. And since we had some experience working with simulations, we thought that for ourselves, we were, we create a simulation of how, um, behavior patterns are created, what are the organizing principles behind conscious and unconscious patterns, and so we looked at uh, some rules from neuroscience and what we experience in our own lives, and what we would look at this just between ourselves. So the black dots sort of represent the conscious patterns and the white the unconscious, and you see that the black dots sort of form these closed repeating loops and the white ones have larger latitude and they can also kind of um, circumvent the black dots and they can change patterns and enlarge them and eventually also break them. So you're very interested in pattern interruption and with your mouse you could hover over the black ones or click on the white ones and then you could create new patterns and see how patterns are perpetuated or broken and so on. 
and this is another sort of extension of the work. It was um, meant to be a sort of uh, frame, almost like a woodcut that uh, represents a sort of landscape. And you see these uh, creatures are sort of trapped inside this uh, this prison-like uh, feeling of this landscape, and they can sort of run back and forth, and they seem quite content in their uh, space until they sort of see an obstacle from the external world, and they will run and hide for cover. And so, again, here to highlight the importance of when an uh, inanimate object appears to become alive, there's a very uh, small, narrow band of precision that you need to hit with technology. And this is how we found ourselves in this very prestigious and privileged space uh, of the ETH in Zurich, which specializes in motion control. So the most advanced drones came from this institute, and somehow all these little things that appear toy-like to many uh, also need a kind of very sophistication, uh, sophisticated approach in the way that technology is designed because it's so non-standard that we really need to personalize a lot of things. And so you see here that at the beginning, when the object was sort of uh, jumping higher than it was moving forward, it looked like a bouncing ball. There was nothing alive about it. And then when you go in into the uh, milliseconds and uh, the microns and you change that ratio, it suddenly becomes this sort of happy-go-lucky creature that's walking down the street and all these sort of ethereal qualities that you can put onto this creature suddenly come alive. But it's in that very high precision band. So you'll see here, this is at, at our studio in Bangalore, where there are some runners missing, but you can immediately sort of pick up this feeling of life, lifelike movement um, in this space. So now I'm going to introduce you to uh, Professor Susan Gasa. Again, I'm very privileged that she was the first scientist I ever met about seven or eight years ago. She's arguably one of the most established, serious, respected scientists in Europe and the former director of the Education Institute of Biomedical uh, Research. And she was the one who sort of um, took me and opened up the world of science and scientists to me, which was very daunting at the beginning because it's very, very advanced fundamental science. But it, the opportunity sort of came up because FMI was moving into a new building and they wanted an artwork for it. And she'd come across our work and said, you know, why don't you engage with all our group leaders and science? And we had sort of informal exchange and uh, very exciting concepts that we were ourselves artistically interested in, but seeing the sides behind it. And this was the building, and many of them are working with various species, and it's, it's, so we sort of had the idea of a distributed artwork. What if they were this notion that the whole building is also, there's another whole species that inhabits this, this building. And so it was the idea that it was meant to be a permanent installation, so it had to also be quite discreet. And so they're meant to be these kind of ceiling beams that we call them that kind of hit in in the ceilings and you would see them only from a distance and as soon as you approach they would hide and retract into their own hidden habitat. So this would be in the stairwell and we sort of incorporated this idea of genes. So you have like uh, genetic traits, so you're more curious or you're more mischievous if you belong to this family and it also had a pattern. So if you were more white or black, you also represented a certain gene pool or trait. Um, we also thought that there could be uh, community characteristics or size could determine age and if you were older you would be more lethargic and if you were young you would be a, a little more quick and you know, the body language would be quite different and over time they would get used to certain people walking down the corridor and there would be a sort of uh, kind of growing or a genetic relationship that would evolve over the years in this building so it's not a static behavior. And um, so you'll see a very, very early prototype that also I lab in Zurich. Uh, just a testing scenario. Um, and it's a very early prototype. Many of our works take literally years or decades even to uh, be realized, which is the painful part of our practice. 
And so we don't only think about movement in the moving form, this is a static work, it's a sort of Rorschach figure. And uh, the idea was that it was conceived in the movement of the opening of a space as if two corners of a room opened up and gave birth to this creature. And we like the idea that it sort of also appears in voluntary as if it's held against its will by the tension in the space. And the form of it was to us reminiscent of neurons. And we worked very hard for several uh, years, I think, to sort of get the form just right so that it, it elicited this sort of body like bodily feeling in us that it's it's very tense at the same time, it's very gummy and squishy and there's a kind of visceral feeling about it. At around the same time, uh, we met uh, Georg Keller, he's now a friend of ours, and he's uh, a computational biologist, but also a neuroscientist, and he's working with the notion that visual perception is based on expectation, which is quite different from the way that science understood the, the role of the visual cortex in seeing so far. And so through our informal conversations with him, uh, we happen to mention to him this work. It's actually called The Constant Cat, and it's about a relationship that I had also saw and shared with a cat that was part of the family in our studio for 13 years. And he had this peculiar behavior, so he always maintained a constant distance to us. He was always following us around wherever we were in the studio, but if we approached him, he would sort of back off. So it was his way of saying, I need this four feet, a constant four feet of distance between us. And um, it was sort of, and I found that a very comforting form of relationship or love or, or a companionship. And so when we were thinking about this, we had this idea of the constant dot and um, it was to create the experience that sort of played with perspective. So uh, it was meant to be a sort of dark room with a illuminated circle at one end. And it was just a, a, a circle of light. And the idea is that wherever you moved in the room and looked at it, it would always appear to be a circle of the same size. Now this doesn't happen because if you go closer to an object, it appears bigger in your field of reference. And if you're very far, it will appear as a small dot. And uh, so we had to develop these very specific sensors. It's so advanced that we're still doing it. And so to give you a sense, I'll show you a video, but this is what Georg did because he was so excited about testing his theory in a way, in an, in an experience form that here you see Soren. He's moving around and the circle is mocking, but of course to Soren it appears the same size. And we'd have to remove spatial orientation by dimming the room a little bit and so on. So the, the exciting thing is it appears to be the same size to Soren. Yeah, and so it expands and becomes an oval or it contracts and it distorts itself. And there's something very comforting about that somehow. Um, and then Georg came over to the studio. He did a sabbatical and was at our studio for some weeks. And we were working <clears throat> at that time on this work, which was called The Observers. And it was the idea of this nest-like being that was on the wall. And it's, um, it's like these small creatures whose whole purpose of existence is to observe events in the environment. So they sort of look around, scouting for events. So here you will see this is um, somebody's coming to the room, so their whole attention is there. And then they're scouting around to see what else is going on, nothing, and so they just, and then the cameraman starts to move, and then their whole attention is on following uh, what the cameraman is doing. And here is the, the sensor and behavior, and this is uh, uh, of technology in our work. And it's very, some years later, this was post-pandemic, I happen to see that uh, Georg's new research question is about what computational principles provoke and generate behavior in the brain. So it was kind of exciting uh, to, to see his interest sort of move in the direction that's quite parallel to ours. 
and again here just to sort of show you a bit of our research or our, our the, the things that Sarah and I do between us is this is a sort of informal notation of methods of subconscious influence uh, that uh, that can that make a, a thought move from one state to the other so we keep creating these <clears throat> over the years and we call them the adventures of anatomy that this creature is called anatomy because it moves from state A to B and this is for example the river and this is the double bind and it refers to this sense of disorientation that happens when you have two uh, contradictory signals at the same time uh, from the same source um, which can be very disorienting. And then now I'm going to move to a very ambitious rock. This is the one we've been attempting for 12 years. We failed at least eight times. And it's the idea of uh, a cube that's also a being and a creature. And it's about 1.2 meters high, something like that. And then it can grow very quickly into an object that's four times its volume and twice its height and reveals kind of much more complex structure in sort of response to people approaching it. So it literally swallows up the space that people approach it and kind of move people away from the center as if it's guarding a secret and it's sort of uh, showing it seems and the, the real part of it is actually on the inside. And so these overlapping scales are very important to us. And so I think about six years into its development, um, was uh, this project and a uh, very exciting engineering school year in Switzerland. So this is to show you the, the scale. It literally becomes into a small room and it's extremely challenging to do. And this is a doctor video. It doesn't move this fast yet. But unless it can move at a speed of one meter per second and do the whole expansion in uh, three seconds, it will remain quite a beautiful machine, but it will never become a creature or living lifelike to our perception because our brain is uh, not easy to fool. So unless, again, you work in those the pattern that the brain assigns life to, you will never be able to make it living. And so this is not a doctored video. We moved it from one institution to another to be able to keep the production and the realization and research going. And so you'll see here we have a prototype of the overlapping skins. And you'll see how complex the inside is. And we still have a, a lot of work to do. Now we've moved it to the fourth institution and we really hope that we're going to be able to finish it by the end of the year because robustness is really a big aspect that it doesn't break down, it doesn't need constant um, surveillance from a team of engineers and so on. Um, and also that you don't see technology or hopefully don't hear it, which is a big challenge in this case, but let's see where we get to. This was a fun work. It started off, sort of started off with a silly idea of thinking, okay, what? Let's do a work where we have canvases walking out or away from the room, away from people. And so this silly idea sort of possessed us so much that we decided to give in to it. And um, I was like, this very early version, we wanted an upstick feel to it. We wanted to be able to put different expressions in the way that the canvas walks so you could tell what sort of being it is and so have a, a kind of pet-like or creature-like feel to it. And so we also have a number of uh, students who come to our studio for exchange programs and they you are know, sort of beginning to craft the expression of the movement. And it's really quite difficult to be able to define these uh, movements with technology, especially when you have complex mechanical systems like this. And you have four motors that you have to animate very, very precisely to get the perfect expression. And so we wanted to be able to artistically define these movements or intuitively. So we just want to be able to take the object and physically animate it with the movement that we intend. But it's really quite challenging to take that movement and be able to transcribe it onto the canvas itself. And we were able to do that. And so you'll see here, this is a sort of limping walk. And this is a sort of tiptoe walk. And of course, you see no technology. It has a battery inside that will allow it to run for four hours. And, uh, the whole idea is that it's not a technological experience, but it's much more of an experience of a living creature around you. 
And here you see that it's sort of fully autonomous, meaning that there's no navigation system in space. It has a very simple behavior. And we wanted it to exhibit the sense of awareness. So when it meets an obstacle, it sort of turns around and it moves away from the obstacle. And it simply does this, but the sense of awareness is very strong in that, in that gesture. And of course, here it is in a very heavy public space without any sort of monitoring or piloting. You can see that uh, we were able to let it walk around freely in the space and people sort of managed it quite differently. And the whole psychological response to this was quite different from the way people respond to robots or, or other sorts of things. So that was very exciting. And just as an aside, we also were very excited about um, using, uh, just doing an experiment in AI. We are actually also not very interested in AI, but in this case, we thought it would be fun if we could have um, a system that captured my walk and put it on the canvas. And would it be possible to identify that if the canvas were walking like me? Or what if it, we could say that it was a canvas walking or like me on a day when I'm really upset or happy or stuff? Like how much nuance could you actually put in motion and how much nuance could we actually perceive? So this is um, also working with a, a lab at the AI department at ETH and looking at points. Well, these are all very, very long and complex experiments and we have to work within academic time frames and what students and labs are interested in. And so we often start the experiment, but it takes very long time to finish. So we've started the experiment, but we're very far from finishing. So I'm going to then quickly take you through Pathos, which is... Um, the system that we developed. Uh, and as you see, for every every artwork, we had to start engineering from scratch, which was really not sustainable for an artistic practice. And so we were reaching the end of our tether and thought, okay, now we have to close down the studio. It's like was getting very really difficult and, and rather painful, I have to say. And then we were very lucky to hit upon this idea of pathos. And we got an opportunity in 2015 to begin our research within a network of academic institutions in Switzerland as an art project. And this is our lab. And the idea was that we would have, it would be a sort of Lego system. So you would have a number of mechanical units. You would have some control units. And you would have sensors. And you would have this web interface. And to just show you this very early um, version of the very first kit, it's just a linear actuators which just goes back and forth. And you can define that motion very clearly. It came out of an artwork. I'm going to go quite quickly because I see I'm a little over time. And the idea was of this artwork was that it, it's a crowd. And um, we were very interested in this feeling of being in a crowd and the sense of isolation that you feel when you're trapped behind. You're very engaged in what's happening, but you can't, you, you can't really partake in it. And you're curious, but you're um, sort of left behind and that that whole sense of being trapped in that moment where you can't really get to to understanding something and then let you can't let it go and this that uh, feeling and so to capture that feeling we had this very specific movement which was just a linear movement and we started to develop the sort of um, physical gesture and this seems very simple but it takes actually a lot of years to do it because if you're interested in the long term you have to make it extremely friction free you're testing the way you test it for 20 years life is very different from how you test it for a three month life or a life of a, a, a demo or a prototype so over the years we really defined this mechanism and then it became the first kit and you see this is the first pathos kit it's very exciting to see technology as a kit um, sophisticated robotics come into the hands of non-technical people and this is actually quite a breakthrough for us in our process because it's the first time that we could animate a motor in real time so you can see what you're animating as opposed to writing a lot of code and seeing 15 minutes later after a number of technical processes and you can't actually correlate the animation that you want with the movement because there are all these protocols and incompatibilities in between hardware and software and it's, can be quite a nightmare. So this was a huge big breakthrough, and it's the first time it could be spontaneous with physical animation in 19 years. So yeah, it almost made me cry. Uh, and this shows how much further you can take it. You can also just physically animate something 
early remove the animator from the technical processes behind it you can have uh, you don't have to build everything from scratch and it can become quite an artistic and intuitive process all this time it's not and we also started to test it with different people who work completely from a non-technical background. So this is Leah, she's also a former colleague of mine at the lab. And she's from this world. She makes these very beautiful paper structures. And I thought it would be very nice if she took our first kit and married it with these features. And then she made this that I thought of as a pathos poster because this aspect of moving in this lifelike band is very much at the heart of pathos. Um, to also free visual aesthetics from robotics. And this was the, the two-state being. So when I introduce people to this kit, I always call it the two-state being. So you can show a default behavior and you can show a sort of triggered uh, behavior. So this was the first experiment, which I thought was very exciting. And she quickly moved to making other uh, experiments and I also then introduced a friend of mine, Dennis Hansen, who's arguably the world's experts in turtles and uh, evolutionary biologist and he would show Leia oh, this is a dinosaur and there are scales and Leia would beautifully imagine this and put motion to it. And um, I'm wondering if my slides have frozen. Okay, I'll move quite quickly, but the idea is that it's sort of two pieces of paper and it moves very much like a beating heart and Leo has no experience in actually uh, moving robotics or with robotics was able to do this in about two days, which is very exciting. And here we have Felix, who's a graphic designer. And these are some posters that he made. And I was very excited to see how he works with so much movement in his work. You see all the typographies moving, things are sliding, dripping away, they have motion blur to them. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice to give him the same kit and see what he would come up with? So Felix was tremendously excited. And in the first day, started to make a lot of different sketches. And here you can see a video of what he came up with in the first couple of hours that he received the kit. And so this is a very, very first uh, sort of experiment for the tip of the iceberg. And then we're going to see what emerges. And um, this is also a quick experiment we did with Dynamo. They are typographers and they work with variable type. And maybe I'll quickly skip now because I see that there's a delay with the video on what I'm saying. <clears throat> but this is what they designed as the a pathos font. So they worked within the kinematic constraints of the kit and they made a really kind of pathos font. So here every alphabet can morph into every other. So it's very exciting. So you can spell words and sentences which is three characters and so on. So very, very exciting. We've had um, workshops with uh, students, young design and art students, uh, and the outcome was very exciting. In about four days, we saw that they were able to use these kits and, and kind of hide all the technology and make their own projects. And I was very afraid that or wanted to test if different people could actually have uh, different expressions and it would lead to sort of infinite exploration. And I was quite happy to find that our hunch was right. And this was a 16 year old that's able to use um, technology also for the first time in three days to make his own being or creature. And so this kind of um, sort of allows us to imagine that it is possible to democratize uh, robotics and make it a medium of visual expression for anybody. Yeah, so I think I'll end there. And all of this is not possible without the support of all these amazing institutions and also several, several people uh, whose shoulders I stand on and who supported us through these last 18 years. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Thank you, Aparna. We have uh, 10 minutes um, approximately left. I'd really like to yes. hear perhaps from some of the students um, and especially some of the female students about 
what you thought um, in terms of engineering and this intersection between science, engineering, and art. And um, if you'd like to share any thoughts or anybody else who has any comments, and then we will break for lunch. And I have a very quick question for you, Aparna. Um, as an artist, you've been involved with ETH. Just tell us again um, how that happened, and now you're in charge of your own laboratory. So that's very, very special. It's not a case of an artist in residence uh, to complement what the scientists are doing. It's, it's actually much more fundamental than that. And it's quite unusual, I think. So that'll be interesting to hear. Yeah, I think it was it, it happened over 10 years, Shweta. So the first thing that happened is that I met a couple of students, now they're assistant professors at ETH, and they were very excited about what we were doing. So this, you know, about 10 or 12 years ago, no one was, no engineer was taking what we were doing seriously, and we also grossly underestimated the level of engineering that was required to make these things work. And so we were in search of just sort of finding our feet with engineers and happened to meet a group of students who made a demo uh, and got talking to them and they said, hey, come over to, to Switzerland. So the next time I was there many months later, I happened to meet uh, their professor who was very excited about also moving robotics from research into the public domain. So he liked what I was doing and he was very open and he said, why don't you go into my lab and if there's anyone who wants to take on a semester project or a bachelor project and work on one of your artworks, that's great and it can become part of our program. So these young students gathered their friends together and I literally said, hey, I want to build this, we want to do this. And there were a couple of students who were interested. And over this 10-year period, we had almost 12 students a semester and formally working with us. And we had created a network of about six institutes and universities in Switzerland, which is actually much more than what an assistant professor uh, is sort of orchestrating in the student body. So it reached a point where ETH kind of had to say, hey, this is exciting, what are you doing? And the students got the highest, usually got the highest grades on our projects and many labs wanted the students that had worked with us. And last year, the last uh, ETH pavilion at the World Economic Forum, somehow it turned out that these walking canvases were the showcase of the ETH pavilion. So this was completely un anticipated and we were just trying to make these art Works and suddenly there was a lot of interest and also from the industry because we move motors in all sorts of non-standard ways and the motor industry became interested in sponsoring our research because they said we give them very invaluable information so for example in the linear actuators we gave, we said you know these bearings wear off if you test them for so long you do these kinds of things and they were able to go back into the medical industry automation industry and switch those parts before they were found out in those critical applications so it was a combination of a lot of things and also Switzerland uh, the president of ETH is very interested in now connecting ETH to the arts and arts uh, and design community, and it's actually like two complete different silos. So it, it was a lot of things that over a period of ten years kind of uh, fell into place, and the resources were created for us to have our own lab. So yeah, it's a very kind of a personal story and uh, a, a slow and a long process. So like what Ravi said, there's no easy answer to anything. It's a very personal journey, and you have to find yourself and stick with it and you know until three or four years ago it was it, extremely painful and uh, Sora and I I think had at one moment maybe thought we, we can't cannot be artists because it was so difficult and now it's sort of having overcome that I mean there's still a lot of challenges and struggles and life is full of turmoil but it's a lot easier now that we have this amazing lab. Thanks. Hi, Aparna, Parmesha. Hi. How are you? So, uh, my oh, question hi, is... Hi, Parmesha. How are you? Very good. Good to see you and loved your talk. Um, my Thank question you. is a follow-up to... Um, you can't see me because there's, a, there's this camera in front. My question is a follow-up to Shweta's question about... I mean, it's been great to look at the intersection of, you know, how your work has been with uh, scientific institutions as well as corporate 
corporations who want to understand and take some of this um, into their work. My question is about your collectors, because you also sell your work through Gallery Ski and other uh, spaces. So tell us about your collectors and you know who are your collectors? Have they changed over the years as your practice has changed as well? Um, or have you gathered a whole new set of collectors and patrons? I mean, yeah, yeah, we haven't made that many artworks in life because it takes so long. So we, we don't really have that much to go around. And so we also found some years ago that the gallery system does not work for us. So we worked with Gallery C and were there in the past and they were fantastic. But it this uh, commercial art uh, system does not support this heavy research that we need to do. So now we work directly with institutions or private commissions where the, the patron is sort of is a patron of our process and our practice and not just of the work. And so we invite them to the lab, we tell them that the, there are risks involved and they are willing to take on the risk. And so unless you develop a relationship with the person and it's kind of lifelong because if they have a work, it will need maintenance in some years, it will need upgrades, software change. And so unless they understand all that and willing to engage with us in the long term, uh, we don't. So we very reluctantly built patronage. And so far, it's the, the few patrons that we've had have been really good and supportive. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Aditya. I'm from the Heritage School. And I have a question that after making all these artworks, how has it changed your individual thoughts and beliefs? It's a good question. Well, we don't think of it like that. It's just sort of, I mean, the we were still very engaged with the same subject. Our, our research has not changed. So I wouldn't say that this process has uh, really affected or changed us. We've always we're actually still committed to the same thing. So nothing has changed that much. Uh, we wish that we didn't need so much technology, but we haven't got many good ideas without technology. So unfortunately, we're a bit married to it at the moment. But yeah, so I don't think doing the work has changed. It's just taken us deeper into our own subject of exploring these patterns. That's the, the bottom of our work. Like, uh, so, has it changed your own personal individual thoughts? Like, for making artworks, like, suppose you made uh, like some artwork, and then there's a new perspective in life which helps you create some other artworks. So, has it happened? Yeah, I mean, it, it happens. I think of them as new urgencies, but as I told you, we don't really make artworks very quickly. It's a, it's a very long commitment. So unless, so I think the, the good part about it is unless it really grabs you somehow and we don't really think about why it grabs us, it's not so rational. And so we remain committed for years. So we've been committed to the small creatures for 10 years and the cube for 14. So once we're committed, we're committed. So it's not so much a introspective like we still commit. I mean, we won't we won't do it if we are not committed to staying with it for as long as it takes. So things don't change that quickly for us. It's more like we have new urgencies or new projects, but that's also a very long process. And we like that it takes time, and we can refine and distill things, and we can stay with it for such a long time. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Aparna. In January in Pune, I visited the school that Ajay is in charge of. It's an incredible, incredible place. I'm sure they can't have visitors like us all the time. They won't get any work done. But if you are in Pune and they do have time, I highly recommend a visit. So the topic that Ajay will be talking about in partnership with nature 
And then we're going to be having some students from the school join us by Zoom at the end. And this is really also in recognition to all the students that we have here, that you're very much part of this conversation. And your views and your opinions and your questions are as important as anybody else's here. So please feel free. And of course, there is the offer of a prize um, in terms of a membership for those that are interacting. But even apart from that, uh, please do feel free to interact. So as a brief introduction, Ajit Almiya is the co-founder of Drive Change Learning and Resource Center, DLRC, better known DLRC, and it brings a wealth of diverse experience from different business disciplines. Prior to co-founding DLRC, he managed Green School in Bali and had cross-functional experience in the corporate sector. While he has done his graduation in mechanical engineering, he loves history and maths and is passionately driven by pedagogy at the school. So over to you, Ajay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shwetal and, and Rina. I think, first of all, thanks a lot for inviting uh, me to speak to this conference. I really appreciate it. And uh, it, is, it is really, and I would say I would thank my co-founders, uh, Mona Dalmia and Pavan Iyengar, three of us co-founded DLRC, uh, to letting me come and share our experience with you all. Uh, what I would like to share, quickly give you a very brief uh, background, I would say that I'm very, quite humbled by the presentations uh, that we heard this morning and the humility with which they were presented. Uh, I would say that uh, I am very much more of a humble teacher, a facilitator at the school, uh, like Dr. Shwetal said, and uh, this, what you're going to, I, the experience that I'm going to share is primarily a labor of love in terms of how to bring learning to life and how do we do it in partnership with nature. And hence my topic of in partnership with nature. So the flow of it is what I will quickly share. Um, I would say that my, my journey uh, to this particular project actually culminates from my experiences around the world, I lived in US, Europe, Singapore, Bali, and came to Pune. So what you're going to see here has been inspired by my journey around the world. And also, more importantly, I think one of the presentations we heard about partnering with community. So it was about partnering with, working with ASHA for education and working on how education can drive social and economic change. So I worked with communities in Rajasthan and Northeast India. And it is that that really showed me, taught me, as to what education ought not to be. And that is really culminated in the project that we are going to see here in partnership with nature. So what we'll do is we'll go through a very brief <coughs> intro as to what does partnership with nature look like. Right? We'll give you, share with you some examples uh, of partnership with nature at DLRC show you some pictures, show you a short video. We'll also talk about something that uh, uh, Dr. Grudas had, had mentioned. We'll talk about the, um, the produced capital and the natural capital. Very briefly, we'll just show you uh, a short picture and we'll elicit some responses. By very nature that I am a teacher slash facilitator, I would not want this to be a monologue. I'm going to ask you questions and anyone in the audience, please share. And that is really what the beauty of this dialogue will be all about. Okay. Okay. So I think this is what we are going to talk about very quickly. Right. And then the last one would be as to how can we work together uh, to partner with nature. So I've given some examples there. Okay. So there we go. So partnership with nature, what does it mean? It means that for us, treating all waste as resource. So examples that we shared with you, where the waste that is generated on the campus, how do we treat it as a resource for something else? Second is educating adults and children alike to love nature. So we tell our facilitators and our parents when they join DLRC, which by the way is Drive Change Learning and Resource Center, that you are joining as a learner. 
not as a parent, not as a teacher. Yes, you are, but you are first and foremost a learner. <clears throat> so when parents come to get their child admitted at DLRC, we tell them that your child is automatically admitted. The question is whether you as parents are admitted or not. So we go through a cycle where we actually have them read our philosophy, interview them, interact with them, and if we find that their thought process and thinking is aligned with ours, then we admit the parents, and as a result, the child gets admitted. Right? So that is the reason why educating adults and children alike is very important. And the last but not the least, uh, Dr. Gurudas in his slide talked about nature's economy versus human economy. And that is what we talk about, establishing limits on economic growth. Until we do that, we will not be able to move from human ec economics to nature economics. We'll share with you some examples of how we do that there, okay? Hmm. Okay, so I'm just going to leave this chart up for 30 seconds, oops. This just moves back. Yeah, I, I, I'm just going to wait. Okay. This one some of you to share, you can raise your hand. I just want to, you to share what you see on the screen here. Anyone? Okay, anyone can share as to what did you observe on this chart? Okay, so, yeah, so it's, but I think that what you mean is that the human capital has increased over time, right? So that's one observation. What else? Anybody students there? Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, produced capital means uh, mean, uh, mean uh, humans want humans throw the garbages or anything um, wasted things. Okay, okay. Anyone else from the students? Anybody? Students? No. Okay. Anyone else from the audience here? Adults? Yeah, you can take us. You cannot be wrong. Natural capital is reducing, okay? Good, very good observation. Anything else? Anyone? The gap is increasing, lovely, lovely. So what we are seeing here is the produced capital over time has really rapidly ramped up, right? And the produced capital is nothing but what Dr. Gurudas had mentioned in his talk about GDP. That is a measure of GDP. The human capital is about our innovation and the way we improve, and the natural capital is nothing but the consumption that happens of natural resources. So as the gap increases, I'm sure we can see that this is not sustainable. Okay, the gap cannot keep increasing. There will be a time when it will land us into trouble. So I would like you to keep this in mind as we go ahead in the, in the presentation, and this is really, is a very telling as to the speed at which we are hankering after growth, GDP, and it is coming at a cost of the natural capital. Okay. I'll wait. Ah, there you go. So, we are going to show some examples of partnership with nature at our school campus. So, first is human waste as nutrients. And we call them, so we have two waste, primarily two waste products that we take out of our body, solids and liquid, which is our pee and poo. We call at the center, at the campus, we call the, our poo, we call it solid nutrients, and liquid, we call it liquid nutrients. Now, so it's just a change of perspective, right? People, students start thinking of it differently, so we'll give that example, we'll look at that. What do we mean by food and animal waste as energy input? We'll talk about that as well. Harnessing interdependency of species. So food is very personal to us. Has been times immemorial. Today, 
food has become a commodity. And when anything becomes a commodity, we don't think about it. Price becomes important. So the question is, what is that interdependency and how do we bring that consciousness back? Fourth one is biomass for soil nutrient replenishment. How do we use the biomass that is generated to replenish the soil? And the last is about building around trees with packaging wood for construction. So we'll give you some examples about that as well. Okay. So there we go. Okay, human waste and nutrients. I want to take a look at this diagram that is coming up and just share your thoughts. No question, just what you observe, just your thoughts that come to your mind when you look at it. Yes. The first diagram shows that the chain is a cyclical process. Uh, what goes out comes back in, and yeah. the, in the second one, the process is broken. The cycle is broken. This disrupts the whole process. Okay, so which one do you think we follow today? Like the, the broken one. The broken one, okay. Okay, that is one observation. Anybody else? Any, any other student? Any adult? Oh, okay. Yeah, that is true. So this here is what we do when we flush in our toilets and it goes out and needs to be treated, which is STP, which is again, I think you had spoken, which is energy intensive. What this process does is actually compost what we take out. We call it solid nutrients and gives it back into the soil, which comes back to us in healthy food growth, okay? Okay, so. So this is what we follow at our campus. So what you see here are toilets, which you may not be able to see, but there is a bucket here, the toilet seat. So all we need to do is to s deposit our solids in the bucket, cover it with sawdust, and once it is covered daily, we deposit it in these pits, compost pits. And these compost pits, given our capacity of campus, about 250 students, get, gets, will fill up in about a year. So we don't do anything with it for a year. It just sits there. And we have two pits. We have one pit which is here, and another pit is here. And then center is what we have, are the, uh, is the sawdust. And sawdust comes from the construction that we do on our campus, so we use that. And this compost, with our solids, after a year, we use it in our vegetable beds. Okay, you can stand next to it, you will smell nothing. You can, you can do your job, deposit your solids, cover it with sawdust, and you will smell nothing. I don't need to call a, a septic truck. I don't need to use flush. It is absolutely sustainable. Now, this took a lot of convincing of the adults and children that it is healthy for you to use it. It's healthier, actually, than what they do today. And you don't need to flush your solids down. And we get some healthy, juicy vegetables when we use this compost, I'll tell you. Okay, there is nothing, nothing wrong in it. I have been doing it, and, and I was educated about this in Bali, by the way. Okay. We do the same thing for our urine. That gets mixed with water, with the, uh, with the hand wash water. And we em empty the tank every week. And the water with the diluted urine, our liquid nutrients, goes into the plants. And that is the beauty of, so human waste as nutrients, that is the first thing. Because, sorry? Oh, in rainy season, it's same thing, right? Because this this is covered, so there is no there's no water that goes in there. There is covering there, yeah. And anyway, we do need to put some water in there for for moisture so that uh, the the bacteria can survive. Yeah. 
right 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 absolutely right correct right so so this is the system and and again the inspiration is that nature doesn't produce any waste so if we are producing waste we need to look at as resource and we need to deploy it productively next is food and animal waste as energy input okay so we look at this as as an energy i am sure you all know about a very simple system of food waste we have our animal waste this is the biogas system and it can be used for energy and for lighting so what we do in our campus is we have a biogas system so what you see here and this system has no moving parts zero moving parts all it is is that we need to feed the system with food waste and given that our children and uh, facilitators are conscious we don't generate that much food waste so right about 100 meters from our campus there are street restaurants we have convinced them to segregate their food waste their wet waste they give it to us we feed the system we generate cooking gas and we use it in our cafeteria okay so we are not only recycling our own waste but the waste from the neighborhood and that is really what how this is used and not only that in schools we talk about a science lab this is a living science lab this has got chemistry it's got biology and it has got physics in it and i'll tell you the simplest of physics high school students will stumble upon when i take their lesson because their concepts have not been clarified from the beginning so this is another example of how we process our waste the next is harnessing the interdependency of species bring it up both in one go how many of you have heard of aquaponics okay okay you have heard of aquaponics okay how great 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 i'm sure you have heard about hydroponics and i'm sure some of you must have heard about aquaculture so aquaponics is nothing but a com combining aqu aquaculture and hydroponics and in our campus we have built an aquaponics unit and we are growing plants uh, we are growing food one is to meet some of the needs of our community but more importantly also acts as a living lab here what happens is this is the fish tank the waste from the fish is pumped into these beds here not pumped sorry it goes by gravity into these beds here we have plants growing so they filter the water in one stage the filtered water then goes into these growing beds they filter it further and from this sump tank it is pumped into the fish tank and we don't need to add any filter the plants are filtering the poo of the fish they use that as nutrients and the filtered water goes back into the fish tank so i i only need to provide one input which is the fish feed and i get healthy plants oh my god the, the lettuce has been amazing coming out of the system and our parents are paying a premium to buy this lettuce so not only i have i created a living lab i have also created an economic system in my campus where the students can are learning business they are learning economics they are learning to work with the with the farmers how to replicate the system in our neighborhood right so there is so much of learning that a system of this nature uh, i'm just blessed to have this here right so and this is really the cycle where you see plants absorb nitrates fish excrete uh, ammonia into nitrite into nitrates and you know what this is chemistry right here chemistry oh my god well, uh, you can learn all chemistry that you want here and this is about so our focus is how can we grow food so kids can see food very personally and not in a supermarket right next one is about soil enrichment by composting of biomass and that is 
should come up shortly here, is biomass using worms. I'm sure you, many of you have heard about vermicomposting. So we follow that absolutely. All our dry waste, everything, all dry waste goes into this pit here. We get black gold, which we use in our vegetable beds, and that is really how we recycle that. So on the campus, it's a green campus, and you will shortly see the video. You, you get, uh, we process our food waste, we process our human waste, we process our uh, dry waste that comes from the leaves. All waste gets processed and you must be wondering what happens to all the water. The gray water gets collected and gets the plants get watered as well. So not a drop gets wasted, no waste goes out of the campus. So that is really how uh, we operate on this one. And I was talking about the building around the trees. Uh, you will see here uh, very shortly, even the lag that is there. So these, uh, these black uh, coverings that you see on the roof, they are actually, um, uh, we call them kaul, and you don't get them in Pune. I actually especially ordered them from Karnataka, where the craftspeople make it by hand, and they are very special black tiles, and they are beautiful. They are five years now, and they still look as new as they were before. It's such a nice thing. See, this is a structure here, which you see actually a combination of many things here. So this wood that you see here is recycled wood that comes, uh, we get uh, cars in pallets uh, that come into India. So that gets, uh, wood gets recycled. The roof is made from mangrove tiles. Trees you can see here, there's one, two, three, four, five trees, and they are going right through the roof. Right, so we, we didn't cut any of those trees. We have put a cap on the top in the stock and left enough space, as you can see in the roof there, so that the tree has some leeway to move, the tiles don't get bad, and it has been that way for the last five years as well. So these are examples of how we are partnering with nature to bring our school and educate children, more importantly, once the kids see all this, when they go out in life, they will think about it. And they'll say, ah, yes, okay, we, we have these solutions possible. Right. This, I will share you a short video.
is our campus uh, where the students learn in nature and uh, how we would partner and how can we work in partnership for nature is one is definitely to educate our children. If once we can get them to love nature, they will preserve it, they will protect it, and they will look for the environment. Practice conscious consumerism. So we really, at our campus, we tell, we ask our students and parents is to consume whatever you can within a certain radius of the campus. If absolutely you have to get it from outside, you do. But reduce the miles by which your food travels. Right? And last is to include natural capital in our accounting practices for sustainable economic living. Uh, and that, I would say, is the hardest thing to do because once it gets tied to numbers, it will automatically be in the face. So definitely very important to follow these. And I would say one thing we talk about ed educating children, I've got two of our students uh, from DLRC. One is in grade 11, other is in grade 8. Uh, we'll ask them questions. Uh, you can ask them questions and we'll see what they have to say. Right, so can we, uh, they are on Zoom right now, so ca how do we get them on the screen? Yes, in the meantime, there's a question. I think you had a question, please go ahead. So in the last slide, we saw that there's a possibility to even, uh, uh, we have seen in Bangalore many buildings are there where it's a full grown tree is there and the, uh, the proper residential or commercial uh, space being designed. But here we are seeing the uh, option for growth. All, all the saplings, like maybe one or two years old saplings are around and the tiles will give them option to remove the tires and you know make space for growth but how do we modify the roof in order to waterproofing it because india and monsoon you know yes yes waterproofing is a challenge and you have to work around it you have to give enough space to the trees and be prepared that you would have to do some modification in three to five years yes 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 so so what we do is that we put a cap on the tree itself, you put a cap on the tree with enough radius so the water doesn't fall on the roof. It falls a bit further away. So these are solutions that we have designed as we have seen what is happening in nature. So, okay, any, you had it? Yes. Uh, how uh, how can uh, how can we recycle the plastics and the plastic tubes of cream, shampoo, and the plastic carry bags? What can we do for the industries which are polluting our environment? Okay. <laughs> okay, so two questions. What can we do for the industries that are polluting our environment? And the second is what do we do about plastics? How do we recycle plastics? So I would say the first thing we tell students is don't get any plastics on campus and, and reduce it within at the point of use. Recycling is after you have used it. It takes a lot of effort. So the question is that if you do have to use it, then you have to find proper ways of recycling it. And industries, better we have to just work with them, right? It's about education. Some things are avoidable. Some we have to find ways to avoid it. I have a quick question before the next question. Yes. In, in all of this, um, of course, it's an educational exercise. The, the, what are the, from a parent's perspective, especially Indian parents, I think parents everywhere, what are the academic achievements? Uh, if someone goes through the system, from your experience, how do they then compare with students who go to, let's say, more regular schools? Um, what has been your experience there? So our experience has been that the students who graduate uh, from DLRC, they become uh, very adept at asking a lot of questions. They don't take something that is given to them and say, Achha, theke, ye ho Chalta hai. Nahi. They tend to be inquisitive and they tend to be self-confident. And that I would say we have seen the biggest uh, difference and they tend to question things if they don't uh, like it. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to add on to you know, the question, what you said about you know, how do you responsibly recycle plastic. So uh, there is an 8B bus stop in Jadapur. Yeah. And over there, uh, recently, what they are doing is, uh, there is an organization 
which is giving out bags, which are the right micron thing, and discouraging all the vendors over there Correct. from selling out in plastic. So that's how you actually create awareness in different places. Right. So children and others know that, look, plastic is bad. Yeah, you can recycle it by, you know, correct, into tar and all Absolutely, that. Absolutely, absolutely. Just wanted to add this, thank you. Yep, so we have our, our students here. So that is uh, Palash, uh, who is in grade eight, and who joined us about two years ago. And this is Kashvi. Uh, she has been with us since inception, so now I would say six or seven years. Um, and each one will bring a perspective. So I would like, uh, Kashvi, I will start with you. And you can share your experience of learning at DLRC and about how do we partner with nature. So share your thoughts uh, in a minute. I think that'll be great. I think one of the earliest memories I have of collaborating with nature um, with DLRC is when we made um, Ganpatis with shadow mitti uh, on our campus, and we used paints made from leaves and flowers to co color our Ganpatis to make them beautiful. And uh, that just, it just really interested me because I saw people crushing leaves and flowers, and slowly the juices were coming out, and they were adding. Um, thickeners to it to make it stick to the shadow mitti. And in the end, the Ganpati's, Ganpati Murtis had turned out very beautiful. So that is the first thing that comes to my mind when I think of partnership with nature in DLRC. Otherwise, there's just the trees, the trees that are in the classroom, they have just, they're like other students in the class. You just, you can lean against them, you can um, put water to them when they look dry, and it just creates a more uh, homely environment. You just feel closer to nature when the trees are in the classroom. And uh, having them around has just been a lot of fun. During the rainy season, sometimes water trickles down the trees and it falls, it kind of um, gathers in the uh, kind of the. Uh, barrier that we have around the trees. And uh, that's a lot of fun. Sometimes water comes into the class, so it's a bit of a mess, but we clean it up. So having nature in DLRC is very adventurous and interesting. Great, thanks Kashvi. And I, and I have to say, uh, many people come to our campus, parents, and they ask, Barish mein kya hota hai? Because there are no walls, right? It's all open. We say, look, if it is rains, our classes continue. If it is heavy rain, Classes are outside, kids are playing. So they just go in the rain, they play in the mud, they get dirty. So we tell parents that during rainy season, send a spare pair, uh, pair of clothes. They will get wet, they will take a shower, and they'll be, they'll be muddy. And they enjoy it, right? Um, Palash, you have joined us uh, about a year or two ago. Uh, can you share your experience of being on the campus? Yes, hi. Uh, so, one of the things I like about the campus is that in the winters it was all fine and then uh, in March it started getting hot uh, and it was so hot on the roads and everywhere I went. But on campus it felt so cool and the wind, the trees, it was all very nice. And uh, there's a lot of open space, so you don't feel clustered like in a normal classroom. You have to sit in a particular space in a particular way, study a particular thing on a particular day. But here you can do what you want and basically you aren't restricted by non-natural stuff. Yep. Okay. Uh, Kashmi, uh, anything else you want to add or Palash, uh, just a minute? Well, another thing that I love about having nature in DLRC is uh, the, the silence, the quiet, and the sounds of nature that you can hear after people have left campus, when it's just the facilitators and they're doing their work. If you're on campus, you can hear the birds chirping, and you can hear the trees rustling, it's, and you can see the sunset, you can see the sky. Honestly, the campus is just beautiful, and because it's a little away from the main crowded cities, it's truly magical. Okay. Even at night, you can see the stars in the sky. Okay, great. Go ahead. 
Anything critical that you can think of that yeah. uh, you, you can take this opportunity um, to maybe think about what, what could be different, what you would maybe do different if you were in charge? Yeah, go ahead, Kashmir. So when the bio toilets were first um, introduced to us, a lot of us were against them because we weren't uh, initially comfortable with the idea of not having water or flush. It just was something completely unknown. But eventually, things got better. We have, people have gotten used to it, and many like the idea. And uh, weather can sometimes be a problem, such as rain. Sometimes they do dis it does di disrupt the class. It can get a little hot. But um, it, it's just how it is. You deal with it. And the campus, uh, the facilitators have done everything to make our lessons as um, productive as possible. So if it does get hot, we do take breaks to drink water and then continue our lessons. If it is rainy, we again take breaks. Maybe we go out for some time. Or if we're in a science lesson, we uh, explore things that are outside in the nature. So. It's, it has its ups and downs, but it's amazing. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very um, much, Ajay. Any, any other questions yeah. you have? So I would say that, that one of the things of this structure is also that every three years, we need to redo the roof because the roof is covered with pachat. I don't know how many of you know, pachat is basically the waste that comes from the sugar cane. So when they harvest the sugar cane, the dry leaves fall apart, fall down. So we take those and we put it on the roof. So every two years or three years, we need to replace it. So that way we also generate employment locally. And so it is a natural structure. It needs to be rebuilt every so often. It generates employment and it helps the economy all in all. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kashvi. Thank you, Palash. Thanks for joining. Really appreciate. Thank you for having us. Yes. Thank you. Karur kono prashno thakle apna ra korte paren. Kisi ko agar kuch poochna ho to aap beje jab pooch sakte hain. We we are here. We can translate. So if any of you have any questions irrespective of the language you speak in, please go ahead and ask. Come on, students. <laughs> No questions then, we'll move on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ajay. It was fabulous and believe you me, when he says that there was no smell, there is no smell in these toilets, when he showed me, I was standing there and he saying, this is toilet. I said, where? He said, this is toilet. I said, where? He said, this is toilet, just open and see. I couldn't believe. There is no smell and it's, it's really outstanding. So moving on to the world of fantasy for me, uh, right now what Ajay showed, because living in cities, I don't know how we will uh, engage with this kind of living and how much time it will take for us. So we are moving on to our next session. Um, we would like to now invite uh, Akshita, who is uh, from Mayur Bhanj, uh, family and Akshita is a director of the 200 year old Belgaria Palace in Mayurbhanj and along with her family she is working to build sustainable tourism with social impact at its core in the tribal dominated region. At present Akshita is a communication strategist at the Vadwani Institute of Artificial Intelligence, an independent not for profit research institute and global hub developing AI solutions for social good. Akshita is on the advisory board for the Center for Historic Houses, an organization formed within the Architecture School of OP Jindal, which aims to celebrate heritage and restoration by shining a light on contemporary patronage of these historic landmarks. Akshita, I will now hand over to you. Are you there uh, to introduce the rest of the panel panelists? Yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, can we have some cheers for the panelists here together? Because, please, are you? Is it okay? 
Hi, hello everyone. Thank you so much for taking our time today to be with us and be part of this panel. Um, I think I've been, I've been introduced also while they have all the technical setups taking place. But I'd like to start off by introducing myself once again. My name is Akshita Bhanjdeo. I come from a tribal dominated district in the eastern state of Orissa called Mayurbhanj. I've grown up between Orissa and Bengal, so of course my love for everything old and decaying, or as we like to call it, vintage and restorative architecture. Um, but the reason why I had this panel today called Sustainability in the Arts, Reflections from Princely India, is because I, because I believe that the arts and the artists have always been a reflection of the times we live in. Whether it's from the Black Lives Matter movement or political movements closer home during the past few years, cultural changes have really showed us um, and influenced political and social conversation and dialogue, and it's the best way to start. Um, very recently, my hometown of Mayurbhanj was affected by forest fires. The Risa state government had the highest number of forest fires in India. And when the forest fires were taking place and two-thirds of the Simlipal Elephant and Tiger Reserve and UNESCO Biosphere was up in flames, the government cracked down through a lot of um, security measures and through educational awareness programs to try to explain to people what was the problem with setting fires and what was the problem with not doing anything when our biodiversity is burning but what had the most effective change. I come from a district with over 30 different kinds of tribal groups, and um, the median age would be between 18 to 25. And the biggest change actually came from Nukkar Nataks and street plays and art and conversation using the lens of any kind of artistry means to actually explain to people the symbiosis between us and nature. So I'd like to start. Uh, we actually had a few, I was really trying to hit all panelists from the north, south, east, and west of South Asia. But I'll start with our keynote speaker for today, who is Dr. Jyotsna Singh. She's the director of the Amar Mahal Museum, as well as the founder of the da Dara Shiko Fellowship from Jammu and Kashmir. So if you could please play her keynote address before I introduce the rest of the panelists. Before we begin, and while I stall, while we have some technical difficulties, I'd like to explain the breakdown of the panel. We have people who are art curators and hosts of residencies, as well as directors of forts, museums, and palaces that have some of the oldest artwork uh, and the most well-restored. Ready? Apart from that, we have a lot of budding cultural patrons as well. And while we go through conversations with the panelists, we're hoping towards the end to open this up to the audience and take some questions then and get all the seven panelists onto our screens and meet us live. I think we have a presentation, a keynote address from Dr. Yeah. Like Dr. Gurudas mentioned at the beginning, we cannot rely on technology. So really sorry, but there's been a little bit of a technical glitch as soon as that is sorted. Krishna, yeah. Yeah. Now and I'm delighted Thank to you. be here in this edition of the Vasudeva Kutumbakam. Thank you so much, Akshita, for inviting me to this particular session where people from different uh, erstwhile world families have come together on this panel to talk about how they have had an engagement with craftspeople and the experiences and the challenges that they face in the sustainability of these kinds of traditional crafts as well as contemporization of these crafts and arts. I've been very lucky and I have worked as a director of the Amar Mahal Museum and Library in Jammu. And it has enabled me to meet with different artists from the region. We are at present working with a master painter called Sohan Viloria from Basoli, which is one of the hill regions of Jammu and which had a very advanced uh, sort of genre of Pahari painting. 
it is uh, somewhat different to the Kangra school of art, which is a better known school, uh, where the colors are very vibrant and the features are also sort of exaggerated and quite sort of vibrant. So it had almost died out and would have gone out with this one gentleman. Uh, but we were able to, through the museum, work with him to engage three young artists who are now in their second year of working with him, and we support what is called the Guru Shisha Parampara. So I feel really that to be able to sustain something like a traditional art form, one has to be able to work with people who are within that particular region and have a stake in being in that area. To bring them into an urban situation where the where it is very hard for them to live and sustain and uh, create spaces to work, I think is not quite the answer. So in Basoli itself, he has a wonderful uh, atelier and he works with three young people and we hope to be able to showcase their work in other regions of, of India soon. My other engagement has been with something that we started in the Valley of Kashmir uh, several years ago. Um, and it was called the Dara Shiko Center for the Arts. And for obvious reasons, because Dara Shiko was both a patron of the arts as well as stood for a very syncretic worldview where people of different religions and people from different traditions could come together and share their experiences and learn from each other. And that is what we did. We tried to create a free atmosphere uh, where people would come, young people from schools, colleges would come and uh, do workshops in the different arts. Arts. We had a seminar um, uh, segment where we discussed um, environmental issues, uh, we discussed educational reforms, uh, we also talked about different uh, sacred traditions, and we also had a performance element. And I think that's a very beautiful combination of trying to put together something for everyone. So I found that to be a very successful model, and uh, it is something that I would be happy to share uh, you know, about, we also have a small YouTube, um, uh, you know, on the Dara Shiko work that we have done, and uh, I would invite you all to have a look at it. Uh, I am very grateful again, as I said, to be invited to come here, and would be happy to engage with any one of the panelists, and uh, thank you again, Akshita. Thanks for inviting me. Good afternoon. My name is Jutsna Singh, and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for sharing that. Um, that was Dr. Jotsna saying, like I mentioned, if you all you know, uh, were able to catch over some of the noise that she was talking about, it's really beautiful that um, there have been families that have been custodians of art and culture, and there's been a way of looking at patronage throughout the years, from the colonial times before them to the medieval times in India. Um, I'd like to also now call upon Virangana Komari Solanki and have her video present. Uh, she is an independent curator and writer and worked across many different platforms, including organizing the Kathmandu Biennale. So I'm hoping to hear from people who've not just been artists themselves or hosted residencies, but also curated um, artist exhibitions that have, we've seen, you know, having a renaissance all over the world. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Akshita and the Calcutta Centre for Creativity for inviting me to speak on the Sistine Panel on Sustainability in the Arts. Uh, from the brief that you shared with me, Akshita, I'd like to focus on the aspect of sustainability in a contemporary context in relation to a couple of projects and platforms that I've been working with while also keeping in mind community. While patronage and support has changed its meaning over the years, it's also a question of where do we place ourselves today when it comes to looking at growing artist communities with not enough spaces or not enough platforms out there to present their work. In this context, I'll begin with speaking about Art Chain India, uh, which is an initiative that was co-founded by artists Aisha Singh and Purvai Rai at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020. Uh, when Aisha and Purvai founded um, Art in India, it was with the intention of creating this democratic platform where any artist could sell their work for under uh, 10,000 rupees. And we pledged that um, they would put back 
10,000 into the system as they had earned 50,000. So a lot of onus and trust was put back onto the artists and it also garnered a huge response, not just from artists, but also from younger collectors, from people who wanted to um, look at the arts as something more accessible, but also reached out to a lot of young artists who got new opportunities. And um, this was just by putting works out with the ACI hashtag. But it was also where artists are writing back with basic questions on packing, invoicing, contracts, feedback for their works. And um, this is where Radha Mahindra joined and started the review chain. Um, so while Aisha and the rest of the ACI team was creating content that would be useful for the artists, um, the review team also helped artists get feedback for their works. Uh, I came in at a slightly later stage with Faramula when we started looking at the art chain legal arm of um, Art Chain India. And uh, we worked with a couple of lawyers to begin putting legal rights out there for artists to understand what contracts were, for what their basic rights were, uh, which very often they're not aware of. Uh, so something that grew quite organically based on feedback and requests from artist communities has now slowly started taking shape. Uh, today, our team has comprised of a small team with Aisha, Radha, and myself working on support resources to expand our team their scope and outreach. And uh, Sita Ram, Lala Bhengini, and Tanvi Kapoor handle the website and the content creation. I won't go into the details of this in the interest of time. But in case you're interested in more about it, we have details up on artgeneindia.com. The reason I also brought in Art in India is to showcase an example of how we need to rely on self-sustainability and perhaps create more networks and platforms that encourage these independent practices. In this context, um, it's also collaborations have become very important to support or sustain these platforms and communities. For instance, for the second review chain, which we had last year through Art Chain India, we reached out to funders to support a small honorarium that we could offer the reviewers, the speakers, and workshop facilitators. So while the applications are selected on a first-come basis, we were also keen to set aside a small honorarium for each reviewer and speaker uh, for the time that they set aside very generously to share their knowledge and experience. So this budget was supported uh, through Space Studio, which is a not-for-profit organization in Baroda, where I also work as the curator and program director. And being a not-for-profit space, we focus on disseminating the early budget we have to support four cycles of artist residencies, an annual artist grant, which also started during the pandemic, um, exhibitions, workshops, both online and on site, and also fun artist projects at other events, such as um, Aisha Singh's work recently at the India Art Fair in collaboration with Shrine and Fire Gallery. And we supported Dave Malia Roy Chaudhary's uh, production of photographs for the Louis Reuter Award, which will be showcased in the Photography Festival in Al in France this summer. Um, so looking at both these platforms, Art Chain India and Space Studio, the first that relies on external support and Space Studio that looks at extending support, I'd just like to conclude with an emphasis on how important collaboration and peer support is for sustainability and growing communities. As we move forward with so much uncertainty around us every day, it is these platforms that we perhaps turn to to harness care and a semblance of some certainty and support. And perhaps it is a community that we need to build that supports each other, which is also where the future form of patronage may lie. That was Virangana Solanki, who's an independent curator and writer, and spoke a lot about platforms of change, and especially how artists and the ecosystem can be a lot more collaborative to actually go into and you know not just um, be able to influence newer generations of artists, but be able to support the ones that have been there. Talking about restoration, I'd like to now get the video by, and I promise this is our last video before we have the panelists who I know you're all very excited to actually hear from. 
Uh, it's uh, Vaishnavi Kumari from Kishangar. Kishangar is, of course, famous for its miniatures, and she's been able to really be able to bring artists together to not just hone the craft and become stronger in the craft, but actually popularize the craft with more youth. So we'll have our final online speaker, which is Vaishnavi Kumari from Kishangar, please. <laughs> Vaishnavi Kumari, the founder of Studio Kishangar. The studio is an art and design workshop based in Kishangar, Rajasthan. The artists that work for us at the studio are all from in and around the city. Many of these have had this vocation in their family for generations. So the style of painting used by the artist is miniature paintings. So when they work, they work in a miniature style. It is, however, implemented in a contemporary and modern fashion. We use large dimensions, not miniature sizes. For instance, we like to use big canvases and we use acrylic as a medium. We take inspiration from paintings and pictures in our collection, as well as the architecture of the fort and the Kishangar landscape. The stylization found in the school's aesthetic and his preference for devotional themes is attributed to Raja Samad Singh and his relationship with the Kishangar artist Nihal Chand. So Kishangar became a very famous place uh, for art and culture and uh, music and uh, of course Haveli Sangeet uh, with the uh, pads written by my ancestors as late as my grandfather who also composed uh, poetry. This is the famous uh, uh, painting called The Boat of Love. And you can see the beautiful skies and the lotuses uh, uh, in the lake uh, with the garden in foreground and Krishna Radha uh, going in a boat. This is based on one of the pads of uh, Nagri Dasri. So it is a visual de depiction of uh, what poetry uh, can do and how poetry can influence. My idea for the studio is to not only preserve miniature paintings in Kishangar, but also make them accessible to people the world over. Art is all about continuation. It's a legacy that has to be continued. For us, it's a 300-year-old legacy, and I hope we can continue it for another 300 years. That was actually quite beautiful, and I hope that um, the next time we can entice KCC to have one of the forts and palaces being our next fifth venue and have you all there. I hope it took you back a little bit to where these arts and artists actually come from and the places that really get affected by climate change. Before I start introducing the panelists, I realized that I should back up and tell a little bit of history, and this is the prompt that I felt very passionate about and why I wanted to host the panel. Um, like I said, the theme was sustainability in the arts, reflections from princely India. Through ancient time till the colonial era, the royal courts remained vital to the production of art and the patronage of its diverse forms across South Asia. They were important loci for the continuation of indigenous artistic traditions, as well as conduits for European influences in both art and architecture. Art has always been a reflection of the times we live in, and the panel hopes to examine and explore the meaning of being one with nature, keeping community and climate at the center of conversation. The idea is to revisit what sustainability means in the arts today, looking back into indigenous crafts and their homogeneous existence with nature, and also the challenges of greenwashing and commercialization, while coming to a nuanced understanding of how custodians of ancient art forms are managing to carve a space for the artists and art forms, keeping the changing world we live in today in mind. 
So without further ado, I'd love to call Shelja Katoch from Lambagao, Nandini Singh Chabua, Rajeshri Gohil from Bhavnagar, and Jaydev Singh from Kota to stage, please. And finally, I get to say. We're hoping to keep this panel quite conversational and open for everyone to jump in with questions. Though for the first 20 minutes, I'll be asking each of them a question relating to their background, the work they're doing. And for the last 10 minutes, we'll be opening it up to the audience. So if you have any questions, please do save them for the last. And um, hopefully you all have a lot more interesting questions that come up through this conversation. But without further ado, Jaydev, I'd love to hear from you about the work you're doing in Kota, and especially given your background, having worked in business and investment banking with KPMG, and now to go back to Kota, working on the Kota Fort and the museum, how do you really uh, manage to bring more awareness? Also, because Kota has this tremendous history of being not just warriors and fighters with the Kota Fort, but also a space for a lot of spiritual and philosophy, philosophical activity and the arts and culture, and now Kota being from this historical city to an educational down. So how do you, how do you um, one, can you talk about the work and the art forms in Kota? Second, the work that you're doing to promote more of an awareness about what sustainability means uh, and preservation means to someone coming from such a long history such as you. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay. So first of all, um, thank you Akshita and the KCC for organizing this um, beautiful event. It's very nice to be here and um, learn from everyone else here who has lots of experience in this so we can try and come together and um, you know, talk about sustainability in the arts and learn from each other so we can really drive forward um, um, all of this. Um, yeah, so, I'll, so for now, I'll give a brief overview about the Rao Madhu Singh Museum Trust, which um, basically takes care of this structure that you see over here. So this, this is the Kota Fort, called the Kota Gard, or City Palace. And amongst the things that it does is obviously the Rao Madhu Singh Museum, which is in the white part of the, the fort, which you see towards the right side. But we also organize lots of cultural events and um, and lots of events that we can sort of tie in with, um, thank you, that we can sort of engage with the local communities and um, whether that be things like the Dashera of Kota, which is famous in North India, like Mysore in South India, or philanthropy, which um, you know, we'll sort of see later. So first, I'll touch on the, the museum itself. So Kota, of course, is famous for Kota art more than, more than anything else. Um, so at the museum, we have um, paintings on paper that we've depic depicted, but more than anything, it's full of frescoes in many, many rooms across, across the, the museum where, you know, it covers all sorts of themes. So actually, the paintings that you can see here are on paper, on cloth. So can we go back to this slide, please? Okay. Yeah, so on, on, this, on this theme, Kota is really famous for hunting. It's what it's known for, where you know, animals are depicted with, whether for the carnivores it'd be the raw animal energy, or for the deer they're shown to be sort of looking and you know, afraid. Or even in that painting, I know it's a very small painting, but um, you, know, you can see the, the art of shikar also happening. So there's, peop there's spotters in the bottom right there sort of peeking out from the trees, and the ruler is depicted on the top left, and you know the, the lions are sort of there, and ev everyone else is intruding on this sort of private scene that the lions uh, are in. But more than just hunting, it's also, Kota also is known for you know, devotional themes, so Krishna Leela is one of them, but you know, any amount of depictions of Srinathji or Bhijanathji, who are also uh, forms of Lord Krishna, and also, you know, various. Thank you. Various darbars also. So, the one on the left, for example, is 
potentially you know the largest miniature painting in the world it's four and a half by two and a half meters and it's it's like in a scroll form and it depicts uh, Maharao Ram Singh's visit to Delhi to the Red Fort and it's full of so many details um, you know you see just the sheer amount of detail it, it doesn't do it justice when you see it on a screen um, every little piece of it is telling a story of its own and to see it in person you can really spend hours when you look at all these different types of paintings, not just on paper or cloth, but also, like I said, on the, on the frescoes. So these are some of the pictures of um, the actual rooms there, but I couldn't obviously fit in everything else, everything that's there in the museum. All of these pictures here are from separate rooms, and these rooms are all full of art, you know, on all, all sides of the walls. So especially for those that have a, an inclination towards this, you can really spend, you know, an endless amount of time going through each detail and trying to see what story the artists were telling. So in addition to art, what, what we also do at the, at the Rao Madhu Singh Museum Trust is organize events, like I said. And the Shera is something that Kota is really known for. And even the people in Kota really join in to that festivity. Um, so the way it starts is we have, um, you know, pujas and things that we sort of do in the morning. And then in the evening, there's this formal Dari Khana event that's at the fort again. And everyone attends in formal attire. They're wearing, most of them are wearing Kota headgear. So it's called the Kota Pag. As you know, you know, most regions have their own form of headgear, but many of them have now died out. But um, you know, my grandfather was a great believer and very passionate about um, these forms of headgear. So he encouraged a lot of people from Kota to wear the Kota Pag, because in the old days, you could sort of make out where someone was from, just from their headgear, which is a really beautiful thing. And it's nice to see that Kota still has that. So at these events, most people actually do wear the Kota Pag. So that's what you see here. So after this event, um, there's a procession that which you can see here, which proceeds to the Dashera Maidan. So this procession starts from the fort and goes to this large field where you know, people are waiting um, to see the Ravan burn, the Ravan Dehen, because of course on Dashera that's what, that's what you do. So here's a picture on, on the top right. So the Ravan is like a massive 70, 80 foot Ravan and there's endless amounts of people and everyone's there with great festivity. There's, there's a Mela going on, so kids are happy and everyone's there for the spectacle of this massive uh, thing that goes up in flames. So that's about Dashera. And again, what we also do is try and, um, you know, as, as a museum and as um, custodians of all of this heritage and history, we want people from Kota, starting with the young people, people in schools, to be passionate and, you know, for starters to be aware about all of this. So we organize this annual quiz, which um, we get people from all over the region, from not just Kota, but we try and get people from Bundi and Jhalawar. So these three things together make what we call the region of Hadoti. So that's why whenever you see someone with the last name Hada, they're probably from one of these areas, um, which comes from the region's name. And um, yeah, so we organize this um, about every year. We haven't done this since COVID for a few years, but we hope to get back to it soon. And this really encourages children to learn and be proud of where they're from. You know, when they, Kota, of course, as you all know, is famous for its IITs and engineering and all of that, but a lot of these people don't really know all the other things that Kota is known for. And if people from Kota don't know about it, you can't really expect everyone else to. So this is an initiative we started to sort of get people to be proud of Haruti heritage, hence, hence the name. And what we also do is a music program. So we used to do that. We we do this on my grandfather's birthday, where we call um, an Indian classical artist, and then people who are fond of Indian classical music are called to come and see um, whoever wants to be there. So this is something again that we do at the fort, and um, yeah. And so again, now tying with the ph philanthropy side of things, we do a blood camp. This we usually do on my father, Mahara Ma Ijirad Singh's birthday every year. 
So we do, we tie, tie up with local hospitals and blood banks to try and engage with the community that way. And you know, um, also do this at the fort. So that, that was a quick overview. Um, you know, there's a lot to cover and a lot of, um, especially about art and all of that is very difficult to get through this quickly. But um, yeah, I mean, I hope, I hope this is a good sampler for everyone so they find out more about and learn about Kota and Kota art and everything that we do. And um, we'd love to have you visit us there to see, and see, see all of this in person. So that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jaydev. You're such a great ambassador to your place. And most of us, this is the closest we've seen to a travel light near your map for us in two years. Um, <laughs> But um, there were so many things that you mentioned there. You know, one that's so beautiful to be able to be inspired and wake up in a place such as that every day. Um, I think a lot of us in Calcutta would agree. Growing up in Bengal, we've had the opportunity to see this kind of architecture up close. Um, not always had the language or the awareness, of understanding the vocabulary and what goes into actually preserving it and maintaining it. So it's really great. And something that I picked up was that you have such a passion and understand the intangible cultural heritage of your community. Because so many of us in South Asia, the way we actually learn about ourselves and our ancestors and our history is through storytelling. And it is through art, whether that's through tattooing or the clothes we wear. Um, it's really interesting because all of us are dressed in saris, but our drape, our colors, maybe why we chose them, relate back to our family's history and stories. And so art isn't always something that's um, tangible. It's actually intangible because it tells the stories of hadutis or culture or regions that sort of transgress what you can put on, a, on an Aadhaar card. Uh, <laughs> but moving on and talking about education and awareness, which I think you're doing so beautifully, being able to merge not just um, making people aware, but engaging them, because how else will a generation evolve? And I think um, you've touched on sustainability a little bit even more indirectly, because you're raising so much awareness and being able to galvanize people. Um, and whether it's the use of the paints or the way you're doing restoration, there is a sense of preservation, uh, keeping the community in mind and keeping the, the, the surroundings in mind. Uh, moving on, I'd love to call on uh, who I'm someone I'm very lucky to call my sister and have in my family, um, Shel Jakutoch from Lumbagrao. And I think that, um, Jija, you've spoken so much about, one, being an educationist, uh, because you grew up in a place where you thought your son could have a better education, so formed a school. And that's just taking super moms to the next level. But also because you understood the importance of having an education um, for your son of a certain level, having him exposed to a certain level of um, curriculum and pedagogy. But also, you are the director of the Kangra Group, which has a number of hospitality initiatives, and also the museum and Kangra Fort, which I recently learned is one of the oldest forts in the world, oldest built forts. It's dated. Um, and for many of us who are buffs, and I'm sure a lot of us here are, if you remember King Alexander the Great fought with a certain king called Porus, and that's what was sort of the, I can see nodding heads, so I know there are other like-minded history nerds here. Um, and King Porus, while I was reading about Shel Jajija's family, was actually a, a Katoch warrior. So he was called Paramchand. Paramchand. Param technically, Param your ancestor, if I'm not Greeks wrong. The Greeks called him Porus or Fagus. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay, <laughs> wow. So when we're talking about custodianship here, this is not just something that um, came under the colonial era, but really this is reconciling what happened much before that and sort of what are parts of it that you want to take away and sort of make better for the next generation. So could you speak to us about how, how you think institutions can play a role in having more people aware of what's happening with climate change? Or how do you come across sustainability in the work that you're doing um, with Kangra Miniatures? Uh, when I got married in Kangra, uh, I was shocked that the descendants of the Kangra Miniature artists were uh, in a very bad state. They were planning to give up their work. They were uh, they were highly disillusioned. And uh, that is when uh, uh, we decided to open a museum, but we also opened an art gallery there. And we started promoting the artists to put up their artwork there. And we started holding workshops we, through tourism. So we, uh, because we're in the hospitality line, we, we started talking to, uh, you know, and we got a lot of uh, encouragement from the um, uh, 
uh, hotel guests and uh, from the tourists that were coming in, they wanted to learn the art. They wanted to learn the art of Kangra miniatures. And um, uh, th that is how we started doing it. And then, of course, uh, Himachal is a highly educated uh, state. So we started encouraging young students, young college students to come in and uh, uh, learn the art of Kangra miniatures. And also then, as I travel, uh, for exhibitions, for um, uh, to have talks, I carry a lot of Kangra miniatures with me, so that uh, people are made to made aware of the whole art. Now, Kangra miniatures, uh, they are as superior to Mughal miniatures. Mo uh, when Aurangzeb was. He, he was in a very different state of mind where he didn't want to promote art and culture because he was so disillusioned with Shah Jahan and uh, Jahangir, how he, he felt it was a waste. So he started uh, uh, cutting the arms of the, uh, the, the fingers and the arms of the artists because he wanted art to finish. That is when they were provided uh, uh, the asylum in the Kangra Hills. And that is when the Pahadi, uh, during the 17th to the 19th century, the, uh, uh, you know, the Kangra uh, art developed. The Kangra art developed under Maharaja Sansarchand. And uh, temples were built with Kangra miniature art. Uh, forts were built with, built with Kangra miniature art. And uh, so when I, I, I'm from Madhya Pradesh, so when I came into the hills, I was most amazed by the fineness, the beauty, very pleasing to the eye. Uh, the themes were all uh, the beautiful Doladhar Mountains or the streams of Kangra, the, um, uh, y y you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the theme was mostly Radha Krishna or it was uh, uh, the r rulers, uh, portraits were not so popular, but, you know, it, it was very pleasing to the eye. The colors were very pleasing to the eye. They were using fab, uh, they were using, uh, 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 you know, uh, minerals, they were using uh, silver, gold, they were using all natural things. Even now they use all these natural uh, dyes to, uh, 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 you know, to paint uh, the Kangra miniatures. And so when we have workshops in the museum, we teach the uh, uh, people, the tourists who come to learn the art from making the dyes, we, we teach them the fabrics on which the Kangra miniature paintings are done from. We teach them everything. And as a result, uh, I, I now, if you come to Dharamshala and if you come to Kangra, all the government offices have these miniature paintings all over. It has picked up. The whole thing is picked up. The government is now promoting Kangra miniatures. Uh, if you drive through the uh, streets of uh, Dharamshala and Kangra, you will see on the walls uh, Kangra miniatures. And I feel very proud that after 25 years of marriage, you know, we, my husband and I, we have made some impact to the history, to the culture, to uh, and to revive a dying art. Uh, also through um, food, when I got married uh, in Kangra, and I'm a vegetarian, and uh, when I saw some of the miniature paintings with uh, uh, the, the dham, there, there we call it dham. In Himachal, there is no rich man, no poor man. Everybody sits together and eats the dham in the temple, cooked by the pundits. And I saw the Kangra miniatures and I said, what is this? I asked my husband. And uh, it was beautifully depicted in the Kangra miniatures, you know, how uh, the people were sitting together, the king, the pauper, everyone, and they were having a meal together. So even through food, to, uh, you know, I, I try to promote art and sustain it as much as we can because after all, at the end of the day, we are the custodians of uh, the heritage and culture we are born into. I mean, democracy has taken over, but if we don't take interest as, uh, uh, you know, as descendants of these erstwhile families, I think it will be our heritage, our culture, our art. I mean, all the young people here, they are taking interest, it makes me very proud of them. And uh, I, my son, he, he, he does take interest, but um, he, uh, I, mean, I mean, you know, but when I see the three of them sitting here, I see Akshita sitting here, uh, it, it, it is nice that the younger generation are finding uh, pride in promoting art and culture. Thank you, thank you so much. 
Um, something you mentioned was, um, you know, you touched upon a few topics, but one thing I thought was interesting was we never discussed the indirect effects of what's happening with climate change. I'm trying to not use the word sustainability because I'm aware of its greenwashing, but um, something that I'd like to bring up is, you know, because of climate change, we've also seen a lot of artists uh, migrate. So as the, as the weather is changing, we've also seen people move and migrate, and, you know, climate change is... Um, affecting uh, marginalized groups, groups that have already been in the fringes where art is either inaccessible or not something that economically always makes sense for livelihoods. So I think being a patron of an arts where you're not just having residencies to teach people, but also giving them livelihoods by combining arts with entrepreneurship and understanding the use of how technology could po probably speed up that level of entrepreneurship is something I think quite remarkable and happening in South Asia now on a much grander scale. I think even recently staying state governments and um, you know, instead of this idea of, especially now, trying to move past the post-colonial hangover and go back to our roots and being able to be extremely rooted and local with a contemporary appeal is something that I think that, especially even looking at startup India, going into um, you know, funding artists and art organizations is a great way to look at sustainability in terms of, does it make sense for someone to still be an artist in Kangra doing miniature? Because where is the demand, where is the supply, and how are they also being able to do different occupations that may um, you know, not have been possible because 100 years ago, maybe they could have only been an artist. But now we see so many artists and families having to understand how to also make a living from this. Um, thank you so much for your words. And moving on, um, I'd love to speak to Brijeshwari, who's the vice president and curator at Princeps, and herself uh, runs m many, many uh, different institutions and organizations. One that I'm really fond of is the Bhavnagar um, Heritage, um, an organization because I was, so, I was so amazed by the fact that you were waking up and taking heritage tours within your city, because like we've mentioned before, if you don't feel pride um, in your heritage, in your culture and the arts, and are able to speak about it in a way that's, that's um, sector agnostic, that reaches different diverse groups, uh, and really bring people in, it's not gonna really survive if it's kept exclusive to a certain community. So I'd love to hear from you about the work you're doing in Bhavnagar, and also how you're seeing uh, the changing world through sustainability in NFTs and technology. And ha yeah, you can sit if you want to do you want stand. I think I'll stand. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, a very good afternoon to everyone. And uh, I hope you all are enjoying your uh, time here, as I am. Um, so firstly, I would like to uh, start by saying that for me, uh, sustainability, I don't know, I, I mean, I don't want to categorize this word because um, sustainability has been something that has always prevailed in India, if we look at it. So what does it mean to be sustainable in the arts? Um, Indian artisans, be it in any part of where all of us are coming from, have always practiced arts with a focus on nature. So they've always derived their pigments or their uh, paper, their material, whatever they're using. And that's because man has always had a godlike relationship with nature. So we have worshipped um, the trees, we have worshipped the area where we live in. And I think that's something that has trickled into the arts as well. Um, for me, I'll sort of just go over my journey with uh, sustainability in the arts and just say that for me it's been a bit of uh, not so much uh, lineage but more of nature and nurture that's come into place because um, nurture, given that um, it was a lot of influence by my mother in growing up and um, nature because I think I'm generally more creative. So uh, after studying archaeology and art history and heritage conservation, I started working at the Piramal Art Foundation and uh, worked more on modern Indian art. Um, as my frequent trips to Bhavnagar, where I'm from, continued, I realized that there was a lot of artisanal work that we were sidetracking um, in the quest of sort of trying to get more money with modern Indian art. So after much convincing with the Piramal Art Foundation, we decided to go on this journey for one year where I traveled to different parts of India looking at nature and culture and where they meet. So um, this is one of the art forms which we looked into, which is Cheryal painting from Terangana, another dying form. Um, 
right from the base, the mask that they use, to the paints that they use, everything is sourced from their environment. So what you're seeing as the mask base is all made from Imli Tamarin pulp, and that's something that's grown locally there. The pigments are all derived from flowers and herbs that they source themselves. The artists then use these cherial paintings or patachitras and the masks to go to different villages and enact stories which connect the villages and the communities more to their, to their it's folklore basically, to their surroundings. Similarly, here we have Rogan painting at the top, which is um, from Gujarat, from Kutch, and again, they use castor oil as the base and uh, local dyes, and they create these beautiful um, sort of uh, works on cloth, which are then uh, mirrored onto the other side. So if you see the Tree of Life painting, it's actually the same uh, design, it's a reflection. Here we can, uh, it's a classic. We should do it for 435, that we'll confirm. Here it's a classic yeah, example of saving on pigments that. and paints, because you're sort of mimicking that design by utilizing the residue. Similarly, um, in the below painting, so this is a shot from the exhibition that we had titled Nature to Culture. And uh, here we have the ply split braiding, which is a technique uh, in Jaisalmer, Rajasthan. And we traveled to this uh, village um, about 20 kilometers from Jaisalmer and met this man who's the last person to practice this braid. They used to put these on uh, camels, if you may have noticed in old pictures. And now you see a very, the black one in the center is actually something that's not, that's made with not a lot of effort. And that's something that you see now on trucks and uh, motor vehicles. So an uh, NID professor went there, stayed there for over five, six years, and learned this art of ply split braiding, and now does it on bags and different cups. So again, all the material is sourced from um, animals and local communities, and no, no one is really practicing this craft now. So this is another um, sort of photograph of what we worked on. So this brings me to Bhavnagar Heritage. So after working at Piramal, when I moved back to Bhavnagar, I sort of realized that there was a lot of potential in my city itself, and tried to devise ways in which I could create a sustainable model. One of them was uh, through heritage walks. So whenever we go to a city, um, we tend to use vehicles to go to different places. And a lot of the times, you don't tend to remember the actual routes that you took, but only those particular places. So if you go to Agra, I don't think you remember the route to the Taj Mahal. You just remember seeing the Taj Mahal, which leads in you not appreciating the rest of the surroundings, which you actually missed out on the way. So heritage walks were a great way to do that. Also energy efficient because we're all walking and very healthy if you're living and eating a Gujarati diet. <laughs> so this was um, one of the things that I started off with. We started off with two people walking with me every Sunday morning and now we're about 60 to 70 people on a regular Sunday. Um, and artisanal products. So this is actually one of the many great collaborations that Akshata has uh, sort of uh, brought me into, which was Karkhana Chronicles. Um, and here, if we look at, these are some of, it's an amalgamation of the different crafts of Bhavnagar. So if we look at the brass and the copper work um, on the side, now we look at how sustainable it is to drink from copper vessels. But this is something that has been happening back in the day in all our different communities and lands. So, um, I'll, so this is something that we now do, which, I don't know why it's not, yeah. This is something which we now do. So the design of the copper bottles is inspired by the architecture of Bhavnagar, and the bottles are something more user-friendly today and, of course, sustainable. Going back to this, Bandhani, again, is uh, a very common uh, sort of craft in um, Gujarat. Different parts of Gujarat have different types of Bandhani that they do. And for us, the interesting part is all the seeds that they use in the creation of the sort of circular uh, designs in the bandhani are all utilized again. So yet another form of sustainability. The Bharat Kam that you see at the skirt is all uh, handmade work. So again, zero energy efficiency. What we try to do is we try to modernize this uh, design by uh, tying up with a designer in Bombay and creating this gown. 
little did we know that it was something that would pick up. So here, all the material that's used, it's sari material, it's all scrap. So basically, whatever material gets left over when, um, peop uh, when the bandhani artisans are creating the, uh, the bandhani designs, that's what we ended up utilizing for the dress. So these are just some of the heritage walks that we've conducted. This is actually a very interesting project uh, that we're working on currently. So a small little village in Bhavnagar district called Mahua, where I don't know how many of y'all are familiar with Murari Bapu is from. So Mahua is known for wooden toys, and as um, Akshita actually mentioned, increase in commercialization. As um, that sort of came in, and uh, plastic toys and now electronic uh, replaced wooden toys, the Mahua artisans uh, started to look for sort of greener pastures. And uh, we tied up with an architect as well as five artisans, and we're working on something where we're making play blocks, so they're essentially toys, but um, from heritage site, uh, inspired by heritage sites of Bhavnagar. So if you see on the top, it's a clock tower, which is part of the city center, and the rather gigantic child there, but um, that entire building block is something that will be made by the Mahua artisans themselves. So we're using five different heritage sites for this and trying to encourage artisans, but as well as uh, encourage local materials and not plastic, of course, so yeah. Um, that goes, I go towards the end of um, my conversation with sustainability in Bhavnagar. When, um, so Princeps is an art auction house in Bombay where I recently started uh, working, and it's one of the projects that I'm working on right now is NFTs, which is non-fungible tokens. So here we look at how technology and sustainability also align, and I think that's something that we have been discussing prior as well. So um, NFTs are created in a not very energy efficient manner, which is known as the proof of work manner. We are now trying to move into proof of stake, which is energy efficient, and only then create uh, the NFTs. The benefit is that it reduces print of paper, so less paper wastage, as well as legality and ownership of art. So I think that all sort of comes into the sustainability model. And yeah, thank you. And I hope my presentation was enriching for all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rudeshwari. Um, I think that's something really great is all of you all have spoken, have opened up a, a tourism close to what you all are doing. So it allows access to people who are not just artists or in the art space to come and see a day-to-day -day life of someone who's you know, restoring their property or patronizing and uh, you know, having patronage to the arts or promoting it in some way. And each one of you all have brought in technology, entrepreneurship, and a new age thinking to it. Um, I know we're running out close to the Q&A session, so if I could please ask someone again, I'm really lucky to call my sister, uh, Nandani Singh Jabwa, to talk about something that I'm really passionate about, which was tribal arts and the space they have in contemporary India. Um, I feel especially close to indigenous and folk arts, there's been a sense for the longest time of um, maybe patronizing the artist or the art form, whereas now we've understood the need for design interventions, um, understanding where the artist is coming from and not ruining tradition, but actually encouraging them to stick with the tradition and still um, make sure that livelihoods are taken care of in a much larger sense uh, you know, for this global age. But we'd love to hear from you, Nandini, and take it ahead. Yes, please, please. Good evening, everybody. I'm Nandini Singh Jabwa. I'm from Madhya Pradesh. My um, hobby to start or harness tribal art and collect tribal art started 10 years ago as I returned from the States. Um, it has been extremely overwhelming to work with my artists back home. Thank you so much. So what may have started a social venture progressed to becoming a fashion statement and now is finally recognized as sustainable art and craft. With the awareness created by all media, it has come to stay. Post-modernization of our society, we have an innate need to go back to our origin because where we come from is what we are today. 
Sustainability and elevating self-consciousness to make our world a better place has led us to rudimentary habit where we once lived. Folk art depicts an environment of fresh flora and fauna, and that is why folk, gone art, is not only indigenous, but also resonates with contemporary because this is the habitat we're once again searching for. That one of forestation and eco-balance system. I'm very pleased to learn that 15% of our forest, 15% uh, of our land has been reclaimed for forest again. Folk art is completely synonymous to its healthy habitat. They express their festivities and occasions with forms and symbol. Recently, Mr. Sham Wenkert. Sorry. So recently, Michelle, uh, sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> So recently, Mr. Sham Wenkert, he's a popular Gond artist, in his series expressed the subject Saving Our Planet that unveiled on Earth Day, where he expresses his thoughts in his Gond art. So as the myth goes, the origin of this world started with crab pulling sand out underneath the sea, a Gond artist's favorite subject. The knowledge of earth, wind, and fire is best known to these forest dwellers. Here we see a very popular Gond artist, Jangar Singh Sham. So he was particularly famous in bringing uh, Gond from mud walls to paper and canvas. There are many forms of native art across India. So you hear, here you see the, I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on with this. Oh, okay. So here you see the other forms of indigenous art. You have the Pithura art from Gujarat and Madhya Pradesh, the Bega art from MP. So this has recently gained a lot of momentum. Bega Art from MP is um, also a national awardee artist called Jodhaya Bai. She's 80 years old, a uh, women empowered artist whose uh, work has actually acclaimed a lot of international, uh, 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 in international galleries. So even like auction houses like Christie's and Sotheby's now have started recognizing folk art as serious art. So this, so this is uh, besides besides uh, being. There's a lag somewhere. Sorry. So. Okay. So this is some work that, so besides just being, so I think a lot of my artists uh, during the lockdown channelized uh, their energy into a lot of contemporary form of art, which is kitsch, cool, fun. And so this is something that we worked on and it's been, uh, it's been quite amazing. The form of colors here, the story that they depict, it's, uh, these, are, these are mostly on canvas and paper. So this is some a new art that the artists have been working on. So each piece you see is a is a unique piece and it's a story. It's a masterpiece that they. Uh, so it's a masterpiece that is unique in its own. Gond art is an ancient art form commonly done on the walls of rural India. Initially, the medium was charcoal painted on the walls within and outside their homes. The subject was traditionally animals and reptiles as it captured the natural habitat. Now, Gond painting is depicted on canvas and paper also as wall art, capturing, cap capturing the essence of growth, prosperity through tree of life, gods, animals, and reptiles. So we're also now working on, uh, my foundation is also working on empowering women Gond artists and harnessing their talent with the help of Madhya Pradesh government. I'm particularly going to start uh, a Gond school, a, a formal Gond school, which we're trying to work on a project uh, for our artists back home.
So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to, uh, Nandia, thank you so much for that. I think it's really beautiful that you spoke about, one, the materials used, which can be sustainable, to the kind of message um, you know, having actual exhibits can show. And third, actually, you know, raising awareness to the school and actually building it again back to entrepreneurships, creating livelihoods, um, and also what looks like design intervention, because you've understood a contemporary demand that might be there, and how could it be kitsch? How could it be something that's not just there as an art piece or a decorative piece, but something that speaks for the way pop culture, the art of our times, has been uh, received as well? So I'll open it up to the audience. If the uh, IT team could please make sure that any of the panelists who are still live could come on. And uh, we can pass the mic around to anyone. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, I'm uh, Major Indrajit Banerjee. And I live in Kolkata. And I've had the privilege of having the first posting in Bhuj Kach. Uh, thereafter, this was 79 to 82. And I've seen the whole of Rajasthan and Kach and everywhere, Gwalia, Bagara, 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 before I you know, quit service. So, uh, Bhavnagar and all these art forms that, you know, that you're doing now, my question would be uh, to all of you, okay, uh, has there been a major difference with all the talk about sustainability and the government and other NGOs putting in their effort in trying to, you know, promote uh, sustainable living. Has there been an impact on ground? Um, uh, I I'll let Nandini and then Rajesh uh, answer it's, that. It's, um, it's a very interesting question because the last two years, uh, during the lockdown, I was uh, in Madhya Pradesh in Indore and um, my artists actually channelized some very interesting work. But again, um, you know, single-handedly, it's very difficult to go and, uh, you know, raise awareness or um, especially for them, right? Like this is their livelihood. So each Gond artist has four Gond painters. So it, it, the whole family is involved in making one masterpiece. So it's difficult to, so that's why one of our, my project is to, uh, is to get some sort of a funding from the government, which is what uh, you were just talking about, and to be able to, uh, you know, just, uh, I think, just bring their work a little more forward, you know, nationally as well as globally. So I think a team of people that the, I, I put this to the art, uh, art and culture ministry as well, that we really need to harness this, uh, this particular uh, art from Madhya Pradesh, which I think needs more recognition than just a few of us who are helping, you know, them get it. I'll just add to that. Um, when you speak of uh, sus uh, sustainability and has it really made a difference, we sort of live in this vicious circle, I think, where the grass is always greener on the other side. So when we are living in larger cities, and we just yesterday we were passing by through Calcutta, and I was saying Cal we were discussing how Calcutta is such a clean city. Bhavnagar is a filthy city, let me tell you. I mean, every heritage work, I'm just constantly telling people to pick up their trash. So I think the issue is that when you live in a small town, you want to mimic a big city. And when you're exhausted with that big city, you want to go back to your roots. In that entire cycle, the people living in larger cities are becoming more conscious or sustainable, as we say, while smaller cities are not really understanding that logic still. So I think it's, I mean, I think we're sort of working with a double-edged sword in that sense, you know. Yeah, absolutely. But I think that's also because of job opportunities. So we had a lot of people coming back during COVID, back to Bhavnagar from Ahmedabad, Rajkot, Bombay. But I think all of them want to go back now that things have opened up, so yeah. I'll, I'll also like to um, just introduce our panelists who've joined us on Zoom. Dr. Jyoti Singh, um, Raj Kumari Vaishnami Kumari from Studio Kishangar, Virangana Kumari Solanki, who's a writer and curator. So I'm glad that you all can hear us and all of the questions we're being asked are open to you all as well. Um, the gentleman above just asked about sustainability on ground and whether you all have seen any impact being from, um, you know, whether that's Basta, Bombay, Delhi, uh, or Jammu Kashmir. So if you all would like, any of you would like to answer that and we could move on to the next question. Uh, 
Uh, that's open to any of you all, if you all would like to answer that, or we can move on to the next question. May I, uh, may I say a word, please, about please. Uh, sustainability? I think, I think the young lady really brought up something very important. Um, you know, through the Dara Shiko Foundation, we've also worked with Baul singers in Bengal. Uh, it is not just, you know, it's if you have the wherewithal, you can actually, the outreach can be anywhere in India. And we found that the Baul singers were virtually starving because there was no platform at all for them to uh, to sing anymore. Uh, the festivals uh, had, had stopped and there was no income at all. So I think it's very important even for the for people who are, who are in the intangible arts, you know, uh, to be supported because it's very, very hard for them to function in, uh, in a situation where uh, there is nobody to see them. There is nobody to, to, to appreciate their, uh, their music or their performances. So I think our attention could be drawn a little bit to that area as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. I think we'll be moving on. It's so interesting in the times of Zoom, I have to read people's faces to tell what's happening. Um, yes, sir, if your question, please. Just a quick um, comment. I uh, recently uh, was very saddened to hear the new, the passing of Karni Singh Jasul, the director of the Merengar Museum Trust in Jodhpur, um, whom I knew very well, and of course, Divya had worked with for many years. Um, conversation that we had some time ago, I'm reminded of, which was that the fort and many of your forts and ancestral forts were not simply built by an architect and a developer. They were stonemasons, they were horticulturists, there were people who were experts in water and uh, a, a whole range of ecosystem of skills that went into these uh, incredible sites. If you think about them today, they wouldn't actually be possible to make. And I think that we've lost some of that knowledge. So can anybody comment on how perhaps some of that those skills and previous uh, participant we've had at this conference, uh, Parul Zaveri, who started Abhikram, uh, where they were restoring Jasalmir and Udaipur back in the 70s with John Singh. And it seems to me that in this kind of uh, speed of modernity, we've sort of forgotten a lot of these skills. Are there any examples that you can give us where uh, perhaps some of these skills are being revived? Because once they're lost, I, I fear that they'll be gone forever. Um, just before the panelists answer that question, I'd like to say the reason we're here today is because of um, Karni Singh Jasol Ji, sir. Because uh, he actually took a chance on a small property of ours in Orissa. And being from Rajasthan as a curator, he could have chosen any crumbling palace fort Haveli in the world and chose to send his team of experts to Mayurubhanch Orissa. So we always filled with a lot of gratitude, who then introduced us to KCC. So, um, you know, for, for, the, for everyone in the panel, I would like to say a big thank you to the reason this is happening is because of Mr. Jisolji, sir, and the vision he has for including people from tribal dominated districts and their architecture to be as important for restoration as any other palace he could have chosen in the world or museum or trust. So uh, thank you for bringing him up, sir. That's a really important person I did want to mention tonight. And uh, I'd like to open that up. I think you asked the, maybe the right question to the right panel, because all of us have a lot to say about that. Um, but I'll ask all our panelists to go first, and if anyone from our online panelists would like to join in on that as well. Given the, if I answered your, if I understood your question correctly, is the uh, loss of knowledge of uh, the community who would, the ecosystem that would build a lot of these ancestral heritage landmarks in our country. Uh, <clears throat> we have, Huge sizes of huge sizes of Kangra miniatures uh, of the Kangra fort, uh, the complete architectural plan dating. Kangra fort was built in the BC, so I was quite amazed. It, it's a complete archi architectural plan, plan, and miniatures are normally small. This is a huge miniature of the Kangra, uh, from the water systems to the, uh, it looks like a proper architectural plan. I mean, if an architect had to look at it, he would say, he or she would say, it's a proper architect, and, and of the Sujanpur fort. We have it in our home, and uh, it's beautiful and uh, uh, very, very intricate. Uh, uh, it, it's amazing. My mother-in-law mother -in is Babji's sister. So we worked very closely with the Mehrangar Fort Museum. And the Kangra Fort it has been compared a number of times to Mehrangar. It's a lesser known fort, but it's been compared a number of times to Mehrangar. So uh, uh, I, th I think the hill, uh, at least in Kangra, we had architectural plans. 
uh, we did. So I, I don't know about uh, your uh, states. So architectural plans, uh, yeah, we did in Bhavnagar as well. But I think where skill development, because architecture is still something that's thriving, I would say, in today's day and age. There are a lot of architects coming into the forefront, as well as conservation architects. But when we talk about skill development, I'm not too sure, for example, how many Gond artists are from the age group of, say, 18 to 30, 35 maybe, or how many Kangra um, miniature artists are. So I think that is something that we do need to uh, really look into. There are, uh, at least in Gujarat, there is a, a very sort of thriving skill development board, um, but the focus is usually on Kutch because it's kind of become this craft community there. So in Bhavnagar, um, because I'm the convener for Intac in Bhavnagar, and we were trying to look at how many sort of artisans can we find who do embroidery work, the local embroidery work. And there were about 200 people, 200 women who we found and you know, they had the entire directory and everything. When you contact them, none of them are doing this as their profession or their occupation. It's all something that they're sitting and doing at home as a pastime. So I think to make it financially viable is a big question mark and the only time we do, once we do that, that's when more youngsters will kind of come to the forefront, so. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, um, I actually wanted to um, add to that. Yes, I think they'll just add to it and you could go, sir. Yes, um, yeah. so, so the, um, I think the question is really interesting because you spoke about uh, sustainability of material in uh, architecture of the forts and palaces. Um, so we have, uh, we restored uh, one of our forts 30 years ago and it's called Rupanur. It's 40 kilometers away from Kishinbar. And at that time what we realized that uh, in the architectural plans and the general layout of the city, there were water harvesting zones. So it was built in about 17, the early 1700s, and uh, they had uh, different um, wells, step wells, and they diverted a man-made lake towards a little, uh, a man-made river towards the lake to harvest water. And the materials used uh, for the fort itself were limestone and stones that were quarried around the city. And when we, were, when we were restoring it, uh, we couldn't find any skilled uh, artisans or labor who even, who even knew how to uh, work in, you know, the, you know, work in the stone or work in the, uh, the limestone or any sort of uh, material of, uh, of uh, the building. And that actually got us thinking that, you know, it's, you know, sustainable material has been lost uh, in the last few decades in India, I think with, and it's a two-edged sword, right? So when you have modern, you know, you have modern technology and you have, you know, things like, you know, you do have like these machines that help us, you know, build things and you have fantastic materials like, you know, marble and, you know, granite and things like that. But we also have a very, very good uh, basis and uh, reservoir of Indian materials and designs that are that exist in our buildings. And I feel uh, there are certain people who are working with it. And we are, for instance, whenever we do restore, uh, you know, our building, we have still, we've still, uh, we've trained, uh, you know, the craftspeople, the masons to now work, even the artists work for us uh, for at my art uh, atelier. They also, they, they, we do frescoes as well, so we touch up, we can uh, work on the wall art and things like that. But I feel there is a need um, on a personal, uh, on, in the private sector, as well as I think within the government, to discuss uh, indigenous materials and uh, methods and how to make them viable for people when they're building even modern homes. So besides, I think, um, working on old buildings and restoring them, I think we can also use it, I mean, especially design schools. I mean, I know there are certain projects that design schools do, but I feel that there is a need for us to discuss, you know, how to be sustainable and how we build our, um, you know, our homes and buildings and things like that. And I think it's a great way to look at historic buildings and forts to sort of, uh, you know, get an idea of how they design things which were weather, um, which were uh, ecologically conscious, which were, you know, cool in the summer, and you know, warm in the winter, and it's actually fascinating when you think about it. Um, can I just add to that? Uh, if we're looking at indigenous materials, uh, there is a um, sort of 
postgraduate diploma program. I don't know if many people here are aware at JJ College of Art in Mumbai with a collaboration with Tata Trust and Chhatrapati Shivaji Museum. And uh, the diploma is on built heritage and the only f their only focus is on conservation of architecture with indigenous material. So I think it's something that most people from at least um, families where you have these sort of um, architectural gems should take an interest in taking on. Yeah. Sorry, so we'll just take the last question. Okay. Okay, um, I think um, if there are any last words, if you all would like to say something, we've gone over time, but I think a lot of people would love to um, stay engaged. So all the panelists who are here, I just want to say a thank you so much for coming down, for being part of this, for sharing your videos, your words, your thoughts, um, and also allowing us to get connected to you all, whether that's through your fellowships, your residencies, um, and the properties you all have opened up to actually come and understand what I think are, you know, you all are living, breathing custodians of mu living museums, and for someone to come to your uh, homes and understand what it, you know, takes to be custodians, and modern day custodians is not just important and significant, but um, also really, really helpful. So thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. We hope you can be with us in Calcutta next time and that we could continue doing this in some way or the other. Um, all the panelists, at least the ones who are present, are here if you'd like to ask them questions afterwards um, or would like more information on any of the programs that they're running in their home states. Thank you so much and thank you for being here and staying with us today. In the meantime, I would like to ask the students over there because students were the special for this VK which we never engaged with before. Uh, the art forms that all the panelists spoke about here, just raise hand, were you aware of those before? You were, two. How many more were aware? So uh, there is a lot to learn beyond the school curriculum, that means, and uh, we hope that you'll keep engaging with uh, us Keep following us because there are a lot of things that one can learn and there is a lot, a very good career in arts to make. I will promote that because we, all of us here in this building are working with arts and are getting uh, good chances. Uh, while we relocate and I know some of you have to leave, we are starting the next panel. Next presenter. So thank you again to the panelists from the Princely States. We will now begin the next session. The title is In the Open, and we have the eminent artist K.S. Radhakrishnan, who is also the curator of this fantastic exhibition on the correspondences of Satyajit Ray. K.S. Radhakrishnan is, a re is recognized as one of the most significant figures of contemporary Indian art. He was mentored and trained by two of the most important figures in Indian modernism, Raminkar Baji and Sabari Roy Chaudhary. Radhakrishnan is a sculptor and his main material is bronze and it's been his medium for many, many years. The major themes and motifs of his work are the male and female Mayu and Musi, which represent the anima animus, primary anthropomorphic archetypes. These works are his mediations on migration, history, nostalgia, and memory, which have a direct engagement with the public sphere. So over to you now, sir, and we will start. Thank you very much. Well, to start with, let me sort of thank, thank KCC for having me for this presentation. And uh, well, where is Rina? Huh? Rina and Sweta. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you. Well, when I say in the open, uh, what I meant is like the sculptures that I have done and installed in the open space, in the open air. The open air sculptures doesn't mean that it's all public sculptures, but then these are the sculptures that have been, that I have been working on for the last four decades. And, um, well, I go straight to the sculptures, but I have always had this, you know, 
fascination for doing open air sculptures. From the time when I came out of Shantanikhan as a student, I took to the idea of doing open air sculptures inspired of Ram Kinkar Beige, under whom I have worked for many years. So the last sculpture, one of the recent sculptures that I have done, is something that I start with. This is the um, this was done two years back, just before the corona started, opened up. And um, this the site, is, the site is the Supreme Court of India in New Delhi. And this was a commission from the bench because the judges, they decided to have one of the sculpture based on the subject of constitution. So I took to the idea of doing a sculpture which is like a tree, a large tree. And um, if you look at it from far, that's what only scope, because there's no way that you can go close to the sculpture now for the unless you commit a crime. It, it's very difficult for someone to get inside the canvas. And the, and the idea was uh, to do a monumental sculpture, which Delhi has some, but I think they continue to do so. So this was an invited project. And um, when you see it from far, it's very abstract. You don't know what exactly it's all about. The sculpture is made of bronze. Why I say bronze? Because I don't work with any other medium. I don't know how to work with anything else, too. It's a, it's a view taken from the below. So when you go close to this sculpture, that you can make out, yeah. Well, this is supposed to be a flourishing tree. The constitution is supposed to be the flourishing tree. That was the idea. But whether it is really flourishing or not, it's something to be looked at today. But at least it's meant to be. That was the idea. So you can read it. So looking very closely at this sculpture, what you see are the human figures. And um, it's because this primary interest was sort of movement in my sculpture. The people moves all over in whichever directions. So coming close to them, many people ask me, who are these people? So I always tell them that there are two, you know, like one is a Musui, and the other is a Maya. The Musui is the male, and the Maya is the female. Now, who is this Musui? I met with this Santal boy years back when I was a student in Shantade Kedan. Uh, who was probably working in one of the tea shop. And um, he stood as a model in our college for the students to do life studies. And so I remember making one of the, la the actual size of the sculpture of Musui, and um, it was in clay, and then from clay it has been casted into concrete. So when I left, after spending almost eight years in Shantadegya, I was given a kind of a fellowship to come to Delhi, so I could not take this sculpture because I didn't have much to carry, but it's still, I wanted to take at least a, a part of Musi within me. So I took the head off the sculpture. So this head has become a permanent fixture in my studio many, many years. It has always been there wherever I went, whichever studio that I have shifted from one to the next. The studio was shifted many times. This is the dance, dance studio that I made in Mehroli, in Delhi. You can see the Musui somewhere on the, on the top of the shelf that you can see the head of Musui, that it was always there. So, you know, when I was sort of, uh, since my interest was more towards the open air sculptures, you know, we are talking about Rajasthan, and this was the first offer that I had to do a sculpture in Bikaner. And I took up, I jumped on it because I was very young, maybe probably the first challenge that I was trying sort of to do something larger. And uh, the sculpture was made in concrete. I mean, there are many stories connected to that because when I completed the sculpture, you know, the guy who commissioned me, the collector, the district collector, came and asked me, is it the sculpture or a mold? And then almost I had to run away from the city to save myself. So there are two sculptures that I made. One was this a concrete sculpture again on the Jaisalmer Road. So I have been working with a lot of these sculptures of trying to make it into open, large bronzes. Any chance that came 
for me to do anything larger in bronze, I never missed it. So this is India Habitat Center in, in, in Delhi. When um, they wanted two sculptures on both sides, sides of the entrance, this is the Chandala rider, and that's the other one is a, a woman being seated on a split base. So then I took to sort of uh, many ideas of making sculptures, but then where do you get the sponsorship? Because hardly do you get a sponsorship do for doing a large sculpture in India. So I was sort of, um, I had, I was fortunate to sort of have few chances of making sculptures in the European countries. So this is sculpture being sculpted down at a site in, in the south of France. So many sculptures while I was working on in the, in many different countries, of this the whirlwind, the other one was the pool. So, you know, with all that sculpture that was happening around, very large bronzes, and this was in Kolkata, 1996, the Park Street, sponsored by the Sangeeta Jindals and the Preeti Pauls, they really wanted to have the India Art India magazine to be launched in Kolkata with the show. So then, you know, uh, I, the same year, I was sort of, I was commissioned to do by ITC a sculpture based on travel. So when you talk about travel for a sculptor who spent many years in Kolkata, for him it's a rickshaw pulling. Rickshaw puller and the rickshaw is the basic mode of traveling. So here what he's traveling basically, that he's pulling the rickshaw with his own memories. And the, the, the sculpture was ultimately installed on the rooftop of ITC building. And I was thinking that who would be the puller of the rickshaw at that time? Because it's a large original actual size of the rickshaw being cast into bronze. Then that was the time my first approach to Musui, who was with me. So, well, I suppose it was a kind of a mutual agreement. Musui agreed to do so. So this is a large sculpture which was done that time in 1997. And uh, the sculpture was big enough that I could sit behind. And uh, I really would start to sort of my journey with this, with this sculpture. And uh, I think I'm still sitting behind Musui or along with Musui, or the Musui is the one that takes me around. He's taking me to many, many places and I have installed many, many sculptures in various countries. With Musui I traveled. So while working on, now, Musui, the story was never getting complete. So I had to conceive the, you know, the counterpart of Musui, who I named Maya. So it's a, Maya is a takeoff from Musui as a character. Then I started working on some of the sculptures again commissioned from the South of France, one of the foundations. So the site was a palm grove. So I started making imps, imps of the kind. The sculptures were all very celebratory, a kind of tremendous movement. That was the idea, and they were all collectively put together. You can see it against the landscape of the province. So Musi becoming, you know, character that is hosting various icons. So he became a rat catcher here, you can see. Or Maya comes as a writer. Maya is a creature here. Also, Musi becomes a Jesus, and why not devil? So it's like he's becoming, you know, hosting icons of the kind that we all know, familiar about. So Maya is a violinist, and also is Musi becomes a Brahmin. So here the Maya, is, Musi is running, I mean, he's hosting the character of Mullah Nasruddin. And Maya becomes the graduate. What do you call it a graduate? Because in Shantani Kedan, when you come out as a student, as a graduate, you are being given this chhatim, chhatim pata. That's what it is. And this is the, you know, in, we call it shaptaparni. Yeah, this is what you get. So people naturally work for five years, seven years to get this leaf. And the sculpture was installed in one of the college, the women's college. They celebrated Maya as a graduate. So recently, the same sculpture as a postgraduate, I have installed in one of the art center that's opened in Shantini Kedan. That's uh, Art Tishila, one of the art center that has come up where this Somnath Hor exhibition is just recently opened.
that this was the time when I, I started working on my, you know, becoming into all different kind of compositions. The vertical, verticality in terms of the structure that is holding, and my is holding onto that. So the sculpture was commissioned to make it larger for the Delhi tourism has approached me when they were thinking of a garden called Garden of Five Senses. But then there's again a story behind it because that was probably the first time Delhi government approached me or Delhi government approached any sculptor for that reason to do an open air sculpture. So when I went to the committee before that, when I was sort of discussing about the potential, I know the piece that one is going to come up with, and uh, then they said, they have an idea. Always they have an idea because they spent the money. And then I asked, well, what am I doing with your idea then? Then he said, I said, by mistake or whatever, I said, I would prefer to do my own idea, even if I have to do it free. So ultimately I did the sculpture free. I ended up doing it free. Sculpture was large enough to be installed on the rock. So I started working on some larger sculptures. This is installed at the HCL building. And Musi becomes Kathakali, Kalamandalam, Kathakali, dancer. So, you know, why only characters that here Musi bec Maya becomes the windmill or Musi becomes the windmill? And they are holding each other's head to sort of establish the fact that they are inseparable, they are integrated into so much, they are becoming one. They are together for the first time on a same base. And she becomes an angel and made it to a larger version. So Musi becomes a, you know, Nataraj, and she becomes Mona Lisa. So here the Maya becomes the Durga, almost playing with Mus Musi becomes the Mahishasur. Also a tree goddess. So they are together on the railings along with my sponsors in, Den in Danish sponsors in south of France. Sculptures were becoming bigger and that was going to different sides. I always enjoyed working next to the water. She becomes a, an arrow and the bow together. In, they are sort of conceived to be together. And then 150 years of Tagore, Shantanikyat and Vishwavarati University, they have approached me if I could do a sculpture for their Tagore's house, the, a very well protected site. I agree to the idea of make up, making, a, making a large sculpture, which is again, Musi becomes, you know, Maya becomes, you know, uh, the, she's, she's the arrow and the bow together. Well, they really are multiple, sort of multiple compositions were conceived to become globe. And the sculpture is installed before it in, in, you know, what do you call it, the HCL building again in, you know, one of the buildings. There comes the idea, next a series of sculptures called the Ram. The Ram has multiple figures, and these figures are all put together on a bronze platform. And many, from this distance you can see that there's a lot of movement in them, but they are not dancers. Because all the dance may have movement, but all the movements are not dance. But here, this, uh, these are very well photographed by my friend who is, who is no more with us, Prabhutha Das Gupta, who shot these photographs. Hundreds of figures were really getting onto the ramp. They were really ascending onto the ramp. But to really meet up with the character that is Ram Krishna, uh, who is much larger than life, who, is, who has kind of, you know, I would really put him as a kind of a character who has attained you know, the enlightened character, or maybe a sainthood character, but I'm not really talking about just because of this poster is so popular that I really took to the idea of Ram Krishna. And when I was doing, since I was doing the Ram Krishna on one side, on the other side, I conceived the Maya becoming a Sharada character. She becomes the Sharada, I mean, that's seated there. And you can see an aerial view of Sharada being placed in the middle of the ram. The ram shots are incredible. I am always inspired of these photographs because Prabhupada Das Gupta, when he came and he did these photographs for me, it was like showing me my sculpture 
in a different perspective, different light. Because, I mean, uh, you know, there is a way of seeing it and there is a way of showing it. Sometimes, you know, we are so much involved with one's own work that you may not be able to sort of see the way it is meant to be. So there is somebody else comes and gives you, opens the door or light in a different perspective. This was just after my trip from Egypt. And uh, here Maya becomes the, a kind of a guardian goddess. She is sort of uh, standing at the crest of the ram, uh, protecting the, you know, the human treasure. So that is, you can see that she's really kind of guarding figure, you know, all this human, humanity. The sculpture was installed in many places. This was one of the art, art fair, India art fair site. Musi was still working in Shantanika, then he continued to be working in, you know, and I keep going to visiting Shantanika then and to meeting up with him, having a kind of a chat with him because he doesn't know, because he is lost in his own world. I am told that he used to be sort of uh, drinking, sort of uh, heavily drinking habits that developed and occasionally working in the tea shop. So the Musi and Mayas are becoming freehold for the first time. A series of sculptures being made. So all these movements that you can see of Musi and Mayas on the crest of the pillar with different movements. You cannot say what they are doing. It's not specifically mentioning. There's no direct reference of a particular movement of what a human being can do on the crest of a pillar. It's just that a movement that comes from within, it's just that if she or he is holding something, holding on to oneself, that's what's the idea. Mostly the figures are thrown to the space, thrown into the space with a kind of a freehold, air mount, like evoking a lot of lightness. It's continuously I was working because when we people especially the sculptors, we really have to continue to be working on a series of sculptures in numbers, and then later, the sculptures are all put together to form an exhibition. She, here, Maya becomes a writer. And, uh, well, one may say that a writer may not be in a poster of this kind, but then it never gave me any kind of discomfort in terms of looking at it, and I never meant to give any discomfort to the to any writers of this world. It was installed in Baroda, and the Musi becomes upside down, all kinds of moments. You know, it's the minimum contact of what bronze can offer you. It's the minimum contact that you have with that base that's enough for such a huge volume to be thrown into the air. We can see the kind of extreme playfulness and, you know, maybe only through the holding onto the pillar, and here Musi, Musi becomes again, you know, sort of behaving like, because these were sculptures one of the kind. So you just leave one behind to take a step before you again. So all these characters were created in 2006, soon after my ramp was completed. So all these, I don't know, maybe around 25 sculptures were created of this series called The Freehold. And they are all put together in this, in the, when you have it in the studio, then you see them. There's a kind of a different collective energy that you can feel from within, and you breathe that. The sculptures are all completed, and then you naturally take it to an exhibition. And that was shown at Bombay. It's almost like so you can see the being, it's being placed in the kind of gallery, like you have, you know, it's like, a, uh, a kind of a sprouted out, the kind of from the ground. So Maya walks on the wa wave, and he becomes a turtle. And here is a sculpture that I started working on the human square. In the middle, there are some figures and pillars and things like that. So this is one of the sculpture that was a model for a sculpture that was installed in Kalabhavan in Shantanikedan as Musi being seated and looking at, you know, what's happening on the ground. So I call it Musi becomes a terra fly. Musi is also grown old, and he's still around. He was still around in Shantanike, then started growing beard, like equally like mine, and, and with gray beard, and yeah. 
he also sort of with a kind of a matured look, I should say. So this hundreds and hundreds of Masuis and Mayas were getting cast for a project called the Liminal Figures. And it's like, you know, I was looking at some of the images by the previous speakers, that you could, I was just, I don't know where to stop. I never knew. I don't know where, it, where I started even. So there's no question of, it's a, it's a, it's a continuous process. It's a living, you know, living with process. It's like, you know, you're seedling, you know, in the, you know, these characters in a kind of a, a paddy field. The studio was basically, when the studio became full with Musuis and Mayas, I stopped. That was the only way that I could decide, oh, this is the time that I should stop. Because it was spilling over. Then I, then I, it took two and a half years of my work only on this sculpture called Liminal Figures. The sculpture was completed. It was shown in Kolkata for the first time in 2008, then later taken to different cities. The sculpture was so big enough that it was 60 feet long. And uh, this is one of the views that, was, that you can see from, this is probably in national galleries and art fairs and all. Certainly you must have seen the India art fair also had the you know, occasion, I really had a chance to exhibit for the public over there too. And uh, you know, all these large figures which are from the very horizontality to the cartwheeling and comes to the kind of last, last wall where I have created the artificial shadow along with the actual, you know, the shadow that is falling onto the wall to define the space beyond. The wall is not the end. Maybe it makes a kind of a new beginning. It was large enough that one would never stand one place and have a look at it. You would really make a move to look at it to the, till the end of it. And um, after completion of that sculpture in 2008, I started working on some major open air sculptures. That was going higher and higher. I wanted to go bigger and bigger sculptures, especially for the medium bronze, what bronze can offer you. This is a view from the National Gallery. See, this was the time in the Kerala government probably noticed me since I come from Kerala. They have asked me if I could do a sculpture for the city Calicut. And, and uh, I really thought, well, man, why not? Because this is one of the great sites they have offered me, but it was a very political site. It was not easy. So the Politburo in Delhi and the local, you know, the councillors and all had to come to kind of an agreement to decide on whether I could do the sculpture in the center of the city, which is where all the things were happening. It's a big happening city. So I had to do the sculpture in the middle of the night because the public opposition was building up. They already heard that I'm doing a sculpture for the center because it was a very well, you know, maintained gra grass ground and somebody coming with cranes and trucks and with loaded of stones and things like that was a different challenge. So I have managed to do it by five o'clock in the morning I did and I was just sort of trying to watch what would be the reaction for the public. Next day I could see public slowly coming in from all directions. I was, they didn't know it, who am I, I was standing around to have a look at it. I just wanted to know how, how, what sort of a statement they are coming up with. The sculpture is a huge museum, it's almost 10 feet high, kept on the g huge granite stones. Again, locally explored. The sculptures has got on the ground some of the carved Bangalore tiles. I carved them because you cannot have a bronze kept on the ground, at least not in India, because only it will have a life of one day. Next day it will be stolen. So I always try to do anything which is there of a bronze, it has to be kept at a height. And anything which has to be done, best to do it on the stone, because people would find it very comfortable sitting on it, and it will always be there. The sculpture, you know, the concrete base on which the sculptures were sort of seated, later I created the grass mound. 
and all these stones were sort of inserted inside the ground. I found public coming and taking photograph. That was a very positive symptom that they have accepted my sculpture. Now that today when I go there, I could see what it is to be a public sculpture, public sitting all over. 300 to 400 people are coming and sitting and sharing the space with my sculpture. The sculpture is titled The Time Tides, The Kala Pravaham. I enjoy looking at this scene of how people are really making it their own. So the idea of showing that how a public sculpture can really become, make it public and make it their own. And uh, you know, it's interesting, you can see this image where there are crows sitting on the head of Musui. The birds are really doing, her, doing their job. Yes. And also when I was going to Kerala, I could see, you know, the a newspaper cutting where three pe people are standing on my museum and cleaning it also. So that's just, I was so amazed to sort of see how people can really maintain public art because they made, they made it their own. There was nothing like that in Kerala, at least that part of Kerala. The sculpture is there for all the time to come because it's, I'm sure it is concrete, it's, sorry, it is granite and bronze. Then when I did this sculpture, again the ministers were in Kerala asked me if I could do something for the hometown where I was born, that was Kotayam. So I tried to do a sculpture with three figures composition, which, is, which I call it Behurupi. So all these three figures were kept at much higher platforms, stone bases, that nobody can reach out to, the bronze at least. The, you can see the size, the scale of the bronze. I mean, it's nice to see. And then the same sculpture you see has been installed in Bangalore by a corporate. Because unless I, you know, when I sell it to the corporate, I get a better money. And that money I spent, I take out some money to make sculptures for my hometown or anywhere where I don't take any public money because I have never touched the public money. Nobody could still say that I have taken any money from anybody. It's all, I make the effort of making it there with my own resources. So probably that's why there's nothing much written negative about me. Otherwise, Kerala is the kind of a state that you would write too, many, too much of criticism for anything that you do, whether it's good or bad. So Bangalore city, placed it on the road for the public, because they could have kept it in their own campus. Instead, they placed it open air. I get some offers like this, having a sculptures to be made. This is in Amsterdam, a couple of, three, four years back. Then the government of Goa had decided to have a sculpture of mine, where I, where I went and worked for a month I created a, a large home with, with the Mangalore tiles and laterite stones. And then I made a fiberglass version of it. I cast the entire clay sculpture into fiberglass. The sculptures were getting, the figure was getting molded there itself at the site. And then it goes to Rajasthan where I get the bronzes being cast. Yeah, it's a big process because works are casted in sections and then you have put them together. So you, it's a, you have to be involved because it's not like being in the West that you do something and you give it to a foundry and then you get a ready-made and you only check whether your signature is right or not. But here, from the very making till the end, I'm fully involved. And that's what a sculpt, I mean, if you want to enjoy the making of a sculpture, you are like that. The sculpture was cast in Jaipur and that was brought to the site in Goa, installed on the promenade where at the Panji, where you know you have this Mandavi River, where the film festivals are held. It's just opposite that building. 
Yeah, it is installed there forever. I don't know what was that first bell. Anyway, I'm going to complete it. Yeah, this is uh, the sculpture that is installed in the open air in, in Goa. Musi is being seated or standing, I don't know, because when you are on the arms, we cannot say whether you are seated or standing or whatever. Musi is being placed on the portal. It's a portal, bronze, huge portal that where you can get an, into, it, into the space and come out. The sculpture is there forever to come. I suppose Musi will be taking an aerial view of the people who are coming into the city of Panjim. Well, this is where I really end up with. Let, it, let Musi be there for all the time to come. Thank you so much. Thank you, Radha Krishnan, sir. Yes, there's a question here. So again, in the interest of time, we'll um, take a few questions and then we'll move on to the next session. Hi, sir. Uh, this is Orunima from ISWB. Uh, I have seen all the things and I have uh, a little bit interest in sculptures. I'm not very much, uh, I am not expert in that, but I have interest. Um, you have you told that there is some studio in Shantaniketan you have. Uh, where it is and can we visit? Can students visit the sculpture studio and any, by any chance? This is the studio in Shantaniketan. Okay, yeah. yes. and can, you, can the students visit or uh, yes, making process? Yes, this is the studio I built 10 years back. Okay, sir. Uh, for the reason that my connection with my connection with Shantaniketan is very strong. I spend a lot of time in Delhi and installing sculptures all over different countries and places. But, you know, it, I mean, I had many other reasons, personal reasons also to visit. In between, I had official reasons to visit Shantaniketan every now and then. Then I said, if I'm coming to Shantaniketan that regularly, I have to have some, you know, a kind of a workspace that made me to be there in Shantaniketan. It's in Purva Valley. You know, you are familiar? Yes, sir. It's in Purva Valley, yes. Uh, sir, uh, is there any name of the studio? I want to visit No, no. You. There's no name. It's okay, only, sir. I will yeah, find it. Yeah, if you remember my name, it, the people will take me to, take you to my studio. Okay, sir. Thank you. The address is uh, Radha one Krishnan. more question I have. <laughs> one more question I have that, uh, that is, you said that there are some uh, sculptures you made uh, by bronze, and there is some which, which is out of fiberglass. Uh, fiberglass. Fiberglass. You have said that. What What is the difference, and uh, what is more sustainable? And why did uh, you some sometimes you make this with bronze, and uh, somewhere you make this? I just want to know. You see, why. many people make sculptures in fiberglass. I don't make it. I make it as a prototype. I make it not as a final product. I make it, you know, like kind of, uh, you know, like for the transportation purpose. Even huge scale fiberglass could be taken to the foundry in Rajasthan or wherever for that reason. And having it cast, then fiber is, fiber is never exhibited. And I have an allergy with fiberglass. Okay. If anybody works with fiberglass, someday I might develop an allergy with them also. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, there's one over there in the corner, please. Thank you. And then we'll take one more, if there is one more. Yes, you, sir. And then we'll move on to the next session. First, yeah. Um, you began by making this uh, interesting distinction in a very quick sentence, uh, the distinction between an open air art, open air sculpture and public sculpture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And later we could see how happy it makes you that the public engages with your work. So what is your notion of public art? Uh, how important do you think it is? It's very, very good question, very appropriate. The reason is that um, when I said public sculptures, uh, you know, when I come to this Kolkata city and uh, many other cities when I travel and I see, there are many sculptures on the roadside and also on the aisle you have, um, you know, sometimes statues or sometimes different sculptors are making, I mean, do one have a chance to spend some time with that piece at all? I don't think so. You are passing by, you know, you are driving and you are looking at it, oh, there's a sculpture here. You go to Rajar Hart in Calcutta, you go to many of these places. I don't know whether are they really public sculpture? I am afraid. 
Public sculpture is where public come in contact with the sculpture, where public can sit relaxed and really take a kind of a, a kind of an introspecting space, a kind of a space that really makes them to think about it. You know, if somebody, you know, in Kerala long back, I remember they offered me a space in the bus stand. I said, yeah, you want to catch the bus or you want to sit and look at the sculpture? You have to have a space. That's why I say my sculptures I prefer to install. Even if I have to spend the money from me, still I prefer to do it in, in a manner that it come, you people really live with the sculpture. Even if it is for an hour or two, they come and be in touch with the sculptures, which is what exactly for me the public sculptures. Because, you know, in the West, if you go, it was started years and years back. Do we have public sculptures at all? I really, I'm afraid. People have money, they spend, they fabricate forms, who I don't call it a public. But even just putting it in the open doesn't make it public. All open air sculptures are not public. Do you call it a pub? I don't call it a public sculpture anyway. You call it a public sculpture? No. Pardon? Yeah, there is a word. There is a word difference between statue and a sculpture. Yes, there are public statues and not public sculptures. Go ahead. Sir, our question is Bangla. Sir, your sculpture is your mental state. What is it? Okay, I'm going to see. 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 Sir, what was your sculpture in your mental state? Did you break your realism and break your anatomy? Did you know that the figure of movement was your knowledge? Did you see a fragmented piece of people in the ordinary view? What is the significance of your character? Can you translate the question before answering? I am quite good in Bangla, but I have to say that तो वो ठीक क्लियरली बोझ कर सुनते पड़ रहा है ना कथा टा आवाज का तो बोलते हैं आवाज कल्चर है कि मूवमेंट नहीं है बोल चुके हैं ना अपनी किचन या जोड़े बोल the fact that it is fragmented and whether a layman would be able to understand the significance of the sculpture that you're making do you know something we don't we don't make any sculptures with a kind of definite with a proper defined you know, a kind of a concluded statement. We only make sculptures, at least I make sculptures or want to take over that space to think about it. It's creating a kind of a very thoughtful space. I'm not telling, I'm not dictating that this is the way to be seen it. People have tremendous inspirations and tremendous interpretations to that piece. And that's what the beauty of the sculpture also. In the Shantadi Gedan, when I made a sculpture for the Terra Fly in Kalabhavan, Many people, you know, couldn't make out what exactly it's all about. Is it kept on the, the Musi is standing or Musi is doing some push-ups or whatever, you know, kind of things. But it's definitely, you know, I always said, Musi is seated on the top of the pillar. He's definitely taking an aerial study of what's happening on the ground. Now, many people say, is, are you, do you mean God by that? I said, I don't know, that's for you to say. Musi, you are being looked at. Every step of you is being looked at. But Musi, you want to see Musi, you have to look up. But he, you, he, Musi, Musi is always keeping an eye on the ground. So what I'm trying to say, it is not something for us to sort of to fully say this is one way of looking at it. You watch FM, you see it in your own way. And then hundreds of people, many people are writing about that. Then you start really re-looking at it. Even when our sculptures, you know, the, many of the critics, historians, when they write about our work, then you start reading it. Why do they write if you know everything about it? They write it so that you can also sort of read and understand, oh, this is an educated mind, a sensitive mind is looking at a sculpture and the interpretations are reaching out to you. So definitely you have to leave a room for you to read about it, to study about it. And then, um, and then even sometime when they, that's what I said, even a photographer can give me a different perspective about my own sculpture and uh, which I really feel that it's one way of an interacting space, a kind of a sharing, you know, values and things like that. So there's no one way of looking at it. What, in a layman, definitely should have his own way of looking at it. And that person definitely would find certain questions from, that comes from within, which would get answered in one way or other, if he's still further curious about it. 
Thank you. I think on that note, Radha Krishnan, we'll conclude the session. Wait. I think that was a very good moment. Thank you. Thank you. So, session seven. Can we bring back the podium and table? Let's uh, move on to our next speaker, Dr. Kalyan Kumar Chakravarti. Uh, he is also honorary advisor to KCC and had been part of Vasudeva Kutumbakam from the very inception. Dr. Kalyan Kumar Chakravarti, IAS, is uh, President, People's Council of Education, Allahabad. He has held several crucial posts over the years, including the position of Chairman of Lalit Kala Academy, Director General of National Museum, and Chairman of National Screening and Evaluation Committee at Archaeological Survey of India, ASI, among many other designations and posts. He is known for fusing theory and practice in promoting cultural survival, environmental self-determination, and sustainable knowledge systems of marginalized communities. Over to you, Kalyanji. You want me to speak, or you want, want to, are people to ask questions? I think, why don't you introduce some thoughts? And well, then I mean, uh, we can open it up and have a discussion, sir. Yes, and also Gurudas uh, and Ajay and Divya and the other speakers to interact. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, well, uh, you see, um, I have combined theory and practice all my life in all these areas. And um, so for me, the question is, uh, do you only want to understand, also want to change? What is it that we take from this con conference? And what is the follow-up? I mean, what exactly uh, are the seminarists going to do after this? What is the network that we establish? What are the field initiatives? How are they going to be shaped? So uh, these are uh, the issues which I address. Uh, do you want me to address them, I mean, over the entire canvas of discussion? You may also address a question to somebody okay. and respond to their answer, and we can continue in that manner. Well, I mean, uh, sorry. Yeah, so one of the things that's been um, running through my mind is this theme, which is solidarity in a time with a capital T, solidarity in a time of crises with a capital C. And uh, I was reflecting over the presentation that I'm going to make tomorrow, and almost all the images have come out of some kind of crises, right? All the collaborations and partnerships that have emerged have come out of some thinking, some challenge, which one could call crises. So my question is, when there has been a time when there hasn't been crises? So what does it mean when we say solidarity? Do we mean what kind of solidarity in a, in a time of crises? Or do we mean, because solidarity happens all the time, doesn't it? So it's a, it's a question. I don't have an answer, but it's the, it's the thing that's been moving around in my mind. Uh, I have a question around sustainability as well, but that's a, that's a much later question. But yeah. Well, I mean, um, <coughs> solidarity in the time of crisis, I mean, as, we, as it has been already been discussed uh, by ecologists here, that the, for the first time, uh, we are facing the sixth extinction. And this time, the extinction is not engineered by nature, it is being engineered by human beings. So that's why this phase is called Anthropocene, not Pleistocene or Miocene. And uh, <clears throat> so the question is, uh, the solidarity, not only among human beings, but with among uh, human and non-human communities, 
among organic and inorganic commentaries, which was the fulcrum of survival, that is endangered. I mean, there is, uh, um, there is not only uh, end of uh, birth, but there is also death of death. So therefore, whether it is uh, a marine species or ardent species or, you know, uh, basic human values, uh, they're all being eroded by a, a kind of an engulfing tide of uh, biocultural reductionism, homogenization, and uh, technification. So that is the crisis. Now, we have heard uh, different kinds of panelists. I have different kinds of questions to them, actually. What do they propose to do about it after they go back? So that I shall reserve for now. I have a question. Sir. Um, uh, doctor, you have worked extensively with tribals all across India. And uh, yesterday, we were talking about that indigenous tribes and Adivasis. And you have lived your life in metropolises like Delhi and Kolkata. One of the stark differences between uh, the tribal communities and urban India is the human nature relationships. You know, uh, uh, I come from Pune and I see a lot of Punekars do not see the river as a river. But on the other hand, if you go to a tribal village and there is a river or a water body there, they will have some connection with it. So one is we are very clearly seeing that urban India is losing its connect with nature. We are treating nature more as a recreation, as let's do a tiger holiday in this coming summer, something like that. So what do you think uh, should be done as, uh, as a policy or uh, you know, in the education, which will actually bring back our acceptance to the reality that it is because of nature that we are alive. How do you improve the human nature relationship that urban India seems to have lost today? Sir, uh, see, this uh, tribal, non-tribal divide, included, excluded divide, scheduled, non-scheduled divide, it is all legal and fictional. I mean, I always say that there was a point of time when all of us were uh, living together on a shared continent of ideas. Now, we have been banished from that. But uh, uh, as John Dunn used to say, that we human beings are part of the main. And even if a koala is burnt in Australia, or even if uh, a uh, uh, vanishing species dies in the oceans here, we are less. Every person's death, every death of any species diminishes me in person. So the answer, I mean, I have always uh, pursued these answers I mean, through concrete initiatives. I shall give an example. I am advisor for all the tribal uh, freedom fighters museums in the country, including the Garurisha National Museum in Gujarat. So when I came across this uh, project, I found that it is capital intensive. They are building a container without thinking about the content. It's a huge structure. Then they are thinking about statues. Statues of heroes like uh, Bitsa Munda and this and that. But they are not thinking of the tribal per se or what he has to contribute. That he is not a an object of exhibition. So, since I have dealt with museums also all my life, my approach is to move from communities visiting the museums to museums visiting the communities, from collection of objects to recollection of heritage, uh, from documentation to regeneration. So therefore, I immediately changed the concept and uh, invited a national conclave in Bhopal. Now, Indira Gandhi Rashtriya of Sangrahale, which I hated, is starved of funds. They have no funds. They have the human resource, but no material resource. So I decided to uh, invite uh, uh, these people who didn't have the idea about what is going on to IJLMS. And then 
have we decided on a networking with all the tangible and intangible heritage sites uh, of which the tribal people are custodians uh, so that uh, uh, the museum becomes part of a demuseumization trail, a narrative and revitalization trail, and thereby uh, their so-called knowledge systems. We always talk about knowledge. Now knowledge is also seen as laboratory-based knowledge or nature-based knowledge. That uh, knowledge which is transgenerationally nurtured and modified in the lap of nature by human communities is also knowledge. That it is also testable, it is also falsifiable, it is also replicable, is not known to the scientists. The fact that they know bioactive principles, that they know uh, third party assurance, that they know uh, what the uh, uh, characteristics are, is not known to the scientist, because the language is not known. So my attempt is to bridge this linguistic divide through practical initiatives. So I have taken practical initiatives on my life, I mean, uh, to deal with the cognitive divide. Hello. Hello. Uh, doctor, I have a question, and I would say that it is not only to you, but all the esteemed speakers who are here, is one of the things, since I run an educational institution, it is really the students don't know what, what they don't know. So it will be great if the speakers can, if can physically come to the center or at least address the students uh, via online, but do it with a program that is done throughout the year. That way what happens is that that sticks with them and they become more knowledgeable about what exists and that will ins uh, at least incite them to go and visit and I would say that is where we can really build a ground base. So how can that be done? I'm really looking for some suggestions, some partnerships to empower our youth to save our culture and build in sustainability. I understand. Now I have headed uh, 75,000 schools as the director of public instruction in uh, Madhya Pradesh uh, with about uh, 200,000 uh, teachers and mind you, 165 unions. Uh, so it was a, a scene of great fragmentation, lot of politicking, lot of interference, and no funding. 5% of the uh, entire fund was reserved uh, uh, for development. The rest of the fund was only for maintenance. So I went into public participation activity. I uh, requested all the district magistrates, uh, all the you know, uh, schools and all the teachers to come together to generate resource. And they did it. I mean, in fact, I mean, uh, we held, uh, you see, campaigns all over the state and they garnered resources and re the uh, school. We told them that don't give money. Money is misspent. Give, uh, give chalks give tatpattis, give a blackboard, uh, or you give your time to teaching. And uh, also create magazines with the help of the local cognoscenti and teachers and students. So they went around, studied the environment, and brought out about 700 magazines of superb quality, all based on uh, an environmental study. They also brought together the scattered sculptures and the art objects from ancient time to uh, brought it into the school premises, decorated the school, and converted each school into a kind of a living museum. That is just one example. I'm not multiplying examples. So I am I'm, I'm absolutely sure that your initiative is uh, a kind of a uh, dissemination initiative, which can be multiplied. Of course, it requires resource. Now, I, shall, uh, I should not actually answer uh, your question with this answer, but because of the you know, uh, question about, uh, you see, architecture, et cetera, and heritage, how is it to be revitalized? 
Now the Swaminarayan temple in uh, Gujarat and in Delhi. So they also discussed with me when I was chairman of Lalit Kala Academy. And we worked work together a bit. So they had assembled about uh, 5,000 artists from all over the place. People who are driving rickshaws, people who are uh, working as grocers, people who have lost their profession. They were masons, they were architects, they were uh, badhakis, takshakas in the traditional manner. They had the knowledge, the text and the context. So they put them together and then they brought the computer aided design and all the engineering skills, harvested them, joined the skills, I mean the com uh, modern skills with the traditional skills and created the architecture, exported all these artists all over the world and it became an economic profession for them. I'd like to yeah, just comment a little bit, maybe it might be conducive to the conversation. I think that one of the things that you're saying, sir, and I think that you're addressing is how do we take this discussion and how can there be outcomes? And I think, you know, the projects you're doing um, can be scaled. And it's a question of resource, but it's also a question of intention and, and willingness. And I, I hope that that could be one of the outcomes, that we could find a way to scale some of these ideas using technology, using YouTube, using social media to somehow be a bit more intelligent about what we're communicating to the world instead of just selfies and uh, what we ate for breakfast, but perhaps using these tools to kind of, you know, amplify this, this good work. So. So with your experience working with the uh, indigenous, what we call refer to as indigenous or Adivasis across the country, I have a question which is to do with them working with musicians and I'm talking about the performing arts per se actually. You know, we've had a lot of conversation today on, on more tangible uh, outcomes, whether they were crafts or whether they were paintings or whether it was land and trees, ecology, Right? But we also were speaking about behavioral change. We were talking about uh, shifts in our perception, somewhere where we had to refuse certain things for us to be able to move forward. Uh, the intangible, while it is spoken about often, uh, there's very little work that's done about how that intangible is going to move forward. We've spoken about sculptures, you know, artifacts handicrafts. What about the performing art traditions? I had a question around that is what do you feel is the way forward? Because it's the songs, it's the dances, it's the instruments that very often carry a lot of the legacy and the value for my interest is really about the value that they, they hold, the value and the wisdom that they hold. See, I have worked with a lot of performing arts also. So again, the approach. For instance, Kitab e Nauras, written by a Muslim Nawab. So he invited the Dagar Bandhus and revitalized the uh, Ragas. I mean, through their performance. Then there is a text called Kashyapa Silpa Sanghita. So he invited the surviving sculptors in Tamil Nadu and Bangalore and Karnataka and got them to make sculptures according to the iconometric principles laid down in the text. Manushalaya Chandrika, uh, which is a text for building houses in Kerala. So he worked with uh, Tharabharts and you know, uh, the uh, Nair communities to uh, work on restoration of their uh, houses, about which they knew very well. And uh, in the same way, the performing arts or the art per se, the discussion here has been confined to art as art in aesthetic terms. In other words, it is only art of drawing, art of painting, art of sculpting. They do not see the art of environment management, which they do that there is an art of water management. There are hundreds of water harvesting structures with great art in them. 
with actual shrines, with uh, great engineering, Naulas and cool schools all over. There is also an art of uh, uh, forest management. There are sacred growth configurations all over the country, all of which uh, are uh, refuges of sacred biota and uh, relict species of vegetation. And they have taboos and prescriptions, which are all part of the art of knowledge. So they uh, confine art in this reductionist manner to painting and drawing. These are all performing arts. And along with that uh, uh, art of sculpting, they also sing, they also dance. And that's why I was talking about pandums. I mean, uh, the entire rhythm of, uh, you see, forestry life in Bastar uh, was uh, directly linked with performing arts. And they were not seeing this as art. They were see seeing this as an incitement of bounty, of fertility, of, uh, you see, beneficence. So, uh, so that is how uh, we have worked with artists. And there are epics which are not known. People only know Ramayana Mahabharata. There is Karak Dandi. I mean, uh, there are, I won't uh, give the names, I mean, to display how many names we know. But there are epics all over the place. Even, you know, this Sarul festival, uh, the uh, Sarda festival, they're accompanied by narratives and songs and performances. They're all beneficent and they're all bounty inciting activities and art. Sorry, yeah, so the question is, so how does one Well, I mean, work with as somebody pointed out that, I mean, the government should do something. Now the government, I mean, uh, I mean, of course I was in government, but there are many IS officers also in government who do not necessarily link art with uh, governance. And then when you are talking about the communities, how the community should take itself in its hand. So that example I have seen all over the place. And my uh, strength has been to join hands with the community. You see, for instance, I mean, in, um, uh, I gave the example of Darkot and Munshiari in Uttarakhand, where the Bhutia women were practicing medicine. And their knowledge of medicine beat any practitioners of systemic medicine and Ayurveda hollow. In fact, we had a debate in which their knowledge of taxonomy was completely worsted by these people. And uh, in the same way, we had uh, festivals. Instead of spending money in inviting uh, 2,000 artists to Delhi, Republic Day, and spending uh, 50 lakhs of rupees, we used to hold our event in the midst of them where it was taking place. Now in Himachal Pradesh, for instance, there is an entire ritual in which the, tribal, the local tribal community uh, you see hierarchy and the feudal hierarchy. Now there are these uh, princes and princes, I don't see them. I mean, uh, Jubal uh, uh, princess was also, I mean, uh, my friend. I mean, so her, uh, uh, her husband was my uh, coach during my training. So uh, there was a regular ritual in that festival, how the reception was to be organized, which senior god would receive which junior god, how it is to be done, and then, uh, so we just went there and celebrated with them. Expenditure was minimal and gain was maximal. We built our museum with the artifacts they presented, the dresses they gave, this is like that. I mean, so you see, I mean, as soon as one thinks of it as a capital intensive, material intensive project, nothing is done. And that is how the government normally works. Government as a inquiet entity. But if you think uh, through it, then it's different. I think right there is a possible area of collaboration because I resonate with the previous speaker, his thoughts on public money, et cetera. And I'm not a big fan of taking public money uh, because it never really seems to, uh, you know. Strings attached to it. <laughs> well, not only strings, but even those strings are fragile. You know? <laughs> they don't last. Um, but I think there is something to be said over here uh, because we do a lot of work with the community exactly in the same way you've uh, spoken about it now. Uh, the challenge we have is, uh, well, uh, the challenge we have is that 
it's not just a question of one community. It's not just the musicians or the Pabuji Ka Pad performers that I'm working with in Rajasthan, because across India, and I think the challenge we have, and you might be a good person, is to really have some kind of a conclave of folk and traditional and tribal uh, artists, musicians, craftspeople, which is not about government. And maybe it moves, like you're suggesting, that we take it to the people. Yeah. But I think something like that is yeah. required, because if policy has to emerge, or any shift or change has to emerge, it has to emerge ground up and not top down. Sure. Now, you spoke about Rajasthan. Now, I don't see any of the princes and princesses around, isn't it? They have all left. Uh, so I am addressing them in absentia. Well, this will be recorded, sir, so <laughs> we will So I am addressing them in absentia. You see, they were talking about uh, uh, painting, some of them, not all of them. And they were talking about, uh, uh, you see, uh, uh, miniatures and, you know. But they left out a whole lot of, you know, uh, things which they should know about and they must be knowing about better than I do. For one thing, all these uh, uh, things which were created by the royalty, in those days uh, land was abandoned, it was at their disposal. So they created it as an environmental envelope of great quality with a core buffer multiple use surround policy with lakes, water bodies, uh, and uh, organic, uh, organically evolved structures, etc. So none of those lakes and uh, water bodies which are undergoing eutrophication have been, have been discussed. And uh, nor have they discussed, you know, the families of artists, like uh, the Sioux family. I mean, there are entire pilgrim records which have been consulted. I mean, the Panda Bahis to uh, work out the uh, you see, family history. Now, uh, those families are still around. You connect with them and uh, revitalize, uh, you see, uh, and that doesn't require money. These are people who work for pittance. That's all I can say. And uh, uh, then uh, there, is, uh, uh, there are these texts. You see, all these texts, whether it is Rasika Priya or whether it is Vishabhallava, and the Devi Mahatmya, they have been directly uh, used uh, for all these miniature paintings. Now, where is that textual knowledge? The context is lost, the text is lost, so it is easy to revitalize with the uh, practitioners of the text and the reciters of the context, and the, both of them. So, it needs a kind of a confederation. So, uh, uh, of equal participating uh, uh, partners without any leader, just a steers person. I mean, uh, all the princely families, if they still have access to a lot of, you know, ideological resources, if they just get together and network and uh, just uh, indulge in ecotourism, mm. apart from ecotourism, this will also revitalize the skills. So all that is possible. And uh, uh, it is possible for them to do it. We can act only as catalytic agents. Uh I see you as a person who is uh, most important for me to ask this, answer, uh, this question because <clears throat> you have been on both the sides. You have been on the government side, you know the uh, limitations, challenges and the strength what a uh, government can do as well as you know what is needed. So when we from the art fraternity uh, want to go to government, we see a lot of challenges. But you guide us that which is the way forward for us because resources are needed whether you talk of these princesses and maharanis they also talk of taking support from government because resources are limited with them as well when you talk of csr not many corporates are interested in doing all this so resources are needed and we also see that despite small small initiatives taken by many of different people there is still a, a dearth of work that needs to be done is huge First of all, I feel that there is no mapping itself of the art, different art forms from India, folk, performance, whatever. Even uh, Bratokatha is huge in, uh, in Bengal. The Alpana, it's huge in Bengal. There are 30, 40 kinds of Bratokatha and every Bratokatha has a dedicated Alpana. So there is, this all is huge. Now you uh, guide us that where to start because when it comes to, first of all, mapping, that should be the first step. 
we need resources, we need connection because one has to really go into the villages, go in the community and start mapping. So what is the right way to go ahead and how to even, uh, I know we all are together, but at the same time we need more resources than what we have. Can I also add, I mean, I think what's emerging here, and it's quite nice that, you know, it's just a few of us left, um, is that in the absence of government policy, which is holistic in nature, I mean, it's looking at certain art forms, it's ignoring a whole range of other art forms, et cetera, and also uh, things that are related to the arts ecosystem. Perhaps that is some tangible outcome where even within our, with your expertise, with your expertise, with the others that are gathered here, an outcome could be that we begin to um, articulate uh, where we are and perhaps network the organizations, even those ones that were here today, and look at certain basic principles. And it could be a white paper that we create here at KCC, which we can then disseminate. And I think that's a really good starting point. Um, and of course, uh, I'd like your thoughts on that. Are you asking me or are you uh, suggesting? Well, I mean, see, you have exhibitions. This is an exhibition space, a fine space. Now, for me, uh, exhibition is not a matter of aesthetic contemplation. It is an action instrument. So I have always, I mean, there is something about traveling exhibitions. So I have carried secret go of exhibitions uh, to Biraj Pet in uh, Kurg and revitalize the temple sacred groves just by showing them that this is what, they, what is possible for them to do. And uh, in the same way, I have carried uh, uh, water harvesting structures exhibition and revitalized them. A Kanat in Burhanpur, for instance, I mean, Ridge Valley approach. I mean, entire environmental engineering approaches are there which are uh, more location efficient, more thermally efficient than big dam structures. So, very little money is required. It is, it is the community participative approach. You see, you work with the community and you, uh, uh, it is possible to do uh, in a labor intensive manner what you can never achieve with, uh, with the capital intensive inputs. So that is possible. Demonstrations can be given. It's uh, so interesting that you say that because I was in a conversation just last week where there's talk of uh, Sursagar and the, the building near Mehrangar Fort, which is to be made into a museum or next to it, where I said it should be a workspace. Anyway, you know, there are, and I work a lot in Rajasthan with the folk performers. So I'm speaking from that, but I also do a lot of theater work, but that's separate. You know, there were recordings made of the masters, the traditional masters in the musical traditions of Rajasthan many, many years ago, 40 years ago. Then after that, uh, other people have done archives are sitting in Delhi, etc. So there is that material. But the artists themselves, the younger artists, don't have access to it. Right? Yeah. Now, at one time, people got funding from places like the Ford Foundation, etc., to go and record these artists. But the artists got very little out of it. And now the legacy is also lost, right? I love the, what you're talking about, regeneration. It'll come up again in my talk tomorrow because I think more than anything, revitalization, regeneration, and letting those people know what is theirs in a way of facilitating that, I think is the way to go ahead. But, but, and here's the challenge. Even the funders who we talked to, and I'm wondering that white paper that Shwetal was talking about, maybe we need to have a perspective to funders like the EU. I know of a project that is currently underway in Kolkata. I was called in and I eventually refused. There was a huge sum of money given to an agency for the benefit of 25,000 performing artists in phase one to then move to 50,000 performing artists in phase two. But phase one was so disappointing because there was no way in which the funders could tell what the benefit was and they were told that the benefit was intangible. So I was called in as a consultant to help rectify 
massive project, huge sums of money. And I was like, but why did you even start the project if you don't even know what constitutes a benefit to a performing artist and you've already committed to scaling up to 50,000 and now you want to rectify it so at least the 50,000 has some benefit to it. So even the funding age, and I'm talking about like funders like the EU, right? Because they see stuff on paper. Now, of course, I can go catch the agency by the neck and say, hey, shape up. But what we can do, if it's possible, is to seek some meetings like that. Once that white paper or some such thing comes out, take an audience and let them know that, hey, you are putting in, I mean, the number of times UNESCO has tried to do mapping. Sorry. I'd like to add something here. First of all, I thoroughly agree with what you are saying. I think a lot of times, uh, you know, I've worked with crafts. I have an archive that most people uh, who are doing their PhDs, they come to check on the archives. There's 7,000 books. There's about 11,000 journals. It's absolutely free to the public. And I've noticed, and this is my reading, and I'm, I thoroughly agree with your thought, that most of us, we start with the premise that uh, we need an X amount of money. But the ideal scenario is that if you move from the fact of you know, uh, getting them to us and, and in fact getting us to them, the entire journey is different. And it's far simpler. And coming back to what you were saying, is that, you know, when we work with organizations, even when we do your white paper and everything, what we generally tend to forget, we get so altruistic and so, so high thinking in what we want to achieve, that we are not able to prove to the fact that what impact we will actually, it's, it's the whole story of saying that, you know, we'll, we'll say less and deliver more, but the entire you know, the fact of being setting up proposals in most of fields works at the premise that we promise more and we deliver less. So, and then each of that creates a, a spiral for getting less money out of the same people, because especially with foreign agencies, because for them impact is far greater and far more, has to be far more measurable for them to even think to take a step. Yes. So, you know, even if we do something, that's an interesting thing. If it can't be replicated with one process to the other, and it's that much far easier. I mean, and there's just my two bit on this. I mean, I thought I liked. That's a very good point. Kalyanji, if we can conclude, Thanks maybe you will make, yeah, for now, and of course, we'll continue this discussion. I think there's been a lot of very interesting uh, I, things. I will come back tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, you see, uh, um, the entire power structure of culture uh, look at the buying of art itself, how it has shifted from Europe to America, how this uh, museum culture, gallery culture, everything is American, and uh, how artists are hungry I mean, to sell art to some of these galleries. And uh, the American policy of cultural restitution is confined to return of grave goods to Apaches and to, you know, Hopis, etc. Cultural restitution does not consist in return of objects, but in revitalization of the habitat, which they have uh, beggared. So, uh, I mean, I have come back to Kolkata after five decades. I have no authority here, no connections. I am not a, anybody in the government. But then people seek advice. So the University of Vidyasagar University and other universities, they have been seeking advice. I told them that you deconstruct the university. You make it into a multiversity. With the same money, you go out to the communities. You have 50 colleges. Let every college have a, a project with the hinterland community. The same money which you are investing in a theoretical discussion, invest it in a hinterland project-oriented student project, a faculty project. So they're doing it. And now uh, Mosh, um, uh, Moshruti is working with uh, theater. I told her that we are also working with forum theater, participative theater. 
resistance, resistance theater, theater of resistance. All these communities in Sundarban and Kurilia, they are doing it without money. All you do is to get joined to them and strengthen yourself. That's all. That's all. So it is happening in a small way in the absence of any uh, uh, input or support. Shall I wait for uh, the manna to fall from the heaven? I think we end on that question. <laughs> Okay, we have two sessions left. Thank you for your patience, everybody. Um, so, session eight. A powerful medium of traveling exhibition can become an agent of change for creating a space for dialogues and debates on environment and climate change. And we have Saket Singh Korov. He's a physicist by training. Mr. Kurov has been a research fellow at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai, and a curator at the National Council of Science Museums, headquartered here in Calcutta. He is a curator with over a decade of experience in conceptualizing, designing, developing, and coordinating thematic and traveling science exhibitions educational programs and activities for the public in general and students and teachers, and particularly the dissemination of science and technology. So we're very honored to have you here with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you everyone for such a wonderful start from today, early morning, I should say. And uh, I'm very much thankful to the team of KCC and all the organizer including our council is also supporting as one of the partners for this great initiative, which is led by the team of KCC. Am I audible? Yes. yes. Hello. Yes, you're, Hello. you are audible. You are audible yeah. very clearly. Thank yeah. you. Because I'm seeing oh, a blank chair here, so the little bit, uh, just a minute, so yeah. Okay. So let's resume our discussion. So very interestingly, and I'm very happy that uh, I was given this responsibility by my council to be a part of this wonderful initiative under the very, very, very appropriate theme, Vasudev Kutumbukam. We as an Indian definitely has whole connection with this very important concept, which whole world is really seriously coming out. Our planet is the only planet and we are one family. And this has to be re rejuvenated the whole concept. So in this today's session, uh, being a curator, in different places, in, at national level, regional level, and district level, and uh, we have headquarter in Calcutta, in Salt Lake, uh, Sector 5 and Bedlam Museum Science City. And uh, actually, I'm going to talk about a traveling exhibition, which is a very important mode of communications in the field of science museums, science centers, because it travels. So I'll, I'll talk about a traveling exhibition which we curated at uh, Nehru Science Center Mumbai when I was there. So this responsibility was tasked by our council. Every year, before COVID era, every year our council choose uh, some topics, select uh, some subject based on the relevance within our society as far as science, technology, and innovation and awareness are concerned. So from those particular selective committees, we decide a theme. So in 2012, when United Nations driven approach was adopted by the Planet Under Pressure Conference, the conference was an outcome of discussions which were Took, which took place actually after so many IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. So the Planet Under Pressure Conference led involvement of science museums, science centers across the world. So similarly, our council adopted this approach and we chose a subject, Planet Under Pressure. And we were given this responsibility in Mumbai, when I was in Mumbai at Nehru Science Center, Mumbai. Presently, I'm at uh, Regional Science Center, Bhopal. So why this traveling exhibition is very important, uh, and as I chose this topic, that it can be a change for creating a new space for dialogues and debates. 
And as a storyteller, because in Science Center, Science Museum, being a curator, we always believe we are a, a storyteller. We are bringing different scientific outcomes, research-based, driven-based data, peer-reviewed work in a, in a manner which can be understood by the public or general masses, more, more precisely, I should say. And what sort of method we should utilize to make it more impactful. So the one thing which is very quite uh, clear and has proven record that traveling exhibition has that power, it travels across different, different places in our country based on the pre-decided schedule. So this Planet Under Pressure was a planet, planet Under Pressure exhibition was such an uh, initiative where we had to address how this global changes are affecting our mother earth. And as we all know, we are very much uh, concerned about future sustainability. And I think that is the severe concern for United Nations, various committees, various intergovernmental policy uh, driven divisions and under the IPCC also, that now is a unison time. Sharing our vision, sharing our thoughts with each other and findings and research and more important above all, creating a conducive environment for taking on board our society or different different stakeholders. So that is the prime concern. And I think this is also a suitable uh, framework for this conference also. That's why we are fitting in this conference and we are thankful. So let's start. I'm, I'm going to share my presentation to give you a, a, an overview how we design. Then in the end for a few minutes, we will have a Q&A session. Um, whether my presentation is visible? Uh, it's still showing as sh started to share, not shared. I think yeah, now we can see. Okay, this one. Uh, but I can't see this one. Yesterday we tried, it was working now. Uh, can we share from here instead then? No, I can see at least, uh, uh, but uh, I cannot see on in Zoom. Just a minute, ma'am. Okay, we can see the presentation. Okay, so when I'm changing slides, yeah. Okay, thank you. So a powerful medium of traveling exhibition can become an agent of change for creating a space for dialogues and debates. And we are talking about 2013. And if we started curating this exhibition and we were able to launch in March 2014. And through this exhibition, we realized that bringing on both different uh, stakeholders, mainly for science centers are uh, school students, college students, and teachers, and general public. So this exhibition was one such important initiative other than other environmental uh, driven educational programs and activities which our council has been doing through our different science centers. And uh, this exhibition was directly an outcome of the discussion, as I mentioned, that was the Planet Under Presser Conference. So in this exhibition, we try to address very important alarming areas. I think most of you may be familiar with these areas, but from a school's point of view, from teacher's point of view, how they can take this message with them while going back, to, or not every message, maybe one important message that we are the change. Actually, we are the driver of the change. So that was the intention of this exhibition. Here you can see, long short pictures just for a glimpse and uh, here you can see we we have artists in our science centers we basically they work with us for our science driven themes and subjects and technology so we chose this central exhibit earth as a ball and human hands we are pressing the planet under earth planet under pressure means our planet earth is under severe alarming the rate is under pressure threat i should say threatening because of various changes so this was the central theme of the exhibition then geological epoch and different different 
uh, it is, I should say, areas which I'll come to discuss one by one very quickly. And from here, you can see we started from Asokan Rock, uh, addicts, and then in the end, the greenhouse gas, ocean acidification, and uh, mother nature change in biodiversity, food, bears, how we are making our species, our non-human species, I must say, not homo sapiens. We are also bringing more severe impact in their lifestyle and their survival also. So, and in the, in the last, we discussed about why we should care and take severe actions. In so, severe in a sense that it is a time for action rather than discussing and debating. Because planning and execution both are very important initiative in this direction. Sorry, just for the power cut. Yeah. So in this exhibition, we started from the genesis why we need to sensitize this very important subject so that every visitor who is going to visit uh, this exhibition will take active part in this discussions through our interactive exhibits. And we chose to start with the Asokan rock addicts because Asokan rock addicts were the earliest time frame available uh, evidence that mother nature protection was not new to India. Actually, since the ages, we have this practice in our very culture, how to make our mother earth more protective and also biodiversity. Also, uh, I mean, also the jungle and other uh, species like animals, birds, and in, during Ahsoka era, few of the species were banned to kill. So those particular masses were on uh, rock addicts. So we chose that subject to present and start with, and then very famous line, every earth has enough to feed for everyone's uh, need, not for everyone's greed, by our the great Mahatma Gandhi's prophetic visionary quote. And uh, that was the start of the exhibition. Then we discussed about the cycles because each and every area of our art system matters. For example, air, water, land, and light. Why we were building this initial dialogue uh, in our exhibition? Because first of all, we need to understand and make a connection with the earth system. Then how scientific evidence based on uh, satellite imagery, based on uh, ground-based uh, data, ship-based data, how we have been changing this whole ecosystem were presented in a different manner. Here, how this industrial revolution was very much critical factor in the human history, on the whole human history on this planet Earth. Why it was a shaping moment in the human history, because after it is considered after 1950s onwards, the very sea change in different uh, parameters were noticed. Before that, Earth was having not that steep change in temperature and other greenhouse gases. But this industrial revolution was very instrumental for pressurizing or accelerating those uh, parameters which were not, and I should say, which are not healthy for our planet. But every success, especially the development, also comes with some sort of challenges for planet Earth. So we need to understand we are a single family if we are doing something, and now it is no more we are doing in isolation. Our mother Earth is going to be affected because human, earlier speaker, sir, has mentioned that as an Anthropocene era. Definitely, this is a big debate and centralized discussion point at uh, appropriate level internationally, but whether we should correctly point out this Anthropocene age or era because human intervention making a change in planet's future fate. And the sustainability will depend on our course of action. So that's why this was very instrumental part and we collaborated internationally with different institutions and research organizations. And uh, while of curating our story, they have also supported with uh, graphical representations and documentary films and data, which may be very, crucial as a proactive element for the exhibition. So that 
whoever is visiting exhibition may connect at different levels. Then alarming a very important factor, global temperature, carbon dioxide, uh, carbon dioxide, CO2 emission, and also the very serious concern, as we all know, the large chunk of our global population are living near sea coastal regions, I have to say, coastal regions. So rising sea level is also a very critical factor to be taken into account and temperature, CO2 emission, and rising sea level. These three are very critical factor which are actually making more alarming situation for all of us to understand that we should come out with some sustainable mechanism by sharing our visions, by sharing our thoughts, coming together in internationally, coming together in different cultures, as a stakeholder, society, government, policy makers, every one of us should come on same page that is necessary to make our planet sustainable in long future. Because now the time has come where we are actually crossing the limit. The limit, that means whether this planet can be restored or not, that time frame will decide. For example, we are in 2022, but this decade is very crucial for all of us, for all the development, for cultural growth, for our societal uh, survival, our needs and mother nature safety, but above all, as a whole planet, the planet Earth safety. And even this year's upcoming in World Environment Day has a theme, the only Earth. And the theme is very critical. We have the only planet Earth which is having life so far in this unending cosmos. I'm very much familiar because we are living on this planet. But we don't know about any other celestial space as of now that life is harboring. So protecting Mother Earth is very serious concern and we should take part in diverse dialogues, discussion, cultural exchanges and ideation. So this three, these three factors were very critical and I think for everyone, the concern is temperature. As we have been noticing and also observing that Earth has experienced severely in last few years and few decades, warming years. Since 1990, almost 10 years were warming in different, different time frame. And again, this year, we have observed April was much warmer than the previous, uh, I should say, April temperatures scale. So these all are in indicating that our Earth is shifting, is actually is a ecological balance, is a biosphere, is a climate, uh, natural climate shift is now no more natural. So these three factors will always be important for our discussions. Here in Earthland, how Earth is changing shape because of human intervention. We are making industry, uh, developing societies, building new cities, expanding ourselves. So coastal reasons, you can see, and indirect evidence also, we are changing the landscape because of our expansion and also indirect evidence from satellite imagery, we realize that also, there are some big uh, areas of sea are sinking, sinking, shrinking, and also going uh, down. And they are now no more like the way they were earlier. So these evidence are very, very uh, threatening as far as sustainability is concerned. And that's why the partnership goal is very important that we should act now and it should be in our local language, regional languages, in our cultural practices, we should adopt that Mother Earth's safety and sustainability is all of our role and responsibility. We also addressed very important uh, element in this exhibition, ocean acidification. Why? Because we know our Earth's atmos atmosphere is playing critical role for harboring life on this planet. But at the same time, our sea is behaving, our oceans are behaving like a regulator, temperature regulator. But we are adding more carbon dioxide or other uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and they are coming back to the sea. 
and these gases, especially the CO2, is trying to destroy the very ecologically natural balance of marine life and other associated life forms in the sea. So this ocean acidification is making a very, very uh, critical situation for survival of marine-based life and ecological balances under the sea. That is also a big challenge because indirectly, they are all marine life like coral reef. And as we know from the scientific literature and scientific studies that most of the part across the world, uh, the coral reefs are now are not in healthy shape. More than 60 to 70 percent coral reefs are affected by the indirect uh, climate change impact on that. Ocean acidification is one part of that uh, direct evidence of climate, uh, climate change. Here, coastal environment, as we all know, Dubai is one of the greatest examples that they built the largest man-made structure in, in near the coastal region, which clearly shows how we are shaping our coastal uh, or sea relationship. We are changing a natural habitat into man-made, and that will definitely have a longer impact in future. And we know that glaciers are melting. We will, I'll come to that point in later panel areas in this exhibition only because we call panels. Here, biodiversity, in this panel you can see in this area, we discussed about why this is in crisis because everything is interconnected. Whether one life form or human species or our mother nature's ecological balance, which is a natural shift, now is no more natural. It is being shifted because of our intervention through our industrialization. We are building more industries, transports based our machinery, emitting more harmful gases. And also we are not protecting from the, uh, you, I, could, I should say, green economy point of view that we are emitting, which are which is not actually healthy for this uh, balance. So this was the point in, uh, point of discussion in this area. Here, food webs, as we know, as I mentioned earlier, ocean acidification is a really critical factor for uh, for the species which are in the sea, in the oceans, different different uh, part of the world. They, they are affected by this change. So when we are breaking the link of any food waves, definitely then we are going to change the course of connection with food waves in future as well. So this change in food waves because of this damage of due to climate and other global changes, where climate change is one part, is definitely a uh, serious matter of concern. And we also noticed, earlier speakers are also mentioned, and I, I, our exhibition also addressed, endangered species. We noticed, and according to the research, we are a part of sixth extinction. And there are indirect and few direct evidences also, which clearly indicates that most of the species are now and other medium also affecting their survival. That's why they are not in a position to cope up with the environment and that's why their species is losing sustainability and they are losing their chain in the system and they are becoming extinct. And we also discussed about the very important species and their connection with the nature and their real uh, status in 2014 in collaboration with International Union of uh, which actually, the, which is the actual organization which takes care of uh, classification of the endangered species around the world. We also address very important in this uh, point, food. Can our planet feed all of us? Definitely, it's a very big question. And as a food security, one of the important areas for United Nations also, as a part of SDG, that food security matters for all of us. But uh, are we producing sufficient food? I think as of now, uh, quite a bit, yes, but whether everybody is getting sufficient food, this is a big question mark here. We have hunger, 
very, very uh, challenging a problem across the world and also over wet problem. We are noticing in few decades that uh, this excessive eating habits also, this, this actually not healthy spirit. And the very important element which came out, came out, uh, out of this uh, analogy, analogy that production of food, processing, distributing, and consuming. In the whole process, if this management is not proper, then also we may create a problem of sufficient food supply. So we need to think about it because actually more food we will produce, definitely we need more agricultural land, definitely we need more pesticide and other sort of technology to make more uh, uh, fertilizing land that will definitely have some indirect effect on our climate. So this is interconnected world now. So this exhibition was a small step towards such challenging uh, uh, effects on our mother earth. So, but these points are very important part of debates also. Pollution, very critical, water, air, or land. We are very much confident that we are polluting. I think nobody can say now that we are not polluting. In some way or other, if we are not uh, cautious about our habits and practices, then whatever material we are using in our daily life or day-to-day -day life, actually, it may not be healthy for our planet. Whatever we are leaving behind, or plastic, or any garbage which is made of some material which is not biodegraded, biodegradable, then definitely it is not healthy for planet Earth. And pollution is a big concern. Air pollution, and we, data suggests that millions of lives across the globe are also going because of this air pollution-driven uh, diseases. And, I, and as we all know in the conference, I think uh, everybody will also accept that in India, we have been seriously observing such scenario in Delhi also. So it is a very big concern for all of us. Global surface temperature, definitely. It is a very big concern from 1980, 1880 onwards till 2022. What we have noticed that Earth's temperature has increased by 0.85 degrees Celsius. This is based on the scientific data. Uh, observed ground-based sensors and definitely then satellite imagery and other sources, it clearly indicates that it is making a big uh, impact on glaciers because glaciers are a repository of our, uh, you know, drinkable water, healthy water which is coming down to the sea through rivers and we are losing uh, our ice cap. So it is a big alarming thing as far as temperature is concerned. And this rise in temperature is definitely a big concern for rising sea level. You can see in the right here, sea level rise. And as data suggests that most of the, I think most of the continents, there are few percentages of uh, very advanced uh, developed cities will also come under attack because of this rising sea level as predicted by 2100. Few uh, 1.4 meter, 0.4 or higher meter sea level will rise and that will affect the coastal portion. And it is because of this temperature. So this, these two are interconnected. So now we have come across that every critical factor which were earlier were in isolation for our research, we thought this is no more now in their silos. Every part of uh, every part of fact, uh, I should say, every part of areas of research like temperature, like uh, carbon emission, like which we call car, car, um, greenhouse gas emissions or sea level rise or nitrogen based uh, rise, every parameters are increasing. And we have noticed the actual increase is very much accelerating after 1950s. That is the time frame when we actually started with faster growth as far as industrialization is concerned. And that is affecting our mother earth. That is why we call the great acceleration, including all these parameters. And then the down of agriculture. We had a very good start for our survival as a human, we started, we actually spread it. The data suggests that how human species, homo, the current modern human 
we spread it across the globe, then we started deforestation, then using land in form of agriculture, producing more for our need. So every sort of change is affecting this global ecosystem. And those what's presented here as a global change, you can see here, these are very interactive tools here. Interactive tools, a visitor can interact with most of the exhibits and they can see the change here in this exhibit, in the Great Acceleration, the Great Acceleration exhibit. There is a very critical image, very old 1911 images and the modern images of the, the region of Himalaya, which shows that melting of glacier. Here in Global Changes, we have interactive kiosk where we can uh, infer the information which are uh, based on scientific data and in form of graphics and multimedia. And then for participation, quiz was very much instrumental. And we noticed that quiz is very, quiz is very essential element of any exhibition, whether it's a traveling or uh, thematic, um, stationary, I should say, in science center, science museums, because this gives a motivation for students and general public to take active participation and in playful manner, they're trying to understand what is all about that exhibition. In a uh, simple, I should say, in a simple word, this may be a takeaway experience for them. And in the last, we address the call for action. Why we as a humanity uh, should seriously think about this is a time for action. And definitely, still after a few years, we realize that still there are few scopes in, in future where we have to really implement. And I think on a uni, at a unison level across the globe, we have not started uh, as far as implementation, implementation is concerned globally. The Science Center as a storyteller is very important place in our society because we are not a stand taker place. We are actually a storyteller and new, we all always put whatever science typically society is having before them so that they can understand and take away and dialogues can be started. The conclusion was very important and even for the conference and this presentation also, I want to point out that we need to understand that whatever diversity, cultural exchanges, ideas, participation, we are talking, but actually for implementing all of them, we need to start with from very, very lowest state of society. It doesn't matter from, fund, from where funding is coming or who is going to fund, but it, it is the time where we should all come on board and in our own individual capacity, we should contribute to that uh, cause. Because where, whatever we are going to achieve in future, definitely it will be based on our mother's survival, mother earth survival. Actually, this is the oh, this is the the home in our universe. Whatever we are talking about, future interplanetary species, we are going to live on Mars or in space or any other celestial object. But more important, this planet has to be protected. For that, we have to make it really. A Vasudev Kutumbakam philosophy in action mode. That is why we are very much thankful this conference has given this opportunity to us and especially my counsel to me to present this work here. In addition to exhibits or traveling exhibitions, we do a lot of educational programs concerning environment, climate, and related areas. So in Bhopal, in last year on 5th June, we had a very, this very impactful uh, planet dis uh, panel discussion on reimagine, recreate, and restore. This was also based on the survival of Mother Earth. And here you can see we had a speakers from Manite, Manit, Modern Ajad National Institute of Technology, NITTR, IIT Bombay, and one from Japan. She was also very much part of IPCC report. All three speakers top were part of IPCC report earlier. So we try to present our say in our society. We know we are a very small entity, but we are the space, I should say, where this dialogue can be triggered. And conferences like this is a very important opportunity to come on board for 
discussing with different cultural background expertise. We are really very thrilled and thankful that we have been given this opportunity. On the last, I, would, I want to say that now is the time for urgent action to achieve a healthy planet. But this sentence should not be sentenced for every conference. Implementation is now very, very important and critical. On this note, thank you from my end. And I'm very much open for the uh, Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sekhat. And it was really en enlightening. I'll uh, open the floor to the audience for question. And before we ask them uh, any question, I have one uh, query myself that I want to ask you is that, uh, because since the morning we had a lot of audience here, uh, local audience and school audience. Uh, when I uh, spoke with them in person, I felt that they all wanted to ask questions, but when we asked them in public, they were uh, shying away from asking questions. One of the reasons I felt was the language barrier, because not everybody is confident in the uh, English language, and that becomes a barrier because articulation of question and answer is difficult. So I saw even your exhibition is in uh, English completely. So how do you bridge the gap? Because this, uh, this is not something that only English-speaking people can really contribute to in, uh, in making a change, which is needed today when we have our house help at home and we see them uh, just leaving the tap open without any concern that water is flowing so th the education has to be at that level as well so what is your thought on that very good question and i should uh, really appreciate that you brought this point in this discussion actually this exhibition whatever images we have been using here actually it is from our nehru science center mumbai when this exhibition where this exhibition was launched and that these pictures were during the launch at that place and we had a 45 day schedule. But every time we try to make our exhibition bilingual from the place of origin. For example, it is originated in Science City, so it will have uh, English and Bangla. And then in if it's south in Bengaluru, our Business Free and Industrial Technology Museum, it may be having English and Kannad. And, and similarly, wherever we are in Maharashtra, in Mumbai, it will be in actually either in uh, English or Hindi or in Marathi. So our, most of the exhibits are having uh, their labels in Marathi. And this is one point you are talking about the language. The second point, the label of language. Because writing is a big art and we can make our writing very complicated and very difficult to comprehend. So we as a science center is always learning, trying to understand how to make our level of engagement uh, with our visitors in their own world, in their own world of access. It should not have too much literary writing so that they cannot connect. Because your question was related to connect. Language is first thing, we may create a barrier. And every time, I think this is a serious concern, whenever we discuss whatever conferences we uh, organize across the globe, uh, we see a one international common language so that everybody can understand. But in our country, we are diversity and cultural diversity, I should say, is very abundant. And we have a different languages and cultural imbibe. So our regional, yeah, local connect language is very important on above all. We believe not only Hindi, Bangla, Marathi, even the dialect. So like our education training, we have a trainee, uh, the post, we actually take uh, for a year or two for our gradu science graduates and we train them. So they actually explain, for example, Bangla, literally Bangla may be different, literally Hindi may be different, but in their own way of understanding, we are explaining. That is the big challenge we have been uh, facing and we are trying to address. And I think that is much needed because content may be good or may, may not be good also. But the storytelling in their own, at, at their own level is, should be good, or I should say, it should be best. So that the connect should not be uh, lost. Yeah, I hope I answered your question. Thank you so much. I'll leave uh, it to the audience to ask any question. Uh, Kalyanji, you have had experience with museums and you've seen what NCSM uh, has put together as a traveling exhibition. So uh, what's your comment on that? Well, um, I have been associated with the Science Museum movement since uh, the time of Saroj Ghosh. Uh, I've sat with him in the uh, Bilda Science and Technology 
um, lab and museum also, and I have seen it grow. And the biggest uh, achievement of this uh, movement is its museum bus. In fact, the museum bus is the best, uh, you see, uh, communication medium which they have evolved, and it can travel to remote uh, hinterland communities and uh, uh, educate them. And uh, I only hope that uh, that is being done in uh, local languages. And the second thing is that ultimately, the idea is not only to educate, but also to induce change. So therefore, uh, this uh, uh, should also be carried uh, to the parliament, premises of the parliament, and the policy makers, and the bureaucrats, I mean, who uh, are responsible for environment and forestry and for policy making, the Lok Sabha channel, etc., is very vital. Otherwise, you know, I mean, uh, what is happening is that uh, all this uh, knowledge is being disseminated, but there is no policy change. And the second thing is, you know, this uh, divide between uh, social and natural sciences. You see, I mean, uh, uh, um, uh, this entire, you see, knowledge divide is unfortunate. And uh, uh, ultimately, unless we, uh, uh, you see, uh, uh, animate uh, social sciences with objectivity and natural sciences with uh, social concern, unless we combine, you know, the uh, economic and the social rate of return in your uh, work, I mean, we don't achieve much. So it is very important that uh, even this initiative of education and dissemination, I mean, looks into uh, bridging that divide. I mean, how to uh, socialize uh, the sciences and how to uh, objectify the uh, social sciences. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. thank you, thank you so much, sir. And uh, I also attended your session. So I think uh, you are po you are pointing very important point for uh, science museum, science center fraternity. And you mentioned our Dr. Ghosh's name. He is the father figure in the science museum movement in our country. I'm really thankful to you for making such important uh, point. As we know, science, technology, and society, or science and society. I think there is a, this is a time where we should bridge this gap with diverse uh, cultural uh, backgrounds. Like this conference, we have different people from different areas. So somebody is discussing ecology, somebody is discussing uh, art form. Sir, you mentioned a very important thing uh, related to your experience in the state of Madhya Pradesh also. And then uh, I'm on behalf of my council's recommendation, and uh, I'm talking about my uh, VR exhibition, Planet Under Pressure. And you correctly mentioned very highly uh, uh, rewarded uh, music, uh, mobile science exhibition bus, which we call Musobus which is very, very flexible program for our council, and we are uh, reaching to the people in their own languages, sir. We are not using English only. So that is why it is very big change. And uh, thank you for your suggestion for policy makers, sir. And you're the one, actually, who will help us to reach at that level, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'll invite last question from Gurudas because Gurudas, you are an ecologist yourself, and I would like to ask you what role do you see uh, in an organization like National Council of Science Museums playing in uh, making change? I think uh, um, it is time to realize that education happens beyond schools. And museums are an absolutely wonderful source of education. And the way we structure our museums, the way students will come and experience everything in the museum is what will make that education far more reinforcing. Because that is a learning which the students are doing on their own. There's nobody, it, it's not a I teach you learn, but you walk into the museum, you experience it, and that is real education. That is the education which are tribal communities have been giving to their uh, children for such a long time. And that is the reason why, you know, the, the Devrais, the sacred groves that Dr. Kalyan talked about have been conserved. You walk into a sacred grove, it's a museum. You get, it's a gene bank. It's a 1,000 year old relic forest. You see the species which were not in existence. There are senior people from your tribe which are telling you about the medicinal benefits. And that to me is like a real museum. I absolutely echo what Dr. Kalyan talked about, how a museum could be actually transformed into an educational institute. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Saikit, for joining us today. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, ma'am.
thank you everyone and thank you sir i don't know your name but you are very much uh, instrumental in creating a new dialogue space you are sitting side by arina ji but thank you everyone thank you yeah that's dr shwetal patel he is the co curator of this conference from the very very beginning of uh, wonderful initiative and nicely done sir thank you so much we have our last speaker today so just one more session uh dr shubha majumdar his topic is environment and heritage a case study on terracotta temple of bengal dr shubha majumdar is currently working as superintending archaeologist at the archaeology survey of india asi kolkata circle he is a young promising scholar in the field of archaeology art and iconography His doctoral research was on Jainism in ancient Bengal from the Department of Archaeology, University of Kolkata. He has several research papers and two books to his credit. Shubha has received a number of awards for his work, including the Jaina Purutava Prana Award and Sanskriti Award for his works in the field of Jain art, archaeology, and heritage. Over to you, Shubha. thank you first of all on behalf of archaeological survey of india i thank you to kolkata center for creativity for organizing such type of wonderful uh, seminar on vasudevam kutumbakam and also uh, a, as a part of the seminar archaeological survey of india is also associated with kolkata center for uh, creativity for this seminar and uh, i think that on this topic uh, archaeological survey of india is one of the prime organization to protect and conserve the archaeological heritage all over the india and uh, we have presently 3696 temples and monuments and sites protected by asi and we face very much problem to from the environmental uh, effect that is due to the uh, present day globalization and uh, others uh, environmental uh, problem then uh, several temple or monument affected and uh, as a result i try to highlight it the some of the issues uh, on the basis of uh, our case study uh, in kalna that is the uh, group of temple located in purva bardhaman and bishnupur group of temple under the archaeological survey of india kolkata circle we have presently 86 monument and sites and this two group of temple is our one of the prime uh, monument which asi kolkata circle protected and i try to brief my uh, topic that the environmental impact assessment is an important methodology to analyze the trend of damage that has occurred on our archaeological monument so the, uh, the there are different types of environmental effect which create several problem over our archaeological monument and in the recent uh, last last 5 uh, 4 5 years we face uh, several issues like cracks uh, the deterioration of the terracotta plaques day by day very fast and as a result we try to uh, study uh, particularly in micro area basis micro micro area basis to uh, collect the data that what type of the effect what type of the uh, environmental problem we face in like in kalna and other part is the bishnupur uh, which is not uh, the both the, the two center is uh, different uh, on the basis of his uh, environmental partially different on the basis of his environmental but uh, the causes of the terracotta plaques both in terra bishnupur and kalna is same that uh, the 
kalla uh, we have the uh, 12 number of temple and those temple located in the rajwadi temple complex and this temple was uh, constructed by the bardhavan the rajas of uh, bardhavan according to the their temple inscriptions and the bishnupur which is all known uh, as a uh, temple city and uh, the mallo dynasty was uh, constructed both the uh, uh, king and queen constructed the beautiful temple of uh, terracotta as well as the later temple of bishnupur uh, this is a general view uh, i try to show that the Uh, the the google uh, the uh, drone view of kalna group of temple this is uh, 108 shiva temple or navagoilas and this is the other small uh, other temple like pratapeshwar temple lalji temple complex krishna chandra ji and this is a small micro uh, Uh, environmental uh, um, uh, i try to uh, uh, share that this is a small micro uh, environmental area uh, and uh, there is a pond and this is the present day uh, photographs and you can see that the how fast the civil uh, 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 the houses constructed very close to the monument and it create the environmental effect on this monument we have our ancient archaeological monument act to const, uh, const, um, restricted the construction within the uh, 100 and 200 and 300 meter area of temple however we feel feel very much a problem when we uh, issues some notice or some other kind of activities as per our act like demolition order because the local government the local uh, custodian like dm or sdo they are not cooperate with, with us and we face very much problem and it is uh, very unfortunate that we are uh, fail to uh, uh, realize them that this uh, this uh, construction and the uh, the, uh, the damage of the uh, natural climate in an uh, micro uh, micro zone it 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 really affect on those temple not in uh, very rapidly but in uh, way in gradual way and as a result uh, if you can uh, recently you visit those temple you can see that the terracotta plaques of kalna mostly the lalji temple complex uh, eroded very fastly uh, like uh, this is the lalji temple complex and uh, this is pratapashar uh, shiva tem temple uh, these are some terracotta plaques uh, still survive in good condition and this is another group of temple like bishnupur we created and we protect those temp we protect those temple and we created a small uh, uh, garden or a, a some uh, um, planted some tree within its protected area to uh, create a micro environmental effect on this temple however just behind this uh, boundary wall of the temple then a huge number of construction uh, started and they cut in uh, cutting the uh, the uh, trees and it create uh, really a effect on those temple Uh, this is another uh, temple complex like uh, the do those are the brick temple shamrai and jor banglo you can see in every cases we uh, try to uh, provide some green uh, green effect or uh, green, uh, environmental effect in and around the temple but not it it a large area because we have a limitation of protected limit of the temple uh, this is some other uh, some terracotta plaques in bishnupur Uh, i try to uh, shows the some photographs because in bishnupur uh, we have protected 22 number of monument and two gates and one uh, kaman or uh, canon and the those temple protected in uh, before indian independence uh, the, the most of the temple protected during the time of 1910 to 1915 so uh, when we protected this temple Uh, this is the general uh, the view uh, before this before it protection or during it protection 
and this is the present day uh, photographs. So uh, we have protect, we have a concert, the structural uh, structural part of the temple, and we uh, provide uh, some micro environmental effect uh, in and around the temple. Uh, this is the another temple, Radha Vinod. You can see that the that partially the temple was complete damage. However, archaeological survey of India with scientific uh, uh, approach, we have protect, we have conserved the fallen part of the uh, temple and we maintain us. We maintain this temple and we uh, um, for our, not only the present day, for our future generation also. Uh, this is the another another uh, temple complex uh, like Rashmancho and Shamrai. You can see that how much affected, uh, the temple was affected when Archaeological Survey of India in 1915 the protect the Rashmancho and Shamrai. This is the, uh, uh, and if uh, in present day you can visit, you can see that the, this is a beautiful uh, temple with a garden, small garden. Because we try to uh, 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 protect or preserve the temple as we receive, as we, uh, um, uh, as we protect the temple uh, during its protection. So, there are, uh, this is the, some general uh, introduction or some uh, general view about the both the uh, group of temple and now I come I come to in uh, some uh, basic information about the effect which we notice during our inspection or during our case study in both the group of temple that biological influence so the algae fungi moss and lichen this all type of uh, biological effect we can not we notice in in uh, over this temple like that the uh, temple wall as well as the uh, roof of the temple and uh, the nature and as the, the the nature of this type of uh, Bi biological growth, it, it creates uh, very much problem for us to, it, because it uh, changes the color also and it also damage, uh, gradually damage the terracotta plaque uh, of both the temple. And the, the, there are some uh, features like the blue algae, green algae, uh, the, uh, we can see the uh, mostly the blue uh, uh, green algae in um, Kalna as well as the Vishnupur group of temple. And uh, this algae uh, create uh, some uh, acid, um, acidic reaction on the temple wall, on the, no, on the uh, terracotta and it uh, gradually deteriorated it gradually uh, wash out or and gra gradually um, um, very much loose uh, and eroded also uh, i can try to show some photographs that this is the photograph of kotavasha temp uh, Photograph. Ah, uh, there is. Uh, this is two photographs. Uh, one is from uh, Kalna and another is from Jod Bangla Temple. You can see that uh, that the algae, the fung fung fungicide effect, create the blackish spot over the roof of the temple because both the temple located in the highly rainfall area and as a result uh, and uh, the, the changes of the uh, local micro environment changes uh, that this type of the algae fungi effect we notice in the roof of the temple and uh, this is uh, this is some other uh, you, you can see that the green uh, spot uh, by green biological growth over the terracotta plaques, which also affected uh, the, uh, the uh, terracotta plaques of Kalna. This is a photograph from Kalna, and this is a photograph from the Bish uh, Bishnupur. Uh, the blackish, uh, the Shamrai, this is a photograph from Shamrai Temple, and uh, this is also from the Shamrai. The terracotta plaque, the uh, a layer of biological uh, growth, uh, in, we can, we, notice over the uh, terracotta plaques. Then another impact that, that is the existence of the biomats over the uh, terracotta temple. So uh, 
this biomat is uh, basically uh, created uh, some similar type of uh, activity like uh, um, bi biological growth and uh, this biomat or biofilm uh, degraded the substrate layer by forming the ecological zone bioactivity and uh, this uh, affect the terracotta surface these communities can be seen thriving on the monument with uh, varying degrees. It, it is interesting to note that in case of Vishnupur and as well as the Kalna group of temple, the portion which is uh, uh, which take uh, which directly we take the direct sunlight. The, in this part, the this uh, uh, growth of the biomass is not very much noticed. However, uh, the backside of the temple or the inside of the temple or the courtyard part of the temple where the uh, sunlight is not uh, directly uh, reach, there there the biomass is uh, very much uh, uh, growth is notice and as a result uh, this is uh, some other uh, some features uh, of uh, uh, the surface of the roof of the temple or uh, the uh, uh, the other uh, the uh, wall of the temple affected uh, due to this type of biological uh, growth in the both the in the kanla and bishnupur group of temple uh, there is another feature that the climate condition and fluctuation. So, at present day, we have the very much, uh, we notice that in our last speaker also mentioned that from the 90s, 80s onwards, the uh, heat, the, the heat is gradually uh, day to day uh, increase. So, uh, due to this heat, overheat, and as well as the, uh, the relative humidity effect, this uh, terracotta temple also also affected. The climate fluctuation can also be uh, help the geologic uh, weathering the process as a crack uh, as well as the erosion of the terracotta plaque as well as the uh, uh, problem in the not only the outer surface but also in the inner surface of the uh, brick structure. So uh, uh, present, uh, present condition we have uh, during our recent visit we also noticed that the uh, crack, uh, uh, um, crack we also noticed in the inside of the temple uh, which is very much uh, not uh, uh, noticed uh, uh, earlier because only we notice the crack in the outside of the temple wall but due to the uh, heat, into the heat and other effect environmental effect uh, we also notice the cracks in inside of the uh, temple that is uh, in the uh, in the area of the Gorbo Grio of the temple uh, the, there, there are some other uh, photographs I try to show that the how uh, the due to the uh, weathering condition or the heat, the gradually the the, the surface which is uh, uh, catch the direct sunlight gradually affected. The back, the other uh, side of the uh, temple wall, uh, you can see the also that the, the how the temple the terracotta plaques of the Kalna uh, both the Kalna group of temple uh, the affected due to this. Uh, overheat or uh, 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 hum humidity co con condition. Uh, there is another aspect that the eolin effect, uh, that e this eolin effect or wind effect also create uh, a problem or, or we facing the problem due to this type of the uh, wind, wind, wind effect. And uh, you also note, you can notice that the in Konarak, this is our sun temple, uh, one of the world heritage temple. In Konarak, we also face a similar problem uh, like the Mahabalipuram short temple. Due to the saline effect of the uh, sea, uh, we all, uh, the, the structure, the, the stone surface is also day to day decay. And uh, we, we planted the, some trees to protect uh, the, this type of the saline effect, uh, saline wind from the uh, sea. Like this, this uh, type type we in Kalna and Vishnupur, uh, we also uh, notice this type of the eolin, uh, eolin uh, uh, wind, wind effect in our terracotta plaques of Kalna and Bishnupur. Then another is the water, the, uh, the groundwater. Groundwater is also affected uh, the uh, temple 
terracotta as well as the brick structure. Uh, in Bishnupur, we have not faced uh, the problem due to the uh, groundwater problem because, uh, in, however, in Kalna, which is very uh, close to the river, uh, river Hooghly, uh, um, then it uh, uh, it affect uh, uh, very much uh, due to the groundwater and. Um, the, this this uh, photograph shows that the, how the groundwater uh, penetrated uh, from the uh, base of the temple to the ter terracotta plaques and uh, then gradually it uh, eroded uh, the terracotta plaques and uh, the bri the cracks Uh, in the bricks, uh, the joint of the brick is also very lo uh, loose due to this uh, uh, water, groundwater problem. And there is another effect that the solar radiation, the heat, I have already mentioned that due to the high temperature and uh, um, heat, the terracotta plaques also, uh, uh, the, 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 the surface uh, also damaged due to this uh, high heat of the solar. And uh, this is the some, uh, I have uh, tried to sh uh, highlighted the some problems uh, which we uh, notice during our visit and uh, we uh, prepare a case study on both the group of temple. However, uh, in uh, Bishnupur and uh, as Archaeological Survey of India protected the, the temple, we have our chemical wings and uh, we conserve uh, scientifically the chemical cleaning of this uh, temple periodically. And uh, like this is the Jorbanglo temple and uh, that there, that we have, I try to show the two photographs before and after. Uh, the fo fo photographs I uh, mean uh, before chemi chemical treatment and the, uh, the photographs of after chemical treatment. So uh, as the ASI was the custodian of the temple and uh, the, the heritage, we regular basis uh, maintain our temple through the chemical treatment. However, there, uh, this is the Shamrai, another temple, uh, before and after photographs of chemical treatment. However, I try to highlight that this is not the protected temple by the Archaeological Survey of India. This is not the protected temple by the state government also. However, the the, the growth of the uh, vegetation growth and uh, the the environmental problem not uh, also affected this heritage structure. This is also the contemporary to the Jod Banglo temple. This is Mahaprabhu uh, temple, which is uh, another Jod Banglo temple and much larger than the Jod Banglo temple protected by the ASI. But due to the uh, non attendant by the any of the authorities, local authority as well as the state authority, that it uh, gradually um, uh, destroy. And uh, there is no custodian to protect or to clean those mon monuments. So I try to also highlight it that uh, uh, the 3696 protected monument by ASI and ASI chemical, uh, ASI the, we have the chemical wings and we try to uh, conserve this monument uh, or structure through the, our chem chemical treatment. However, the unprotected monument, uh, the no one has ca ca custody of this um, her heritage and uh, in near future we lost those temple due to the, uh, uh, due to not attended by any of the authority. So uh, the environmental effect uh, we notice uh, on not only in the, our protected monument but also our uh, unprotected monuments in and around the Vishnupur as well as the Kalna group of temple. So. Uh, I thank uh, thank you uh, again to Center for uh, Creative um, uh, cent uh, uh, to Center for Co uh, Kolkata Center for Creativity to organize such type of the uh, seminar and also uh, inviting us uh, Archaeological Survey winner to collaborate this uh, seminar as well as invite me to who presented the paper and uh, I try to highlight it uh, through my presentation about our problem we, which we face uh, uh, during our protection, during our maintenance of our, our heritage and uh, I think uh, if we if we create if we uh, uh, create a micro uh, uh, environmental uh, in and around the temple complex or in and around the uh, heritage structure, it will help us to uh, save the, those temple for a, a longer period of time. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Shubha, for this uh, presentation. It was really enlightening because many of us over here were not really aware of uh, the work that ASI does. And uh, uh, on a lighter note, it seems ki dhoop, pani, sabhi aapke dushman hai. Jahan dhoop pad rahi hai, wo bhi problem hai. Jahan dhoop nahi pad rahi hai, wo bhi problem hai. Jahan dhameen mein pani hai, wo bhi problem hai. It's like amazing. <laughs> nee, actually, problem to hai, but if we can uh, 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 protect or uh, then we can maintain the environment, like uh, the uh, day to day the construction is uh, started very close to the monument. We have the, our act, but no one uh, help us to uh, stop these activities, like the mining activities also affected the temple, like the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, destroy of the trees, and the, in just outside the temple complex, someone, uh, uh, jo, jo, uh, nearby the dukan hai unka jo chula jal raha hai to we if we control this environment then we can protect uh, our heritage for 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 a longer time but tell me one thing before i ask the audience this question is was coming to my mind all through your presentation it you seem i mean for us you are a government body and you yourself feel that okay you can't really fight with many things around like the construction that is happening so you do not as asi you do not have the authority to uh, yes we have our act archaeological uh, ancient archaeological monument act 19, 1958 and 2010 revalidated but uh, in in the act we have particular uh, control by uh, particular uh, area which the district authority uh, 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 do their own job as per our, our request uh, our, our, our uh, we issue the letter or uh, show us notice to the concerned person who constructed the building or, or damaged the building then uh, the district authority is the duty to uh, um, take the necessary action uh, on the particular uh, particular cases however uh, in basically in bengal we feel uh, very problem that the cooperation is not found uh, like the district authority is, is not cooperate with uh, the central government or, or, or authority uh, for, for this type of un authorized activity in and around the uh, monument uh, because they, uh, they they told that they have some uh, problem uh, but need not share uh, about this but as a result we lost the uh, the with the in Bishnupur we have the Bishnupur in under the UNESCO World Heritage tentative list but the local uh, municipal corp corporation is not uh, aware about to uh, prepare a site management plan for that for the area or the for the particular uh, zone to control the construction activity. So uh, it, it is uh, beyond our limit. So it is not possible for ASI to every cases to maintain uh, the uh, construction activity. And just like uh, NCSM, do you do yourself any kind of awareness program? Yes, yes. We have uh, we have organized some awareness program also uh, in our World Heritage Day, in World Heritage Week, and other uh, activity. We have uh, the outreach program in and around the temple complex as well as the school, college. We organize some seminar also uh, to aware about the, um, the monument as well as the antiquity also. Thank you. So, yeah. Uh, you mentioned that. Yes. Uh, <coughs> uh, you mentioned that you have certain areas which come under the jurisdiction of of uh, yes, uh, of uh, Archaeological Survey of India. Whereas there are certain areas which are beyond the, which you don't have a jurisdiction over. So is it possible uh, that, you know, you get the local community over there, there's somebody who owns that land, you know, where that temple is, which is now under DK. So is it possible for the, you know, the Jamindar or whoever owns that plot of land to get them around to restore it? Uh, uh, not local government. If the like the state authority or the, some uh, local panchayat, they came forward and they uh, planted on the tree or they um, uh, uh, prepare some rules and regulations uh, for the local public. That what to be do uh, do or don't. That we have the, our rules. Uh, we you, uh, we put our rules in, inside the temple co premises that uh, do's and don'ts. However, in the outside the temple premises, there is no uh, restriction for the public and uh, as a result uh, the it is a very uh, problem for us if the local authority or anyone like NGOs had come forward to uh, take one particular monument then it will be better for us well uh, 
I have been dealing with archaeology for a long time. And um, look at your situation. You see, you protect uh, between the government of India and the state government about uh, maybe 25 to 30,000 monuments and sites. Yes, sir. The country has 2 million. And uh, the Bengal itself has many more uh, terracotta temples. Uh, so uh, this prestige mongering exercise of uh, fishing for a world heritage, you know, tag, or, you know, even uh, this protected site tag has been going on for some time. And we have also been adopting, uh, you see, uh, Marshall Manual uh, for Conservation 1915, uh, which is uh, PWD principle oriented. Now, I have uh, held international workshops I mean, on conservation. And I found, when I asked the ASI for a list of uh, local masons and sculptors, and uh, so they didn't have it, though they use them. For their mon monuments, they use them, but they don't recognize them as uh, masons or architects or, uh, you see, sutradhars or anything. So until there is respect, uh, there is nothing. The number two is, you know, the ASI can only do capacity building. How can it, uh, you see, uh, conserve all the monuments and sites in the country? It was never done. All these uh, monuments were created as the inscriptions will certify, both in uh, East Bengal and West Bengal, Bangladesh and here. They were created by communities. They're maintained by communities. They're conserved by communities. So that knowledge is getting lost. The ASI should uh, really convert itself into the role of a, a capacity builder and uh, inciter of community initiatives. And uh, for that, uh, the legal, uh, you see, regime should be created. Uh, but somehow other, uh, 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 it is, uh, and it is sadly starved of funds. I mean, I know uh, the situation of the ASI or the Department of Culture, it has so little fund that it can hardly, you know, uh, invest except in uh, some of the prestigious monuments. So it is very important that it moves from this cordon sanitaire approach uh, to a capacity building approach. Yes, sir. Uh, we have uh, our institute in Noida and uh, Institute of Archaeology. And now uh, uh, our uh, recent our director general also tried to uh, initiate this type of capacity building activity, not only in the Delhi and as well as the, our regional offices. And we uh, try to uh, organize such type of the workshop for the local public. Well, uh, only not only for the monument, but also for the antiquity, because we have a major problem of the antiquity sorry, family. Sorry to interrupt you. You see, I know all that. All I am trying to say is that it's not uh, possible for you or the DAG SI yes. to bring about this change. It is a policy uh, change that is yes. required, and all you can do is to introduce a bill, or you know, uh, so that I mean, the autonomy uh, is restored to the communities. The communities are completely disowned yes. in terms of, you know, conservation or building. Until unless that, uh, uh, you see, uh, 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 autonomy is recognized again, and that is systematically uh, built up, uh, the ASI can only do that. I mean, and ASI is sadly starved of money, staff. I mean, uh, uh, it is impossible that it can, uh, I, mean, I have seen ASI monuments where, uh, I mean, which are protected, which doesn't have a single guard. One guard yes, protects yes. about 20 monuments. So yes, yes, this yes. is the situation. How can you, I mean, uh, it is not your problem. But I'm saying that you should induce a policy change actively. Yes. That's all. So you can only take the message. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> yes. Thank you so much uh, for this session. And we look forward to more such interactions. And maybe in future have something in KCC where we can create more uh, communities to come together yes. and understand how we are damaging uh, the monuments and support ASI in the yes, world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We hope to see you again tomorrow for day two of Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam edition four. And uh, finally, requesting all of you to keep following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to get updated on what KCC is doing. And um, as uh, most of you are aware, there is a by invite only dinner. So we would request you to join for that. Thank you.